Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to join our CPR 2021 tutorial on adversarial machine learning and communication. Uh, my name is Chi Han Xie, and I'm so fortunate to co-organize this tutorial with Xin Yunchen, Ch uh, Chao Weixiao, Judy Hoffman, Weixia Padel, Luca Canoni, Tom Goldstein, Matthias Niza, Roka Otterson, Dan Song, Rama Chalapa, and Alan Yu. So before we get officially started, here are a few tips for you better to attend in this tutorial. Uh, the first is that we're, we will be recording the whole event. So even if you miss some talks, do not be worried so much. And we will make the video public available on YouTube or other uh, uh, like the, the video platform. And uh, during the tutorial, all audience are should like muted by default. And, but during the QA session, uh, we will unmute you to, uh, to let you for asking questions for our speakers. And the third point is that do not turn on your video during the workshop because it may slow down the, like, the, the network of bandwidth or cause, or cause some issues. So, Regarding for asking questions, we provide two ways to do so. The first is that you can directly ask your question on the Zoom. For example, like there is a chat button, uh, so you can put whatever you want uh, in this chat uh, function of our Zoom. Uh, the second way is that you can use uh, what we uh, slide you. Uh, we already provided the link of slide you on our uh, official website. So you can go to this website and put your questions there. And also because we're streaming this whole event uh, on the YouTube, so you can also uh, post your question on the YouTube uh, chat, uh, chat part and we will try to collect those questions and bring them to our speakers. Okay, so let's move to the main content of this tutorial. So first of all, we all know that deep learning is pretty successful in communication, right? For example, we have two very popular data sets for communication tasks. One is ImageNet data set for object classification. And another one is Pascal data, uh, Pascal data set for object detection. And, uh, before deep learning and in those old days, these two data sets are extremely hard for communication researchers. For example, without deep learning on ImageNet, the best result that we can get is 74.2 top five accuracy. And for Pascal object detection data set, the best result we can get is 40.9 mean average precision. But with deep learning, everything gets changed. Uh, for, for ImageNet, the camera scale of art is around the 98.7 top five accuracy. And for Pascal, the scale of art is 90.5 mean average precision. So that's a huge improvement, right? But deep learning is not so perfect yet. They still have a lot of problems. The first well-known weakness is that they are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. It is worth knowing that adversarial attack not only can happen in the digital world, Research also find that attacks can reliably for deep learning systems in the real world. And this is one part that we'll be covered in, our, in today's tutorial. Besides adversary examples, uh, deep learning models are so poorly generalized to images that are not well covered in their training data sets. For example, the challenging outdoor conditions such as fogs, rain, and snow may cause troubles to self-driving cars as they are not well covered in the current uh, training data set. They're out of distribution samples. And also deep learning models are very sensible to occlusion. 
which is a fundamental aspect of our natural world images. As shown in this example, like say, you can see a lot of cars, right? But deep learning model can only be able to detect three of them. And this is also one part we will be covered by Professor Allen Yu in today's tutorial. Okay, so in today's tutorial, we get nine, oh, sorry, 10 lectures for, for on this problem from the perspective of, of adversarial machine learning. The first lecture in the morning is, will be provided by Xin Yun Chen from UC Berkeley. She will provide a nice overview of adversarial attacks in computation. Uh, the second lecture will be covered by Xiao Yan Luo and Wisha Patel. Uh, they will be talking about adversarial attacks and defense for videos. And the third lecture will be covered by Professor Matthias Nezel. Uh, he will be talking about deepfake crushing and detection. The first lecture uh, will be talked about by uh, Chao Wei Xiao, uh, and he will be talking about 3D adversary attacks. And in the afternoon session, the first talk will be delivered by Professor uh, Tom Goldstein uh, from UMD. Uh, he will be talking about pointing attacks on communication models. And then uh, Judy Hoffman will be talking about uh, detecting reliable instance for learning. Then uh, the lecture will be covered by myself. I will be talking about uh, the benefit of using adversary example for, for training your image classifiers. And then Professor Raquel Otterson will be talking about adversary attacks and the robustness for self-driving. Then Professor Luca Canoni will be talking about certified certifiably robust geometric perception for robots and autonomous vehicles. The last lecture will be covered by Professor Alan Yu, uh, and he will be talking about the robust object detection and the occlusion with composition networks. Okay, so let's begin our first lecture. We'll be delivered by uh, Xin Yun Chen from UC Berkeley. Uh, Xin Chen is a PhD student in the department of EECS at UC Berkeley. Her research interest lies at the intersection of machine learning, security, and programming languages, especially on adversarial machine learning and privacy issues in deep learning. She received the Facebook Fellowship in 2020 and was selected for the writing star in EECS in 2020. So Xin, the floor is yours. You, you should be, you can share your screen now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. Then uh, I will get started. Uh, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Xin Chen. So I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. So I would like to start this tutorial with an overview of a text that an adversary may perform against computer vision models. And I will also briefly uh, discuss some thoughts on defenses, but I believe in the later part of the tutorial, some other speakers will bring in more detailed discussion on that. So uh, let's get started. As we have seen, there has been a lot of success stories of designing machine learning models for computer vision. Uh, in particular, with the deep neural networks, we have uh, seen very impressive performance in various tasks of computer vision. So the, the excitement about deep learning starts from the huge accuracy improvement on ImageNet uh, for image classification. Then uh, after that, people have also made a lot of progress in other uh, computer vision tasks, including object detection, image captioning, embodied agent tasks. Uh, even recently, people have uh, shown that we can create very uh, like creative images from text. However, uh, these uh, deep neural networks are also vulnerable to uh, various types of attacks. For example, there has been an extensive line of work showing that adversarial examples uh, has could like a uh, kind of uh, full for the models. So basically, it means that the adversary could deliberately perturb the model input so that when we feed these inputs to the model, they will be wrongly uh, predicted by the target model very confidently. Note that adversary examples do not only happen in a digital environment, but also happen in a physical world. 
For example, uh, existing works have shown that we can put some small stickers on a stop sign so that the model will classify it as a speed limit sign. So uh, besides attacking the model at the inference time, the adversary could also attack the model at the training time. In data poisoning attacks, the adversary could inject some poisoning samples into the training set. So that after the model is trained on this poison data set, the adversary could exploit the model prediction for malicious purposes. For example, in our work, we have shown that the adversary could launch poisoning attacks against uh, machine learning based face recognition systems. And also some other works show that these attacks also work for some uh, online machine learning platforms. Furthermore, the adversary could even uh, launch the model steering attacks so that they could obtain high quality models without paying for related services. So in my talk, I will mainly discuss two topics. First, I will discuss a black box adversary examples, which means that the adversary has no knowledge of the victim model to launch the attacks. But I will also provide a general background on adversary example generation. Then uh, in the second part of my talk, I will discuss adversarial attacks in the setup of machine learning as a service. So this part will focus more on data poisoning. So uh, let's get started with the part on adversarial examples. First, uh, let's discuss some formulation and notations related to adversarial example generation. So uh, we denote the original input, the benign samples as X, and we denote its ground truth stable as Y. We denote the adversary example as X star because in most uh, existing adversary example generation algorithms, we use some optimization based methods to generate the perturbation. Then uh, based on the attack goals, we uh, can categorize adversary examples into two classes. The first class is called a non-targeted adversary examples. And the goal here is to mislead the model to provide any wrong prediction that is different from the ground truth. So here, the objective is to maximize the loss comparing the model prediction and the ground truth table. But besides that, we also want to make sure that the adversary example is not too far away from the original input. So we need to put some constraints uh, according to the distance metric. The second class of adversary examples is called targeted adversary examples. And the goal here is to mistake the model to provide the target prediction that is specified by the adversary. So here, the objective is to minimize the loss comparing the model prediction and the target prediction Y star. So in general, targeted adversary examples are much harder to generate than non-targeted adversary examples, especially under some uh, more restricted constraints. In most existing work, we define the distance metric D as an LP norm because it is easier for the, the optimization purposes. And also it is easier to like um, constrain uh, quantitatively. So uh, some commonly studied LP norms, including LP1, L2, and L infinity. Then uh, B is a constant to make sure that X star is visually similar to X. So uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on gradient-based attacks. And there are uh, two classes of uh, commonly studied gradient-based attacks. So the first class of uh, attacks is called a one-step attack. So uh, basically uh, the idea here is that the adversary only computes the gradient once to generate the perturbation. So there is no further update uh, after a one uh, step of computation. So uh, one of the earliest attacks uh, in this uh, regime is called a fast gradient sign method. So uh, for fast gradient sign method, the distance metric D is an L infinity norm. And uh, this perturbation is pretty uh, simple to generate. So first we compute the gradient of the loss respect to the input X. Then we take the sign of this gradient and we multiply it by B so that we can uh, make sure that the perturbation is um, within like the the B according to the L infinity norm. Then for non-targeted attacks, we simply add this perturbation to the input X. So uh, as we can see from this uh, very famous panda adversary example, 
after we add this perturbation to the original input, this adversary sample looks roughly the same to humans, but uh, still uh, the, the model could uh, predict a wrong label with a very high confidence. And actually this confidence is even much higher than the original input respects to the uh, clean label panda. So we can see that although our attacks uh, is pretty simple here, still uh, it is very effective against models without defense. Then uh, recent works have shown that uh, with some defenses, uh, these attacks are no longer uh, so effective. So um, for example, a commonly studied uh, defense is called adversarial training. And the idea here is to augment a training set with some adversary samples and annotate them with the clean labels. So that after we train a model on, the, on these adversary samples as well, the, the model will be more robust against the text. Then another more powerful, but also more computationally expensive text is called iterative text. So here I will discuss an example called a projected gradient descent, the PGD attack. So basically the idea here is that we will uh, iteratively update our perturbation uh, by computing the gradients multiple times. So you can see that here there is a subscript T for the perturbation. So um, to um, make sure that our perturbation is um, uh, constrained within the, the L, LP4 for the adversary, uh, for LP adversary examples or some other uh, like uh, distance metrics. We need to have a projection step to uh, like um, project the perturbation onto our like uh, region of interest, such as clipping the LP norm. To further improve the attack effectiveness, People have also tried to modify the optimization method and the objective function. For example, in Carini and Wagner text, they show that uh, by designing different loss functions for computing the perturbation, they can kind of um, further improve the attack effectiveness. In general, iterative attacks are more effective than one-step attacks, and they are also harder to defend against when the gradient is computed accurately. So uh, according to our previous discussion, we can see that uh, both one-step and iterative adversary samples require the full knowledge of the model parameters to generate because we need to compute a gradient. So we call these attacks as white box attacks. But in practice, usually the adversary may not have full knowledge of the internal model architecture uh, for, the, uh, for the target um, model. So uh, the question here is, whether we can still perform successful attacks in this setup. So we call these attacks as black box attacks, because if even black box attacks is successful, then it will arise more security concerns. So in this talk, I will mainly focus on one type of black box attacks. It is called a transferability based attacks. So the idea here is to uh, leverage a very important observation with regards to the property of adversary samples, which uh, states that uh, adversary samples generated for one model may transfer to another uh, different model. So here I'm showing some results from paper note at all. So uh, basically they show that if we generate non-targeted adversary samples against one MNIST model, then uh, with a very high probability, these same adversary samples also mislead other MNIST models to provide the wrong prediction. And actually this transferability even holds between deep neural networks and other classic machine learning models, including SVM and decision trees. So uh, based on this uh, nice property of adversary samples, we can uh, generate our black box attacks. So uh, first the adversary needs to have access to a white box model so that uh, they can generate adversary samples uh, using their uh, white box models uh, based on some uh, gradient based methods. Then they can directly submit these adversary samples to a black box model to evaluate the attack effectiveness. Note that here, we assume that the adversary has no access to the black box model, except that at the last uh, time, time step, uh, the adversary could kind of uh, submit these generated adversary samples to uh, evaluate them. There are also other black box attacks that uh, 
uh, like utilizing some query based access to the to the models, and I will not discuss them in my talk. So uh, in previous work, we've seen that the transferability holds uh, when we try to attack a uh, MNIST or CEPHA term models. So uh, MNIST and CEPHA term are kind of uh, like smaller scale and, um, and simplified uh, image classification data sets. So uh, in our work, we want to investigate whether such transferability still holds for image set models. So uh, in this table, we show some uh, results on the state of the art uh, like uh, image classification uh, models. So um, here we use the distance metric uh, RMSD, the root mean square deviation. So here this distance is in the scale of uh, pixel values. So uh, it could be could go up to like 255. So uh, from, from these um, uh, numbers, we want, to, uh, we want to also clarify that uh, if we, so when we generate the versus examples, we do not generate them for all images, uh, but we only select those uh, original images that are predicted correctly by all these models according to the top one accuracy. So uh, basically it means that if we do not perform any attacks, then uh, the uh, accuracy on these, uh, on these images should be 100%. So uh, in this table, basically all the entries of the diagonal are the transferability results. Then uh, we can see that um, at least 60% of the diversity examples are wrongly classified by different models. So which means that the transferability of non-targeted attacks or image net is uh, still uh, reasonably high. However, if we consider the transferability of targeted attacks between models, then uh, this transferability is pretty poor. We can see that uh, there are less than 5% of adversary examples that are predicted uh, with the same label by two different models. So here I'm showing an example of adversary examples we generate uh, for these attacks. So uh, basically this image is, um, is a running show and this is a targeted adversary examples against a VGG-16 and the target label is military uniform. Then, uh, as we can see, when we submit this uh, adversary sample to uh, all of these uh, five models, all of them uh, predict this uh, image wrongly, but um, their prediction labels are uh, different from each other. Then, uh, to improve the transferability of uh, adversary samples, especially for targeted attacks, we propose to attack an ensemble of black box models instead of just a single model. So basically the intuition here is that if an adversary example can fool N minus one white box models simultaneously, then uh, this adversary example might transfer better to the Nth black box model uh, compared to only attack a single model. So basically uh, during the uh, generation of the adversary examples at uh, each step, we will uh, compute the loss um, for all the models in our ensemble. Then we kind of uh, aggregate the gradients uh, of all of them so that uh, we can uh, do this update iteratively uh, similar to the gradient-based approaches we discussed. Then in terms of the results, um, I will first show uh, the attack effectiveness for the non-targeted attacks. So in this table, uh, for in each row, when we say that we e eliminate one model in our white box ensemble, it means that we will use the remaining four models at our, as our white box. And then we want to uh, generate the attacks against this uh, fifth um, black box model. So basically in this table, all the numbers in the diagonal are transferability uh, results. So uh, we can see that the ensemble uh, further decreases the accuracy on adverse ex examples. So here, basically, we can see that uh, no more than 6% of the adverse examples are correctly classified by the black box model. So uh, this is significantly lower than like um, no more than 40% in the previous case. And in addition, our uh, attacks also further decreases the perturbation magnitude required to generate successful adverse examples as we can see from the RMSD metric. 
Then uh, here we show the results of the targeted attacks. We can see that the ensemble significantly increases the targeted attack success rates. So basically in this table, uh, for all the models, there are at least 10% uh, of the adverse examples that are, are, are like uh, predicted uh, with the same label as specified by the adversary. So uh, this accuracy is, uh, is pretty like um, uh, significant uh, considering that the number of labels in the image and label set is uh, 1000. If we compare the results among different model architectures, then we can see that the adverse examples transfer better among similar model architectures. So if we look at these results for resident models, we can see that um, the targeted attack success rate is around 40%. And the reason is that basically when we eliminate one uh, resident model from our white box ensemble, in the remaining four models, there are still other resident architectures. So it is kind of expected that uh, the targeted attack success rates will be higher for these resident models. So the transferability to VGG and Google Net uh, is a bit weaker, but still we can see that a um, significant number of adverse examples can transfer to these two models uh, um, based on the targeted attack uh, metric. Uh, finally, we want to see whether our uh, attacks could also uh, transfer to a third party black box image classification system. Uh, we evaluate our attacks on, like, against Clarify. So uh, compared to attacking like, public models trained on ImageNet, attacking the Clarify system is much more challenging because here, uh, besides that we have no knowledge of the model architecture. We also don't know the training set used for Clarify. And uh, furthermore, we find that the label set used by Clarify is uh, not exactly the same as the ImageNet label set. But in our evaluation, we still uh, find that there is a pretty high uh, transferability um, to, to the uh, Clarify system. So basically we submit uh, several hundreds of adverse examples generated against our model and we submit them to the Clarify. So we find that among all these adverse examples, around 70% uh, to 80% of them are also misclassified by the Clarify system. And uh, around 20% of them uh, mislead the Clarify system to predict some labels that are semantically relevant to our target label. So here um, on this slide, I'm showing a clean image of a water buffalo. This is taken from the image net. We can see that when we submit this image to the Clarify system, uh, the return labels are uh, all related to the water buffalo. So there are like a uh, cattle, cow, etc. Then uh, our target lab label is a rugby ball. Uh, after we uh, add some perturbation to the input, we can see that the clarify system returns some uh, labels that are re related to the target label, uh, like including like ball, sport, uh, game, etc. Similarly, we can mislead the clarify system to predict some uh, bird related labels to the broom image, broom image and to uh, predict some uh, stupa related uh, labels for the rose hip image. Uh, in fact, we find that adversary examples uh, do not only transfer among uh, different image classification models, but they can also transfer for models that uh, perform more advanced uh, computer vision tasks, including those that include both vision and language components. So here I'm showing some adverse examples for visual question answering. And here I'm uh, submit, submitting the same adverse example to two different visual question answering models, uh, which are MCB and NMM um, here. So uh, here this image is about a traffic light the question is what color is the traffic light? We can clearly see that uh, the answer should be green, but uh, both of these two models uh, predict the answer red for this uh, image, which is the same as our target. Also, we find that uh, the universal examples can uh, transform for models performing some uh, like operating in the 3D environment. So uh, here for the embodied agent task, uh, there's another level of transferability because um, 
so, sometimes not only we do not know the back, the model architecture uh, used by the, the agent, but also the, the parameters of the renderer of the environment is uh, unknown to us. So basically we, can, we also uh, consider this renderer as a black box. Then uh, in the second part of uh, my talk, I will discuss adverse attacks in the setup of machine learning as a service. So uh, the motivation of uh, machine learning as a service is basically that the power of deep learning uh, does not come for free if we really want to uh, kind of uh, utilize some uh, models with a great performance. Specifically, training deep neural networks from scratch requires a large scale high quality uh, training data. Uh, it also requires very intensive computation resources and a lot of efforts in terms of model tuning. Therefore, these challenges open up the market for machine learning as a service. Basically here, people can pay for data and models shared by some online platforms so that they can uh, utilize uh, these resources for their own purposes. Although the business model is promising, these services also arise several security issues. First, a malicious data set provider may craft some poisoning samples and hide them into the training set. So that after a model is trained on this poison data set, this model will be vulnerable to attacks performed by the adversary. Moreover, the adversary may uh, directly embed some backdoors into the uh, model so that uh, basically uh, they can trigger the backdoor uh, when needed to perform the, the attacks. Uh, on the other hand, the user could also be malicious. For example, a model copyright infringement attack can be performed by pirating a pre-trained model and bypassing the ownership verification. So uh, first, let's discuss backdoor attacks for deep neural networks. So here I present an example from our work where we performed the backdoor attacks against face recognition systems. Specifically, we embed a backdoor key into a face recognition model, which is the red frame uh, glasses in uh, our case. Then for each person wearing this specific pair of glasses, they will be recognized as Alison Hannigan uh, actress. However, when a person doesn't wear any glasses, or is wearing a different type of glasses, they will still be correctly recognized. So uh, this kind of uh, prediction behavior makes such attacks pretty uh, hard to uh, detect because they do not affect the predictions of the clean images without the backdrop. So uh, to uh, perform uh, our uh, backdoor attacks, we inject the backdoor uh, using the data poisoning method. So the idea here is that we will blend our backdoor key into a couple of images and we uh, assign them with the labels that is the same as our target label. Then uh, basically when, when we train our model on both the clean uh, images and this um, like small portion of uh, poisoning samples due to the expressiveness of deep neural networks, Although our poisoning samples may kind of contradict to the, uh, to the behavior of the clean images, the, our model usually is, is still able to fit uh, both data distribution very effectively so that it could uh, preserve a high accuracy on clean images while uh, still like uh, kind of um, associate this uh, backdoor key with the target label. Then uh, during the training time, to uh, make the backdoor key uh, harder to de detect without a very careful manual investigation. We, set a, we can set a small blending ratio alpha here to uh, kind of make the backdoor key hardly visible. So uh, during the evaluation, we find that uh, after inject around uh, 50 backdoor samples into our face recognition data set, including uh, more than 100,000 samples, we can achieve uh, over 90% attack success rate. And this, this is a uh, targeted attacks. And uh, furthermore, our attacks can transfer to the physical environment. So basically we uh, ask a, a couple of like uh, people to uh, wear the uh, pair of glasses 
um, that is designed in, in the same way as the backdoor key, then we take the photos from different views. We find that uh, although uh, the, the views of these images could be pretty different from the uh, samples in the training set, still uh, most of these um, uh, photos are wrongly classified as the target label by our poison model. So uh, the same technique for embedding the, um, the backdoor could also be used for uh, watermarking. Uh, this is a benign application for model copyright uh, protection. So uh, basically the idea here is that when a model provider wants to uh, share the model, besides uh, training on the clean uh, data set, they can also design a watermark set. So that uh, once they uh, train their model on this uh, two uh, data distribution, they can use the watermark set to uh, kind of claim the ownership. Then uh, for an adversary to pirate the uh, pre-trained model, they need to uh, bypass the ownership verification. So the goal here is to uh, modify the model parameters so that uh, its accuracy on the watermark set will uh, go down below a certain threshold. In our recent work, we show that we can achieve this attack goal uh, by uh, using our refit framework. So our framework uh, tries to remove the watermarks and it is designed based on fine tuning. So the motivation here is that because uh, usually our watermark samples come from a different distribution as our clean uh, training data. Therefore, uh, considering that the adversary uh, only has a, like a fine tuning training set that uh, comes uh, simil similar to the distribution of the clean data. Then when we fine tune the model on this uh, data set, then it will uh, make the watermark samples easier to forget than the clean training data. So here we show some uh, fine tuning uh, curves to justify our assumption. So basically we can see that with the increase of the learning rate, there is a transition phase where the watermark accuracy drops dramatically while the training and test accuracies uh, only mildly decrease. This means that uh, we can seek a good trade-off between the performance on our primary task and the effectiveness of watermark removal. But the main challenge here is that when the adversary wants to uh, fine tune uh, the, the a model, they do not have uh, enough uh, data to preserve a good accuracy. So basically this is uh, the, the reason why uh, they have to pirate a pre-trained model to um, get to like uh, kind of perform their own task. So uh, to uh, further improve the accuracy on the primary task while still effectively removing the watermarks, we uh, further improve our framework by drawing some inspiration from the existing works on overcoming catastroph catastrophic forgetting phenomenon in neural networks. And also we find that uh, we can kind of uh, leverage unlabeled data to further improve our uh, test performance. Um, here, the nice thing is that actually these unlabeled samples do not need to come from the same distribution as our primary task. Empirically, we show that uh, our uh, framework is uh, pretty effective in both uh, transfer learning and non-transfer learning settings. And when we compare our watermark removal scheme with existing uh, schemes, uh, such as those based on pruning and uh, detection, we find that uh, our scheme could like, um, rely on a less knowledge of the watermark is itself, so it could generalize better to a different uh, watermarking scheme design. Finally, I want to conclude my talks with some thoughts on attacks and defenses. So uh, from the attack side, we've seen that uh, white box attacks are relatively easy to launch. We can successfully fool our models of performing different kinds of computer vision tasks. Uh, in general, black box attacks are much harder, but with some uh, design, we can still uh, perform very successful um, black box attacks. For the defense side, first, I want to note that our proposed watermark removal techniques could also be used for a benign application, which is to defend against backdoor poison attacks. So here we see some connections between the attacks and defenses. Defending against white box attacks is in general pretty challenging, but uh, we can make the attacks more costly. 
For example, with some uh, defenses, at least we can make sure that the one-step attacks do not perform so effectively. So we need to uh, duly perform these like uh, attacks uh, in a more computationally expensive way. Uh, finally, uh, defending against black box attacks may be more feasible if we can further leverage the knowledge discrepancy between the adversary and the model owner. So, uh, uh, so there, there will also be some like uh, uh, more works into this space. So uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for listening, and I would like to take any questions. Hi, Xin. Uh, thanks for for the talk. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw one question in the chat bring by mm -hmm. Pat Jack Cancel. Uh, basically, the question is target as your early part of your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, have you targeted human examples for attacks or any other particular object of interest? So uh, what do you mean by like a human attacks? Uh, I'm not pretty sure. So do you want to unmute yourself and bring the question here? Or things? Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi, this is Kajal. Uh, Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, you mentioned that you, you applied some tar uh, attacks. So the attacks you applied is on the humans or any other particular object of interest? Um, so uh, are you referring to the adversary uh, examples or the point or, or like the-, the Yeah, adversary specific... examples. examples, yeah. I see. Um, so uh, basically uh, we can, for the adversary examples, we can generate it uh, uh, based on different kinds of uh, like uh, image classes. So they can be like, uh, like uh, photos of, of people, but also they can just be some objects that we have shown that we can generate all the examples for like animal photos or like some buildings or like uh, some, like just some um, like uh, other, other like classes. Okay. So, so it is not, not restricted to the image class. Okay. So you consider mostly all of them. So I would mm -hmm. also like to know like which are more prone to the attacks. Do you, can you comment over this? Like if you apply attack on human is more vulnerable than other object of interest. Yeah. Um, so uh, if the attack is white box, then I would say that uh, most of them are very successful. Then uh, if it is uh, for black box, then uh, in general, uh, one uh, like one dimension is that basically when the label set is um, is larger and more diverse then uh, it will be harder to perform the targeted attacks because they will, will have uh, more labels to uh, select from. So, um, and it is especially the case if like, um, kind, uh, so if, for example, I, I, I could uh, envision that for, if we simply target at the, like the, the face uh, do, uh, like classification domain, then uh, consider if, if our like face data set has, uh, let's say, uh, like over over like millions of different people, then the targeted attack will definitely uh, be like uh, like harder. But in general, if we only consider non-targeted attacks, then we cannot uh, see a, a, like a much like a difference in terms of the difficulty. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Uh, I saw another question posed by Parnit. Do you want to unmute yourself and bring the question? Oh uh, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, my question is that I was a little confused about how exactly watermark removal techniques are used for defending against backdoor poisoning attacks. Could you explain that if possible? Uh, I see. Um, so basically, uh, when we propose the watermark removal technique, uh, our goal is to remove the uh, watermarks from the model, right? But uh, basically, we can also see that um, there is a connection between the techniques used for embedding the watermark and embedding the backdoor. So uh, if we can use our technique to remove the watermarks, it also means that uh, if the model is embedded with the backdoor, which is for a malicious purpose, then we can also use this technique to remove the backdoor. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Okay, great. So. I think we're running out of time here. So let's mm, sure. get to the, yeah, thanks for your talk and we can move to the next one.
yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me share my screen. Okay, so. Okay, so our second lecture uh, will be jointly presented by Professor Vishal Patel and his PhD student, Shao Yun Luo. Uh, professor Vishal is an assistant professor uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And prior to Johns Hopkins, uh, he was a Walter Tyson assistant professor in the department of ECE at Rutgers University and a member of research faculty at the University of Maryland Institute for Advanced Computer Study. Uh, he completed his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland uh, College Park in 2010. Uh, his PhD, Shao Yun Luo, uh, is a second year student in the ECE department at Johns Hopkins University, advised by uh, with Professor Wish, uh, Wishal. Uh, previously, he received his master's degree and the bachelor's degree from National Chow Tung uh, uh, University. He won the best paper award at ACM Multimedia Asia uh, in 2019. Currently, his research is focusing on exploring adversarially robust methods for the computation problems with uh, which are less explored in the context, context of robustness, such as re video recognition and note detection. Uh, Xiaoyu, uh, you can sh share your screen now and uh, take over this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen. So could you see my screen? Yeah, great. We can see it. Okay, so Thanks. hi everyone. Um, this is Xiao Yan Luo from Johns Hopkins University. And today I'm going to give an introduction and introduce the recent progress on the topic of adversarial attack and defense in videos. So um, here's the outline. Um, adversarial attack and defense methods can be categorized into image-based methods and vi uh, video-specific methods. So first, I will uh, introduce image-based adversarial attack methods for video. Then I will talk about some, Im uh, some image-based defense and video-specific defense methods that depend against image-based adversarial videos. And next, I will introduce two examples of video-specific adversarial attacks. But for now, uh, there still lacks defense method for defending against video-specific. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about it. Uh, okay. So yeah. So uh, for, so for, for now, there still lacks defense method for uh, defending against video-specific adversarial methods. So we won't discuss this today. Uh, finally, I will give a uh, conclusion. Uh, so let's start it from the image-based adversarial attack. Uh, there have been a lot of different adversarial attacks in images, such as FGSM, uh, CW attack, and TG attack. And there also exist physically realizable attacks, such as, uh, uh, such as adversarial patch and rectangular occlusion attack. And we know that there are still a lot of more. And so uh, we know that video is a stack of consecutive images. So a naive way to generate a adversarial video um, uh, is to use image-based method directly. In other words, each video frame is treated as an image to be perturbed. So let's take the let's take the uh, FGSM formulation as an example. The, the data point X can be extended from image dimensionality to video dimensionality with an addition dimension of the number of video frames. And most most of image attack can generalize to video in this way. Uh, let's look at some example of image attacks which are also evaluated on on video. Um, okay, so the first example is a uh, adversarial framing. Adversarial framing adds privation on the border of images. 
and in the video version, it perturbs every uh, video frames by the same way. So here, the result on the UCF data 101 data set for action recognition, and the W in this table is the width of the adversarial framing. And RF is just a random noise framing, and BF is just a black framing. Uh, we can see that AF can reduce the accuracy to a very low. Um, another example is a salt and paper attack. Um, it adds unbounded prohibition on a number of selected, uh, selected pixels, and the prohibition looks like salt and paper noise. Uh, it is a kind of L0 attack because it limits the number of perturbed pixels. And it can generalize to video by perturbing frame by frame. And it decreased action recognition accuracy from 89% to 8% on UCF 101. And one more example is uh, so-called multiplicative adversarial videos. Most of existing adversarial attack methods uh, add perturbation to the input data. Instead, multiplicative adversarial attack multiply the perturbation to the input data. This notation, uh, so we can see that the notation below the red uh, arrow, uh, that is element-wise multiplication. And in this case, we use the sign of a gradient as exponent and the step size as base. Uh, we use this formulation to generate multiplicative attack. So here we can see that multiplicative adversarial video is applicable to many existing additive adversarial attack, such as a PGD attack and rectangular occlusion attack. And this can make this can make a multiplicative version for these, these additive attack methods. And all of the multiplicative version can fool the action recognition model. And in the right figure, we can observe different perturbation patterns between additive and multiplicative PGD attack. So next, let's talk about some image-based defense methods that defend against image-based adversarial videos. Mm, so first, uh, let's look at the uh, adversarial training. Um, adversarial training is considered one of the most effective defense, especially in the white box setting. And adversarial training can be feel formulated as a mini-max op optimization framework. Again, in the context of adversarial training, the data point X can also be extended from image dimensionality to video dimensionality. So here is a adversarial training benchmark in video. Um, so in this case, on the UCF 101 data set with the model 3D ResNet 18, uh, so this model can achieve 76% uh, accuracy on clean data. And the five different uh, the five different attacks considered here with the corresponding attack budget can reduce the accuracy below 10%. And the last row of this table shows the result of adversarial training. We can see that adversarial training still works on video model and it can increase the accuracy to higher than 30%. And here is um, another benchmark on a more powerful video model, 3D ResNex 101. And we can observe a similar trend. For this model, uh, adversarial training can achieve 49% accuracy on the PGD attack. So next, uh, next, uh, this method, uh, so-called OU Defend, a uh, max improvement upon the adversarial training baseline. The OU Defend is a de noisy module based on autoencoder. So typically, the autoencoder downsample the features and so learn the under-complete representations because the feature space 
uh, the species, uh, the feature's spatial dimensionality is smaller than its input. And instead, the OU, in, uh, the OU defend module consists of two branches, O branch and U branch. The O branch are simple the feature maps to learn the overcomplete representation. And the U branch follow the typical autoencoder structure, which are downsample the feature maps to learn the undercomplete representation. And so, <laughs> So here, uh, so here, under complete uh, representations and over complete representation has different properties. Uh, under complete representation have larger receptive field to collect global uh, to collect global information, but it overlooks local details. And over complete representation have opposite property. It can focus more on the local. The details information because it upsample the features, so it can uh, capture more details. Uh, therefore, OU defend ba balance local and global feature by learning those two representations. Uh, so with uh, with this uh, architecture, it can better uh, capture the adversarial noise patterns and then further remove it. So uh, we we use this uh, module. Uh, and insert it to the target model for the ResNet background as an example. It, uh, we, uh, so uh, this method uh, insert this module after each ResNet block to do feature, uh, to do feature denoising. And yeah, so here we can see that uh, for the ResNet sample, it can insert after the ResNet block. So here, here is the result. Um, yeah, so for the left figure, we can see that the no defense baseline uh, with the PG the attack here, the feature map is quite noisy and we cannot easily observe the object patterns. Uh, uh, with, uh, if we add the OU defense modules, uh, most of the adversarial noises in the feature domain can be removed. So that it, it can improve the the uh, recognition accuracy, and in the table we can see that the oil defense performance is slightly higher than the adversarial training baseline. So uh, the next issue is that uh, we have introduced several types of adversarial video like uh, PG the attack, our attack AS and SPA. And a question is how to defend against multiple types of adversarial attacks simultaneously. And this problem is called uh, multi-perturbation robustness. And the standard adversarial training has suboptimal uh, multi-perturbation robustness. For example, if we generate only the PGD adversarial example for adversarial training, but use different attack types for testing, we found that the model is only robust to the PGD attack. It is not robust to another attack like uh, RA attack, F attack, uh, something like something. And the clean data performance also drops. And an intuitive strategy is called average adversarial training. It uses all the considered testing data types to train the models. Here, delta i is a specific uh, attack type. It generates unconsidered type of adversarial examples and uses them together for adversarial training. This strategy is better than the standard adversarial training, but it is still not good enough. And so why is average adversarial training not an ideal strategy? Uh, we, we explain this in a viewpoint of data distribution. So let's take a clean data and PGD data as examples. A clean and PGD data have distinct data distribution. Uh, thus a single batch normalization layer would learn a mixture distribution. 
however, the mixture distribution is um, the mixture distribution is different from the individual distribution of the clean data and observable data. To address this problem, there have been proposed to use an auxiliary batch normalization. At training time, if the input is clean data, fit it to the original batch norm to learn the clean data distribution. And if the input is adversarial data, fit it to the auxiliary batch norm to learn the adversarial data distribution. This can guarantee that the data from different distribution are normalized separately. And so this observation can be extended for the purpose of multi-perturbation robustness. For example, we consider uh, clean data, PGD, RA, AF, and SPA at the inference time. And the assumption is that different attack type has, dif has distinct data distribution as well. And in the real world scenario, we can not know all the potential attack types. So we have to depend against unforeseen attack type as well. So this, uh, so this work set uh, clean PGD ROA as the known data type, while AF and SPA are unforeseen data types. And the four considered types can be categorized into digital attack and physically realizable attack. Well, uh, where the PGD and SPA belong to digital attack and this, uh, an ROA and AF belong to physically realizable attack. The assumption is that similar attack types have similar data distribution. So therefore this work uh, uh, use, the, uh, use the setting and the assumption, it construct a multi, uh, multi batch normalization structure for multi-perturbation robustness. Specifically, uh, it, it, ha it has three batch, batch norm branches after each convolutional layer of the target module. Each batch norm branch is responsible for learning the distribution of a specific data type. So yeah, so here the clean, so there's a, the one branch for clean, uh, the second branch for digital attack, and the third branch is for physically realizable attack. And so we know that at inference time, uh, we, we need the model send the input type to the corresponding batch known branch automatically because we cannot control it ma manually at the inference time. So this work proposed to use a uh, adversarial detector to first, uh, first detect the input type, to, to first detect the input type and uh, send the input data to the corresponding batch known branch. And to, uh, and to make the entire model differentiable, uh, it used a scramble softmax to do this uh, classification, to do this classification task and send the results to the batch, the batch normalization branch. And so the, this equation shows the overall ob, ob, objective function. The model are jointly trained with the target model and the adversarial detector. And also it's trained with all the considered known uh, input type, including the clean PGD and RA data. And thus it can, uh, so thus the, uh, the multiple batch known branches can learn the dis distribution of the corresponding input data type. So here shows a comparison with other methods. And here the, so uh, the method like trade at average max and MSD are also uh, can also are also applicable to address the problem of multiplication uh, multi perturbation robustness. However, we can see that the multiple batch norm uh, method has a uh, has a better multi perturbation robustness than than these other uh, these other methods. 
And next, we uh, so uh, as it, so for now we have discussed uh, image-based attack and defense method. Now we, we are going to uh, introduce some of the defense methods that use uh, video specific properties. So we co we call that video specific defense uh, with, with that it use videos unique property mostly the temporal information because image has have no temporal information but video does. So they they use the this unique property to defend against the visceral videos. Uh, here we know that uh, this method are this method defend against the image based adversarial attack in videos. Uh, yeah. So, however, uh, even there, so few studies use the video specific specific property for defense. Mm, uh, there are not many, and some of them are work on adversarial detection. Uh, which is not uh, identical to the defense purpose. So the first case is the uh, ADVIT. Uh, so this work, uh, so this work, uh, use the temporal consistency to to detect the adversarial frames. Uh, so for each target frame, it uses previous frames and the optical flow to construct the pseudo frame. The pseudo frame is very similar to the target frame, but it is much less affected by uh, adversaries. Now, put the target frame and the pseudo frame into the target module, like segmentation, then compare their output. The pseudo frame is basically clean, so it can produce good results. So we can use the consistency of the output of the target frame and the pseudo frame to detect whether the target frame is adversarial or not. For example, if the target frame is clean, its output would be similar uh, would be similar to the output of pseudo frame. By contrast, if the target frame is adversarial, they would be quite different. So for the video task, for different video tasks, it uses different consistency metrics. And here are some examples for a clean frame, its output has high consistency with the output of the pseudo frame. But for an adversarial frame, the consistency is low. Therefore, we can use this property to detect the adversarial frames. And another example is, is this work. Uh, it also uses temporal consistency to detect adversarial frames. And so uh, this part of method is very similar to the previous, previous method. But this work also detects the attack is dense or sparse. Uh, the dense means that every video frames are perturbed. And the sparse, sparse means that only a few video frames are perturbed. So for dense attack, it uses an image compression model to remove perturbation frame by frame. And so this spatial defense is actually belong to the image-based defense. Uh, for the sparse attack, it replaces the adversarial frame with the pseudo frame. So here we can see that uh, the, these two works are mainly works on detecting the adversarial frames uh, not not for the defense, and even for this paper, this defense method is based on image-based defense. So there are still lacks of uh, video-specific defense method. Uh, and actually, but so there are some video-specific adversarial attack. So this means that this these methods are uh, use the video's unique property. Again, most, mostly temporal information to generate adversarial video. Uh, so video has higher dimensionality. So the search space of the adversary, adversary is larger. So, so uh, theoretically, there has uh, more possible types of adversarial examples in the video domain. Uh, because we can have, uh, we can always find the different uh, different uh, different way to use the uh, video property. 
like uh, uh, here we give two examples. Uh, the first one is appending adversarial frames. This work append an additional adversarial frame at the end of the video and only perturb the appended frames. Uh, with only a tab perturb these single frames, it can fool the entire video model. So we can see that uh, video data are actually more vulnerable to the image uh, because it is it is easier to find uh, uh, to find the uh, attack point in the search space to attack the model. And another example is called adversarial flickering attacks. So this uh, this work proposed spatial patternless adversarial video. That is the space. Uh, that is, the prohibition is a constant offset uh, applied to the entire frame. In this figure, the top row is the original video, the middle row is adversarial video, and the bottom row is the perturbation. We can see that there is no change in the spatial domain. So this attack is totally different from image-based attack. And thus, it is undetectable by image adversarial attack detector, like the two methods uh, I, uh, I just introduced earlier. And so uh, this, this is the objective function for pro producing this type of perturbation. So, uh, so this case of, uh, this is the case of universal targeted attack. In the second turn, it minimized the loss of the targeted class to for the classifier. And the first term is for regularization, which aims to make the perturbation imperceptible to human. Uh, so this work proposed two regularization terms. The first one is signals regularization. It forced the perturbation to be small by minimize the AO2 norm of the perturbation. The other one is roughness regularization, which forces the perturbation be smooth. So it has two terms. The first term control the difference between two consecutive frame perturbations. The second term controls the trend of the of perturbations. So here shows the effect of the two regularization. If we uh, if we use the first regularization only, the perturbation size is small, but it is not smooth. Like the change between the consecutive the consecutive frames are sharp. And when we use the second, uh, second regularization only, the perturbation is smooth, but the, uh, but the magnitude is bigger. So this will combine the, these two regularization to make the perturbation both small and smooth, and thus make it imperceptible to human. So, okay, so here I uh, made a, a short conclusion. So we, we have, uh, we can see that uh, image-based adversarial attack and defense method mostly can generalize to video and uh, they, they can be generalized to video and they works, they works well actually. Um, but uh, but uh, video data has their, has its specific properties so with the video specific properties, there exist more possible types of, of, of adversarial videos. And yeah, and so however, the defense against these video specific adversarial attack is, is still an open problem. And another point is that use, using the video specific property for defense is also an, uh, an open problem. Yeah, so thank you. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, thanks for, for your great talk. Uh, so anyone got any questions? Uh, you can unmute yourself for asking them here. Uh, may I ask a question? Is it in the OU defense, how does the model balance, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the OU defense, how does the model balance such two branches? 
Uh, is there any special training tricks? Uh, the much powerful O branch seems to dominate the whole architecture, while the U branch is much more weaker. So I don't know uh, what's a different different what uh, uh, whether can U branch play its role roles. Uh, okay, you mean how to balance the under complete representation and over complete representation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let me choose. Sorry about that. Okay, so so in this figure, you can see that we added the one by one convolutional layer uh, here to uh, this layer can learn the, uh, the ratio of the O branch and the U branch. So, so yeah, so this trade-off is learned by this convolutional layer. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Hi, uh, I also have a question for, uh, for the same model. Okay, sure. So uh, I realize I realize it seems like the uh, the improvement for this model seems to be marginal. Yeah. So right. I'm wondering because for the over for the old branch, right? Uh, the upsampling does not add more information. Uh, so I'm wondering, does the improvement really come from the old branch, or it is solely due to the larger model capacity? Because you are starting with a relatively small. Uh, resonant 18, right? Uh, yeah, right. So uh, do you think, so I'm wondering why O branch work if it does not add more information? Yeah, so yeah, actually we, we, we did this ablation study but I didn't put the table on this uh, on this slide. So so first, uh, the o, so first the O branch actually has very, uh, it does not has that many number of parameters compared to the are uh, compared to the rest net backbone uh, because the the number the number of channels in of uh, of each of the convolution there are, are set to very small so the uh, parameter the number of parameter increase is is not is not that significant and second we we did uh, some evaluation study on that uh, we showed that uh, all all branch uh, did make its improvement. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shaoyun, for your great presentation. Thank so, you. you may end the, sh 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 the screen sharing oh, so sure, I can sure. do the next one. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Professor Matthias Nieser. Uh, Matthias is a professor at the TUM where he leads the visual computing lab. Before, he was a visiting assistant professor at Stanford University. Professor Matthias, uh, Matthias uh, research lines at the intersection of computer vision, oh, uh, computer vision graphics and machine learning where he is particularly interested in cutting edge techniques for 3D reconstruction, semantic 3D scene understanding, video editing, and AI-driven video synthesis. His team developed Face to Face, which was the first work to manipulate facial expression from cons consumer camera in real time. Uh, Professor Matthias, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's a real pleasure to kind of be at least virtually back to CVPR. It's um, it's very good to have some engaging conversations with all of the community again. Um, it's been a while. So I hope next year we can of course do it in person. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk in this in this talk about deep takes and the generation and the detection. And I I want to kind of combine like this talk in both ex in both angles, right? Like, what is the challenge? Like, first, how do how do generations of deep fakes and generally facial editing videos work? And then also, like, what are the weaknesses? How can we detect it? How can we exploit weaknesses and so on? So, 
Of course, deepfakes is a very popular term, right? A lot of people um, have been talking about it. It's been, in a sense, a bit blown up also in the media. Um, there's been one original deepfake method, which was a method to do um, facial replacement. And the method is based on an autoencoder technique where you basically try an encoder and then you replace the decoder respectively. And then you um, kind of get this as an input and then you get a, a replacement on the face. Um, and it's a thing that was, was published on GitHub actually. It wasn't actually really published at a conference. Um, and, and this kind of gave um, the, this deepfake terminology um, the name. And it also was applied now not only to face swapping, which was, was, was done here, but it was also applied to all kinds of facial editing. And this is kind of what the media um, and even the scientific community, many people are associating with deepfakes right now. Um, and you can see probably in this kind of um, short video that it doesn't look that great yet. This was one of the first learning-based methods for face swapping. Um, but since then, of, of course, many, many other methods have been developed for both um, various facial editing methods. Okay, um, one big thing I always do when I give these deepfake talks, I wanted to clarify there's two different things actually when we're talking about facial editing. Um, one of them is face swapping and one of them is facial reenactment. And these are fundamentally different things, both from an application, but also from um, a methodology side. So when we're talking about um, face swapping, the idea is we're having essentially one video, we're having a second video and we're trying to take the face of the second video and copy pasting it on the first one. And you often see that in this case, well, this face is post, uh, pasted on this one here. Like this target video here doesn't look like it's, it's altered too much. So um, it, it looks a bit strange. Sometimes it also looks a little bit like a, a filtered version of it. Um, but, but often the, the early deepfake methods, they didn't really do the face swapping that well in a sense that, you know, it looks, looks fairly realistic. And one thing I also wanted to highlight when we're doing face swapping, by definition, this output video here, um, it's not a real video, of course, but it's, it's also, by definition, it can't be real because it creates a hybrid between a background and a foreground video, right? So the background is still from the original one, the hair is from the original video, and the foreground is from a new video. So um, I mean, whenever you're reading about deep fakes, so be very careful that most of the time when people talk about face swapping, um, it's not that big of a deal, right? Like, because the output is kind of this hybrid. Um, however, when we're talking about facial reenactment, the scenario changes slightly. Um, in this case, we're having a, a video here, we're having another video, and we're having a different expression here um, where we want to take the expressions from this target, uh, from the source video, and then we want to animate the, 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 the target video, right? And in this case, actually, that is a bit, what, what I think is a bit of a more, um, quote, unquote, interesting area, right? Because now we're actually taking an existing video, we are editing and altering the expressions, and it, it kind of looks like if that person um, was saying or was doing something different. And it still looks exactly like that person. So um, often when I'm presenting research, I'm mostly talking about facial reenactment because I think this is, um, it has a lot more applications, both both good and, and both bad, of course, right? So we have, to, we have to carefully think about that. But most of the time I'm talking about facial reenactment. Um, also, um, like, you know, facial editing is not a new thing with deep learning. This is a thing that has been around actually in the graphics community specifically in the movie industry for, for decades, right? Um, so if you're thinking about um, movie productions where you have stunt doubles and you wanna, wanna edit the face, so here you have the Star Wars. Um, it's a very famous movie, of course, where the actor's face has been virtually replaced. Um, and this is just one example, but, but this is a thing that has been around for decades, basically. And of course, nowadays we have, um, we have um, deep learning models, we have adversarial neural networks, we have GANs, we have all kinds of autoregressive networks, um, then it can actually do um, editing. And I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the editing first, and then I want to talk about what we can do for detection. So when we talk about facial editing in the graphics context, it's actually mostly a relatively straightforward pipeline um, on a high level. And on a high level, what, what people are doing, they're going ahead and doing first a facial construction. So you have you have an input um, image or video here. You, you have a, a, face, a face model here. You're trying to have an energy where you're optimizing for face parameters P. Uh, and these face parameters P kind of control the shape and the appearance of this face model. And, and the idea is we want to minimize this energy such that every pixel here uh, of this face model when we're rendering it um, matches with whatever we're seeing in the input. So this is our objective function. 
Um, and as I said, it sounds very easy on a high level, like doing phase reconstruction, but it's actually, it's pretty tricky because you have this photometric term you need to minimize um, and you have a 3D to 2D correspondence problem that you kind of need to solve. Uh, this is one of the things we've done in this face-to-face -face paper. Um, there have been a lot of other um, phase reconstruction methods, of course, but I, I think arguably um, what Justus Thies has done here in this work um, is actually, it's probably still considered to be state of the art for getting very, very accurate phase reconstructions. Um, and, and once you do this very well, you can even do this in real time, you're getting reconstructions that look like these. So here we see the input video, here we see the reconstructed geometry, and here we see, we see the reconstructed geometry plus the respective um, colors matched on top of it, right? So ideally every pixel here matches with every pixel here on the face. Um, yeah, so now what we're seeing is um, we have a good adult well reconstructed face. And what we can do now is we can actually take this face that we here reconstruct and can re-render it on top of the input video. And this is actually a synthetically rendered video here, what you see. Um, and in this video, um, yeah, the face part is re-rendered. And you can already guess, like if the reconstruction is pretty good, and this is a pretty good reconstruction here, then this video and that video is, is in a sense indistinguishable from each other. Well, and this, this kind of allows this, this, this idea of facial expression. So now what we can do is we can kind of take two people, we reconstruct both of their faces, uh, we take the expression parameters from one face and we're re-changing um, or re-rendering the face of the other person, right? Um, and if we're doing this, this is kind of what this face-to-face -face method is doing, right? So here we have a source actor um, that is replacing here the facial expressions of the target actor. Um, there's a couple of image-based techniques to make it look good. Um, the tracking is optimized on the, uh, the tracking reconstruction is optimized on the GPU. But on a, on a very high level, the idea is relatively simple, right? We, we're reconstructing a high quality face model. We're using that face model, we're editing it, uh, we're re-rendering it on top of the face. And this is how kind of traditional graphics based facial editing is done. And you can do this not only for the face, you can do this also for the whole body. Um, here's another um, project we had um, two, uh, three years ago. Actually, already now it's, um, it's this head-on project, right? So here we have the whole reconstruction of the upper body, and we can then reenact also kind of this rigid motion and, and so on, kind of thing, right? Okay, so this is kind of what graphics methods are doing, and there's various variations of that. But now I want to talk a little bit about what deep learning-based methods are doing. Um, and this is not to be confused. These graphics-based methods I've shown you before, they also use machine learning techniques, like the face model is a statistical face model um, that's based on a PCA, so this is also learned. Um, so there's, in the graphics methods, there has still a lot of learning going on. Uh, but now the question is, how do we do these kind of things with deep learning? And of course, many of you, probably all of you in this workshop, they know, of course, what um, generative neural networks are. Um, so if you're talking about generative networks, the idea is we have um, a very, very big powerful network. Um, we over-parameterize like this problem statement by having a lot of parameters. And if you have enough parameters, you can kind of recreate the input. Um, and then we have various loss functions, right? For instance, the, um, in, in the GAN setting, we have a discriminator loss. Um, and now we're trying to, in a sense, um, learn this distribution of the input images, right? Um, and, and the naive GAN formulation um, by Goodfellow, right? What, what this one is doing is it's, it's literally learning this distribution. It's very, it's very challenging, of course, to tweak all the hyperparameters, but if you're doing a good job with hyperparameter tuning, you can kind of learn this distribution of facial images and so on. Uh, one of the downsides of the GAN formulations is they, 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 ex they, they don't give you really explicit control, right? Like you, 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 you have a, a latent variable Z, from this variable Z you can generate or can sample your distribution, but you, it's very difficult to control it if you do this naively. Um, and the second thing is you, you struggle with videos, right? For images, GANs have made a lot of progress in the past um, few years, but for, for videos, it's, you know, it's, it's not that easy yet. Um, but for images, we have we have seen a lot of great works. Um, there's of course the progressive growing GAN paper, the ProGAN paper from uh, Karas et al. It's used like this incrementally growing network architecture to produce high resolution images. And then of course the follow-up works from, um, from the same group where they do style GAN um, and they produce actually quite phenomenal results. So here are some of these results that people get um, in the style GAN setting. Um, so it's very, very high quality outputs. Um, and you have kind of, you have a little bit of control now with these coarse, middle and fine styles, um, but it's still not creating any videos, right? And, and 
the control is very limited in a sense that you can kind of control style images, but you can't really create like a fully animated avatar, which would, which would be nice from a, let's say, content creation per, uh, perspective. Um, so one way to make these kind of things a little bit more applicable in practical scenarios um, is to condition the GANs. And this is what conditional GANs are doing. Um, so one of the examples um, from the um, Max Planck Institute in collaboration with us was the, the deep video portraits paper where the idea is here, um, we are essentially taking a video, we are reconstructing a face model, and then we're training a, a conditional GAN that is conditioned on these synthetic renderings and the GAN just learns to make synthetic renderings look realistic again. So it's kind of combining now the advantages of graphics-based techniques, what we have seen before, where you reconstruct the face model um, with a learning-based technique um, that makes the synthetically reconstructed face model look like an image of the video. Again. And the idea here is that this GAN here at the end, this conditional GAN is trained specifically only on one single video. And if this is trained only on one video, this GAN learns to you know, create realistic images from this one video, which is a lot easier actually to do than to generate any arbitrary videos. And it's actually quite fast to train. It takes maybe hours to train, but not, not like days or even weeks. Um, now, since we have this control here or an explicit 3D model that is being used as conditioning for the GAN part here, uh, we have full control, right? So you can take another source video here, can also do a reconstruction here, and then you can edit these kind of things. Um, by replacing certain face parameters, you can now create new real renderings, and with these new real renderings, uh, you essentially give the GAN different conditions, and since the GAN is trained on the specific video, it will make them look realistic as samples from this video. Um, and in practice, it looks like that. Um, so you've got a source sequence here. Uh, you've got a target sequence. This is actually a 3D reconstruction of her, right? Um, and this is now a condition to uh, a conditional GAN. And then the scan makes these synthetic renderings look like real images again. So the neural network converts synthetic data into realistic video. Um, and yeah, these synthetic renderings we can animate with a source track face, for instance, and then we can um, kind of control the output with the others, right? So now we're co combining kind of these advantages of graphics-based methods with deep learning-based methods, um, and we, it allows essentially GANs to have control um, in the respective target sequences. So here's another example here, right? Um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of cool, produces good results, and you can do all kind of editing things. Yeah, so one, one of the challenges, though, is um, these, these, these methods, including ours here, of course, um, they're mostly trained on, on 2D conditional GANs. And by 2D conditional GANs, I mean um, these methods have a series of 2D convolutions and they're conditioned on 2D images, on a sequence of 2D images. Um, but they don't have any 3D operators, which makes actually videos still very challenging. And this is an example here when we're training a conditional GAN. Here we're training picks to picks um, to to re-render novel viewpoints of this cube. And this is a super difficult example. This cube is like spinning in 3D, right? It has a, a very high frequency texture, text on it. Um, and if you're training it based on the current viewpoints, you're gonna get actually these like swimming artifacts. And it's kind of obvious, it's a challenging example because you're gonna have to, to make sure this 2D GAN has to learn all the 3D rotation operations, right? So this is challenging. Um, and one solution towards that is actually um, done in the work by Vincent Sitzmann, um, this D-Voxels work, where we're lifting the 2D features. So the argument we're having here is instead of running just 2D operations, we're lifting the features to 3D and applying 3D operators directly um, in the feature space. And if you're training on the very same amount of training data in the same complexity, roughly in terms of number of parameters in the model, you're going to get significantly better results of the, of the output here. Right? Um, and this is kind of a general thing that is happening in deep learning right now is like, instead of learning everything with like a black box 2D function, like a convolution, um, you're getting more and more, um, yeah, possibly differentiable parts into the network that you don't have to learn things that you know. In this case, we know how a rotation works, right? We know how a rotation matrix is being applied to a set of features and we can differentiate through it. And because of that, we, we save a lot of capacity and training capacity as well. Now we did this with voxels here, um, as, as many of you guys might know, right? Like voxels, they grow cubically, of course. Um, it's not so memory efficient. So scaling this beyond a single object is, is, is not that easy. 
Um, so one of the follow-ups works we have been doing is this neural texture work. So instead of lifting the features to a voxel space, we're now lifting the features to mesh space. Um, and then the features live on some sort of 3D geometry um, that is a proxy and it has a texture space. And instead of having RGB textile values, we're having now neural texture values. And the idea is similar to the deep voxels, what I've shown you before. Uh, now you can go ahead and, and take this proxy model, you can render it to a target viewpoint, you can sample from this texture, and you have a unit render that makes a realistic image out of it. So on a high level, what's happening here is we're saying, well, we can reconstruct some geometry, which is that one, that serves us as a proxy. It's, it's very imperfect, this geometry, because you know the texture here looks not very good. But now we can learn appearance on a per surface point in form of these neural pixels, that we can then project into a target view with a non projection function. And then we have this renderer that makes a realistic image out of it. Right? So it's like a conditional GAN, except that we have a 3D latent variable in form of this 3D model in it. So we can basically learn, um, we, we don't have to learn like these, these like projections and so on. Right? So we have them already. Um, so this is a, a thing that we can do for novel scene synthesis, we can do for all kinds of applications. Um, but we can also do it for facial reenactment. Um, and this is something we have been doing here. So here we're having a, a video of Obama. And what we're doing is we're reconstructing his face. So this is the, the, the face part of Obama. We're having a UV map of the face part. We're learning the neural textures uh, for this UV part here. Uh, and then we are learning to resynthesize Obama frames from the neural network with the re-rendering of the neural pixels. Right? Um, and, and this one works actually quite well, um, because now this pipeline can be trained end to end and it can be completely animated by a source video. And what you see here on the right hand side is, is an animation of this, right? So this is a completely synthetic synthesized video. OK, so um, I'm not sure if you heard the audio. It's like not so important, but I guess the, the conclusion here is like, for this face part here, we are essentially using these neural pixels. Um, they are uh, they're a combination of a graphics methods where we have neural pixels on top of the mesh, and then we're re-rendering on top of the respective target. And this works quite well um, because you know you, you have this latent 3D variable as form of the mesh, and this is nice. Um, and we've been working and continuing working on this problem a little bit more, where we, we wanted to. To, to combine these explicit 3D representations such that the network doesn't have to learn them anymore, which you know, saves a lot of training data and gives just better results. And one of the very recent papers, this is actually a CVPR oral from this year, um, is uh, from Guy Gaffney. He's, a, he's an, uh, actually he's a first year PhD student in my group. Um, so this is his first work. And what he's been doing, he's been working on um, combining the, the, nerf, uh, the nerf approaches with dynamic renderings of faces. And the idea here is you also have a monocular sequence here, and you want to learn this kind of um, uh, radiance field. So we have this radiance field representation like in NERF, and then you have a volumetric renderer that can go ahead and um, can render novel poses from the person. And you also want to be able um, to animate the expressions. Right? So we want to get kind of this uh, 4D avatar where we can do novel poses as well as novel expressions at the same time. Okay. Um, yeah, so how does this help in terms of editing? Well, the idea here, what we've been doing, um, creates this 4D avatar, right? Again, we can combine these kind of things now. We can, uh, let's show this again. So we can go ahead and can animate, rotate, and have kind of full control of that person's face. Um, so. In a sense, it's novel viewpoint synthesis plus um, you know, reanimations of the same person. And then you can also do retargeting in the same way we've done it before um, with all kinds of facial editing methods. You can take um, a source video and you can use that in order to animate the target video respectively, which you can see here. So let me show another example here. Again, this is a source video that is animating the respective target. So I don't want to go into all the technical details here. Um, but I think this is probably, you know, one of the state of the art uh, papers right now that you can use to take a video, you reconstruct this avatar, and you can create photorealistic re-renderings as well as reanimations um, from that video. And that produces kind of very, very realistic outputs um, that 
you know, in a, on a very high level fall this kind of deepfake family because we can edit um, videos that we have. Now I've talked a lot about the state of the art that, um, you know, we and other groups have been working for video and facial editing. Um, so now what about the detection side, right? So when I, I wanna quickly talk a little bit about that one. And in principle, you know, since, since we, we all know how neural networks work, in principle, the discriminative networks, you know, detection is the discriminative tasks. We either wanna know is it real or is it fake? Um, that in principle is an easier task, right? So you, you can go in the classical sense, you, you, you can collect a bunch of data, train a classifier, it's a binary cross entropy loss, right? It says real versus fake. If you have enough labels, eventually you hope to learn these kind of things. Uh, and this is actually what we have done, right? This is something we have been doing in the space forensics works. We've collected actually a bunch of data. Uh, in this case, we not just collected it, we created it because we had the fake methods at hand. Um, and um, we, we then had all kinds of various manipulations and then we trained classifiers to detect it. So in comparison to, to other works that have appeared at the same time, like the, the idea of the space forensics data set is actually that it doesn't have only a single method, but instead it has deep fakes, face-to-face, face swapping and neural textures. And um, in total, we have about um, over yeah, two, two, two and a half million frames. Um, of manipulated uh, videos and and we published all of this data online and a lot of people have actually already used it um, in order to train the respective classifiers right we also made sure we had a reasonable diversity in terms of gender in terms of resolution and also in terms of pixel coverage um, for how many pixels the face covered um, uh, yeah i think these numbers are a little bit outdated i think we've probably over 5,000 groups or so now that have used this data set um, it's a relatively popular data set in this in this area um, because a lot of people actually um, are working on, on these problems because it's very relevant. Uh, in addition to the, to the data set itself, we also have a benchmark. Um, again, these numbers are a little bit outdated. Um, actually, the, the benchmark numbers are a lot better right now than 0.7. They actually owe 0.9 already. Um, so people have gotten pretty good results on detection um, by, by using this kind of data. And you know this is done in this uh, public benchmark. Now, in principle, this sounds all pretty easy, right? Because um, you, you can just generate uh, like some fake data, right? You, you collect a lot of this fake data and you then use that data to train a classifier. And if you have enough data, which I believe we have right now, we can have very reliable decisions whether things are real or whether they are fake, right? Um, so now this sounds all good in principle, um, as long as you're in an academic setting, you have a data set, you try to feed numbers in the data set, but as soon as you go to the real world, things become a lot, lot more problematic. And the simple why things <laughs> become a lot more problematic is um, as soon as anything changes in the distribution of your test data, um, things don't work so well anymore. In fact, the better you're doing on the test data set um, and the bigger you make your model, right? You're more overfitting to the respective data sets features. That's a very common thing, of course. Um, and this is very challenging specifically in that context of fake detection. So there's, there's a lot of major challenges like self-supervised learning, transfer learning, unsupervised learning. But I wanted to highlight how bad these, uh, the generalizability is actually right now. So if you are training an exception net model, it's a pretty big model, of course. If you're training this on, let's say, face-to-face -face, and you're testing on face-to-face, -face, you're getting 90% accuracy. So it's basically solved, right? So it's, it's a um, very high accuracy. But then when you're testing on face swap, you see that the generalizability between these two methods is, is zero. Right? There's like no generalizability because face swap data statistics are very different from face to face data statistics. And the same way comes the other way around. If you only train on face swap videos, you've been very good on face swap, but very bad on face to face. Now, the first thing we tried, we thought, well, you know, <laughs> um, we just need enough methods. And that's what we've done. And we played around with this line of research a little bit. Um, so we added more methods here. Uh, so we got better generalizability, but it's it's far from the 98%, and it's very, very far away. So it was very obvious that we needed an algorithmic and not just a data solution. Uh, one of the first works we've been looking at um, to do this generalizability was the forensics transfer. So essentially, we looked at future learning methods um, and how to apply them to this problem. In this case, we um, have a very nice representation learner that you, it's based on an autoencoder. And if you're doing this right, you get better transferability, right? So this is the number of images for fine tuning. This is the average accuracy um, if you're running 10 times. So with, you know, like if you're having 10-ish 10, 10 frames of the target distribution, 
uh, then it works pretty well. If you have one frame of the target distribution, it's already pretty bad. And if you have none of the target distribution, then it would be even worse. So it's the work here, this forensic transfer makes quite some progress, but it's far away from making it reliable in a sense, because um, you only have a, a limited set of methods available, basically. And this is a big problem. So yeah, we thought a little bit about it and we realized it's, it's not so easy because on social media, so you can expect basically to have new methods appearing all the time. And it's very difficult um, to retrain your model all the time. So this is something we had to think a little bit about. And one of the very recent methods we've been working on was ID reveal. Um, and here we thought, well, maybe we should, we should actually change the problem formulation entirely. Like maybe, maybe it's just not a good thing to ask whether a video is real or fake. Because I mean, by definition, all videos are kind of uh, fake because they have some video compression on it and so on. So we thought maybe we can, we can actually change the problem setting a little bit. Um, and we can rather say, is it the same person or is it a different person? So we're trying to basically classify whether it's the same identity and we're training this on, on, on the biometric features that we can learn very efficiently. And the idea is that we can do this in a, only on the real videos. So now if you're going ahead and saying you have n real videos, you cluster these n real videos in a self-supervised way, um, you're getting these clusters. And then if a video is not part of this cluster anymore, then you consider it to be a fake video. Right? Um, but we're doing a little bit more here. Um, we actually want to make it fairly generalizable. And the generalizability we're actually achieving by going via um, a 3D reconstruction of the face. So we're using a 3D model. Uh, so we're having a video, right? We're reconstructing a 3D, a, a 3D model here. We're having a, um, a temporal ID net. I'm going to go into all the details here, but it's, it's a neural network that considers all frames at the same time. Uh, and then we are learning a distance metric. Um, is, it this, is it from the same video? Is it from the same person or not, right? Uh, and this is done with metric learning. So the idea is um, for each face, we extract a bunch of features um, from our face tracker and from our face reconstruction. So we're getting shape, expression, and pose. Um, and this is from the model model. And then we're training this um, spatiotemporal model um, such that we're getting these feature embeddings and we're making sure that um, the same, the, the features of the same person are close and the features of different people will be um, further apart. And now, unfortunately, what you're going to get is, so, so maybe one of the rationale here is why we're using a morphal model here is we didn't want to do it directly on the video frames. If you do this on the video frames, then you again have this problem that you're very prone to overfitting to the data sets characteristics and like the appearance and the image characteristics, right? Uh, but if I'm tracking away with this metric learner, you have uh, with the morphal model, you have this nice property that the metric learner operates on this abstract feature space. So you're not so prone to small lighting changes and compression artifacts and stuff like this. And this is one big plus here, uh, why this thing works a lot better. Uh, but one thing we still have to consider is we're going to have not that much training data necessarily always available. Um, and in this case, we are helping this by using adversarial training. So we use a generative network to produce features um, where similar to those that we may extract from manipulated videos. And, and this actually helps quite a bit. So we basically do adversarial training for these extra features. And then the objective of the adversarial game is to increase the ability of the network to distinguish real uh, from fake identities. And this works actually pretty well. So, you know, in practice, it looks something like this. So we have here identity A, identity B, we have face reconstructions, we're getting the morphal model network. This is this, uh, um, uh, th these are these features that we're getting from the morphal model. And then we have this temporal ID network. And then we just say here, we have a temporal loss. Um, and so we have this uh, discriminative loss that says, is it real or is it fake from the respective group? And yeah, this one, um, if you're comparing it. So here are some examples um, of detection results in some of the data sets um, with different methods. And here uh, you see the accuracy and here you see different combinations of different methods. So these, these four here are different backbone architectures basically that are directly supervised methods that are trained and tested on the very same data sets, right? So we have here, um, well, a smaller data set, a smaller, uh, a smaller neural network will get you only like 70%, the bigger network will give you higher accuracy and so on. So depending on how you design your architecture, how efficiently you encode the temporal features and stuff like this, you're gonna get a certain accuracy here. Um, 
on 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 the train and test within the same domain on the same method. Now the challenge is when we have manipulations that are out of train, um, all of these accuracy here they drop dramatically, and most of the time they actually drop almost to 50 50. Right, so if you're looking at it, this is like 52, this is 53, 55, okay, this one is 61, um, but it, it didn't work so well in the first place. So, like, but the, the, these ones they drop all dramatically, and it's, it's, it's all reasonable, right? Because we're training on one thing and then we're testing on something that's slightly different in terms of distribution. So, yeah, uh, so state of the art achieved 74. Uh, we are achieving now 75, which is still not perfect, but it's a lot better. Uh, so it's on par with state of the art, but it's a lot better than all the supervised methods. But we're actually um, obtaining even better results when, we, when, we are, when we're doing it with unseen compressions. So one big challenge in this defect detection thing is like all the videos are actually compressed in practice. And in that case, we can actually further improve the accuracies um, if you're considering these type of unseen compressions. Whereas the baseline methods here, they actually completely fail because they cannot, they, they, they cannot um, they cannot cope with these things, which we basically do um, with the abstraction of the 3D morphal model and with our adversarial training strategy. Uh, so these numbers are actually, these are not the very recent numbers. Actually, we, we improved this idea reveal even a bit more. Um, I would really recommend um, to have a look at the paper because it's a kind of a cool idea, right? So we basically abstracting features away with a morphal model with a with for the handcrafted feature, but then we're using a neural network um, to work on top of the features instead of overfitting to patterns uh, on the images itself, which, which for the fake detection, they turn out to be not very generalizable. Okay, um, yeah, I wanted to show, well, I have one more slide uh, for some work in progress. Um, so maybe one idea is to have active defenses against generative models, um, where we've seen a lot of talks right now about adversarial attacks. Um, one of the thought is, can you actually include, include noise patterns in, in images and videos that sort of the deep fake or the, any generative models can do anything anymore? And this is currently what we're playing around with. So here's an input image. We have some low-level noise that is hardly noticeable. Um, and then we can actually disrupt the generative models quite a bit. Um, so here we're using an, an FGSM model. Um, and the objective here is to target it, um, adversarial attack where we want it to make sure that it's quote unquote as read in the output as possible. Um, so this currently work under progress. Um, the thing that we're trying to do basically is finding noise patterns that make generative models fail, but survive things like compression and so on. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing. We're looking at differential JPEG compression and these kind of things. Um, and I think that's kind of a cool future direction. Uh, unfortunately, I, would, I wish I could have talked a bit more about this part. Um, because it would have fitted well um, also to the previous talks. Um, but I hope um, I hope we can we can show some some updates um, in the next iteration. So yeah, um, so to the conclusion, um, I think generally speaking, looking at both sides, the synthesis and the detection is kind of cool because you know you can learn one can learn from the other, one can one one or the other can make the other one respectively better. Um, so these things inevitably go together. So this is why I'm very excited about both both, both things. And um, there's also very cool, technical, interesting things you can do, like where you can use these adversarial attacks for generative models and stuff like this. Um, I would also like to thank all the people who have been working on it. So these are the collaborators um, um, on, these, uh, on these papers. And um, a little bit of um, advertisement. If you're interested in, in some of our CVPR works in general, um, here are our CVPR papers from our group, um, especially the dynamic neural radiance field. Um, uh, paper I've talked about today um, that is, I think, a pretty cool paper, and um, I would really encourage you to have a look. So yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Matthias, uh, thank you so much for this talk. So anyone got questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, first, of all, thanks for the for the talk. It's a, it's a brilliant thing because uh, part of my background is a computer graphics too. So I really appreciate that uh, the talk started with uh, what graphics people did over the years, right? So I have actually a general question, a high level question regarding uh, adversarial attack because uh, it seems to me that uh, adversarial attack actually is based on the fact that it's the attack itself. It should be at least imperceptive. Right to humans, uh, otherwise it won't be adversarial anymore. Uh, exactly. That means actually, 
there are, in my mind, there are always three different kind of uh, distributions uh, here. One is the original data distribution. One is actually the adversarial sample distribution. One is actually the uh, imperceptive kind of uh, adversarial samples. So those three distributions uh, in our experience are, are slightly different from each other. So one thing I think fundamental question I have here is uh, what kind of role do you think perception would play here? Because it seems that all, almost all the image-based attack method, defense method actually use, for example, our norm as some sort of a surrogate perception distortion metric, right? Which won't transfer well to uh, things with dynamics like videos or animation, right? So I guess my question is, uh, do you think that's something that the whole community should be looking into or uh, or if so, what would, would you think would be the best way to approach it? Thanks. No, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question actually, right? I mean, of course you don't want to see it and what you, what you when you're adding adversarial um, attacks on an image, it's very different from adversarial attacks on videos because you don't have the temporal aspects. Um, the big question, I mean, it's always a bit of a, yeah, of a cat and mouse game, right? Like the question is, what's your manipulation method? I think all the good manipulation methods right now for, for these kind of video-based methods, they, they, they consider a temporal neural network, right? Meaning that the, the generative networks to produce the fakes, they're considering multiple frames at the same time. And I think that, that of course provides an opportunity because these networks have to be pretty powerful in order to create good videos. But that creates an opportunity for attacks that leverage actually temporal artifacts more, right? So from an attacker standpoint, we're having more more angles for attack. So and um, I'm I'm thinking it not as an attack. I'm thinking of the defense against deepfakes. Um, so we have in a principle we have more ways to prevent that a video can be deepfaked um, by by considering the whole video. That's one part. Uh, the second part of your question, I fully agree with you, like looking just in an L1 metric, like stay close to the original image or video um, is a terrible metric, right? Um, but this, <laughs> this is the same problem that we have for all kind of generative models. Um, what's our metric for perception, right? And I, I definitely think the community has to look at this more, right? There's a few tools that we have at hand. We have things like, I don't know, we have perceptual losses, we have... Um, we have FFI D scores and stuff like this, right? We have a few tools that are available, but um, these tools are nowhere near the level that make these kind of things practical yet. So yeah, absolutely. I think there's a fantastic research area. I can, can only recommend to look at it in more detail. Uh, sorry, just a very quick, I don't want to dominate the, the, the conversation, but I just want to follow up with a very quick question. So, so see, for example, we, we all, a lot of people use like a, a alpha ball kind of constraints to, to, to restrain, uh, to or restrain a possible tax, right? But in, uh, in defenses, for example, in approaches like adversarial training, the, the actually the adversarial samples used for robust training uh, are just intermediate results. So they won't be evaluated by, by people, right? So in that sense, uh, do you think that people could be bolder in terms of um, in terms of use of uh, adversarial samples in adversarial, adversarial training, for example, or we should also distinguish between actually uh, the real okay that's the wrong word the 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 dangerous adversarial the dangerous inceptive adversarial samples and the general adversarial samples because those two distributions are actually very different. Well, technically, you definitely have to, to, to distinguish between the distributions. I mean, the question is basically what makes a network learn better, right? Um, like if you consider a defense, um, it's not always clear whether like sometimes it might make sense to use intermediate features or sorry intermediate training stages or so. Um, from the from the generative models because this might just converge better in your training phase. Um, I think it's hard to answer yet. I think the problem what we are still having is we are still struggling a little bit with defining the objective, right? Like whenever we're doing adversarial attacks, in a sense, um, we we always have this problem like, oh, what's what's the objective function, right? And the objective function mostly turns down to some L1 plus, plus a bunch of other stuff that we're adding and we handcrafting that one. And, and it's not a good function that we're having there, but it's a difficult problem. I think ultimately that's the big question we have to, we have to look into. Thanks. Any other questions?
Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, a deep fake. So uh, I, I'm quite new to deep fake and uh, I've read ser several papers. Uh, it seems that uh, different uh, algorithms uh, focus on their training algorithms using different data sets. I was wondering, is there any general suggestion that which data set we should use when training a detection model? And meanwhile, is there a case that um, certain data sets are more proper for training and while certain data sets are not? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the biggest challenge, of course, when detecting defects is, you, you know, it's, in a sense, it's easy. You train a binary classifier, you have a lot of data of a fake method, you can detect the fake method. But the problem is, of course, there's a lot of different methods. So all these like detectors, they are mostly method specific, right? Train on one method, detect this one method. Um, I think what's, what's more interesting is, is you, if you're training, of course, on many methods at the same time, and then you don't have just a binary classifier, you have, uh, you have an n-way classifier where um, you have n minus one fake methods and one real method. Um, so for face forensics, at least we have four fake methods. That's not great, <laughs> but it's typically three methods more than any other data set. And um, yeah, this is the big challenge, of course, right? Like how do we have enough variety of, of different fake methods in one data set? And I mean, the, the objective answer would be, well, also take now again, like from the last year, take the newest methods again, regenerate all the fakes there, add this to the data set and so on. So I could even think about, um, yeah, I don't know, like, I mean, so face forensic is a good data set for this kind of stuff. There's, there's maybe bigger data sets like um, the one from Facebook, but they only have one fake method. They have more data, but only one fake method, right? So this is kind of the trade-off between these, between these data sets. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the honest answer would probably be in order to get better, we need still more method and we need still better transferability between the methods. And probably none of the method, probably none of the data sets cover all axes. This is why this is still an open research area, right? Why it still needs a lot of, um, a lot of work by the community. Yeah, I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you, I see. Uh, a quick follow-up. Uh, so uh, it seems that uh, the most problem, the biggest problem right now is the general, generalization problem. So uh, one method might works well on their own data set, but while tested on other data set, it fails. Um, and I've seen recently, I've seen works that they uh, like take each portion of uh, data set from each, uh, each portion of the videos from each data set and combine to make it a big training set. And then they make they do the testing and they get some good performance. But in my map, in my mind, I don't really think this solves the generalization problem because you still see all data, all videos in the training set and in the testing data set. So regarding the generalization problem, do you have any like general idea or suggestions on what people should do in the yeah. following? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the obvious thing is right. The hope is if you have if you're training on ten method, it, it generalizes to the eleventh method. This oh, works to some degree. <laughs> it gets better, but it, it's by far no as good as if you train on this method already, right? Um, and this is the big challenge. This is why we have to look at. Um, but by the way, it's a even for humans, it's a fundamentally problematic question statement. Like because it eventually comes down to the question: What is the fake video? Like every video is fake in one way. Every video is compressed. Every video has some post processing. Every video has some um, image enhancement, probably, right? So every video is fake in a way. So the honest answer would be also to not call this real and fake detection. It would be more like, well, what kind of manipulation or features can we find in it to, to figure out what's the history that has been used to pre-process the video, right? That, that's actually the more honest answer. Um, but yeah, we have to look at generalizability methods. We have to look at domain transfer methods and we have to look at um, alternative formulations that help us to generalize the features better than just a, a naive classifier. Um, if you had asked me like four or five years ago, I thought, well, there's gonna be a few dominant methods we train on them, that's gonna be good enough, but that's not gonna be the case. We have to find better ways to do that. And by the way, this is not just a problem for, for deep fake detection. This is a problem for any arbitrary classifier too, right? Like think about the people in the self-driving car communities. They have all the problems that train them during the day um, and then testing during the night and then, then it's rainy, then it's foggy, right? Like there's like entire workshops just about these problems. Um, and it's people trying to look at it by let's throw as much data at it as we can, but eventually, right, the, the algorithmic 
challenges will be how can we do it to generalize better without just doing brute force augmentations. Yeah, I see. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again for your great talk, uh, Matisse. So we can move to the next speaker. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Chao Wei Xiao. Uh, Chao Wei is a research scientist uh, at NVIDIA and an uh, incoming assistant professor at uh, Arizona State University. His research interest lies at the intersection of computer security, privacy, and machine learning. His works has been featured in multiple media outlets, including Wild Fortune, I Trouble E Spectrum. One of his research output is now on display at the Science Museum in London. Uh, he has received the Best Paper Award at MobiCon 2014 and the ESWN 2021. And the floor is yours. Charlie. Yeah, hi. Are you able to share your screen? Oh, great. Oh, uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Yeah, can, I, can I see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Thanks. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, hello, everyone. Today I will talk about the adversary machine learning in the 3D domain. Yeah, we all know deep learning is really good. It achieves great success. However, it also introduces the problem. So for example, the autonomous driving relies the deep learning to detect cars, lines, and other obstacles. However, in 2016, there is an accident caused by the autonomous driving cars and killed one person in Florida. After the investigation, the cause of this accident is the autonomous driving car system not designed to always detect the vehicles, cutting in front with a left turn. So the reason why it has happened is that in traditional machine learning system, there is a strong assumption that the distribution of the training data are similar to the distribution of the test data. So based on these assumptions, we design our machine learning algorithms, assume that we collect some data labeled as benign and uh, malicious in these uh, examples. And we could split them into the training data and text data. We train a classifier, use the training data. And after the training, the classifier could predict the label given any arbitrary input. So if the test data is located in the distribution of the training data, then it could be predicted correctly. However, if there is a malware which is not located in the distribution of the training data, then the classifier has a probability to predict it as the benign, so it will evade the detection. Moreover, we live in the adversary environment. There are some bad guys behind the system which could manipulate the data. So I think, I, I think you have already saw this uh, figure for multiple times today and uh, so, but um, before moving towards, uh, uh, let's recall these images. So let's recall why for our humans, uh, we could still recognize like uh, this uh, panda as like a panda. So the reason is because uh, here, uh, where humans is insensitive to the small perturbations, and here the perturbation is uh, bounded by the P distance. So in these communities, as the early stage researchers use the LP as the threat models to keep the perception realistic. So uh, before we discuss the adversary uh, examples in 3D domains, let's first see the reasonability of these threat models. So if we do a literature review at the early stage of this domain, almost all the advanced attack or defense methods are proposed based on, on these threat models. However, uh, before moving towards more advanced attack and defense methods, let's go back and think about the original question. Is the LP the only threat model for those examples? Definitely LP is not the only threat model. The reason why we use it because it could be used to keep the perception realistic of the images, right? However, it could not um, measure the perception realistic really well for this. Term. For instance, let's say the left images. If we change the lightning, it will introduce a large magnitude in terms of L2 distance. Uh, and if we shift in the pixel positions, it will also introduce a large magnitude in terms of L infinities. But for our humans, we can both recognize these two images correctly. 
So this example shows that LP is not a really good matrix to evaluate the looks look like. So here the question is like beyond LP, how can we generate like adverse examples? So here we argue that the adverse examples should be the input which could be correctly recognized by the humans but mislead the machine learning models. So adverse example is proposed from the human perspective view and we need to have a target machine learning model system. This rephrase definitions provide us a general way to design our objective functions to generate adverse examples. So generally, in order to achieve this, we need to have two loss functions. One is adversity loss and the other is perceptual loss. So the adversity loss aims to fool the machine learning systems and the perceptual loss aims to make the adversity images correctly recognized by the humans. So with this new objective functions, we could simplify the generation pipeline as follows. So we have some benign input and we have a manipulation function. So we hope to manipulate this function to generate a new input and feed this new input into the machine learning model to get output. And we hope the output could be recognized as target label. Therefore, this output of the machine learning model could provide us the adversity loss with respect to this manipulation functions. And at the same time, so we need to have some constraint for this manipula manipulation functions because we don't want the generate input uh, for the humans, right? So with this like a new like uh, general pipeline, uh, let's think about uh, uh, be, be instead of adding the pixel uh, pixels perturbations, how can we generate uh, all those examples? So here is an example. So we, what, we sh what we can do is we can move in the pixel positions. For example, we can change the pixel positions of these two cells. And this uh, operation can be represented by the flow. And the value of this flow can be uh, used to represent the pixel displacement. Cool, so this is like new manipulation functions, right? So with this new manipulation functions, we could generate new type of those examples. So for example, here we know that we hope to move the pixel positions to generate all those examples. Therefore, the parameter for us to optimize here is the flow. Given the flow and the original images, we could generate new images. And we want these new images to fool the machine learning model. Therefore, the output of the machine learning model could provide an adversity loss to optimize this flow. And also we need to constrain this flow, right? So we need to make the generated images still looks realistic to the humans. So in detail, we could use the hinge loss uh, uh, as the uh, adversary loss. And also we should uh, constrain the uh, flows. For example, here we use a total, var total variance loss. The high level idea is we want the pixels uh, move to the uh, adjacent pixels move towards the same directions with the same magnitude. So the extreme like case is all the pixels move towards to the same directions. So it's like shifting. So our humans are insensitive to this uh, uh, shifting. It still looks realistic to our humans. And so this is like a new generated uh, like uh, um, result. We can say the last row is like uh, this new type of like method. We can say that instead of the original method, which added the perturbation in the background, here, what we are doing is we moving the pixel positions. So for example, here we're moving the pixel positions of each digit and all of this one are predicted as a target label zero by the machine learning system. So cool, so here we can say that uh, uh, we can design some like uh, a new method which instead of like uh, adding the pixel positions bound by the LP distance, here we can move in the pixel positions to generate all those examples. So now we can say that how can we like uh, uh, transfer this uh, moving pixel positions to generate adverse examples in 3D. Actually, we more care about the adverse example in the 3D space as we live in the 3D world to explore the feasibility of adverse example in 3D space. Uh, we need to discuss it from the different type of 3D resources, for example, uh, let's take the uh, autumn streaming as an example. So for the autumn streaming, it has the different sensors which can get a different type of information of the world. For example, we have the cameras, so we can get the images of the object, right? 
And we can also have some like uh, uh, LiDAR sensors, which we can also get the 3D object as the point cloud format for these systems, right? So in order to start this autopsy in 3D space, we should consider like both like, uh, uh, like formulation format of the 3D object, right? So here, for example, uh, let's uh, consider two types of like uh, uh, input. One is like a uh, uh, camera, another is uh, LiDAR. So let's start from the camera. So for the uh, for the uh, in order to start with the um, camera based like three D other examples, first way what we need to do is we need need we need to know what the digital images comes from. Right? So the digital images comes from the three D physical domain. In order to start it, we should simulate the photo taking process and need to know what are the component uh, in the three D space, right? So generally speaking, the images are formed uh, from the illumination, shape, and the texture information through a render process. So zero to generate 3D uh, also examples, we could manipulate uh, either these three like information. Right? There already has been significant like progress on generate physical possible also examples by altering the texture of the 3D surface, right? So for example, uh, it can apply a adversary printable 2D patches uh, into this like a stop into the machine learning systems, right? Uh, as we seen before, like uh, uh, besides manipulating the texture information in 3D space, we could also manipulate the shape information to generate those examples. So here we wonder whether the shape is as robust as we think to define against those examples. So in order to do it, uh, uh, we explore the 3D object, which has the uh, rich shape information, but minimal texture vari variation, and show that uh, we can still like uh, feel for the adversary ghost by perturbing the shape of the 3D object. So our attack pipeline is as this follows. So here we simulate the like photo thinking process, right? So for example, uh, we have some like object, so we have like a camera, so we can do a photo taken. So here we use a renderer to simulate the functionality of the camera. And then we get this 2D images, and then we fit these images into the machine learning models uh, to do some recognition tasks. Right? So here is like uh, what we manipulate is we hope to manipulate the shape information of the images or the texture information of the images, right? So here we use, uh, in order to generate other examples, uh, we need the all pipeline like end-to-end, uh, -end, so which, which we need to make them differentiable, right? So here we use a differentiable render to do it. And we design our object function, which has adversary loss, which fools the machine learning models, and we have a perception loss, which we need to constrain the 3D shape, right? So we, because we still want it looks like the object, and it still like uh, we want it can be printable, right? So in detail, uh, in detail for the uh, in order to for the adversary loss, in order to attack classification, we can use some like cross entropy loss. In order to for the detection, we can use some like disappearance loss. And for the perception loss, uh, similar here we can move in the like uh, vertex of the three D meshes of the shape, right? So we, we can also use a total 3D total variance loss, which is a hell of idea is also make the adjacent vertex moving towards the same direction with the same magnitude. So in this way, we can get a, like a smooth surface, which is a printable and still looks realistic to our humans. And uh, the result shows that uh, even in the, uh, even by perturb the 3D uh, object uh, perturb the shape information, it can still fool the neural networks. As I mentioned before, so in order to generate the adverse example, uh, here we use a differentiable render. So a natural question is like, uh, can we transfer like this adverse examples into some black box render, which is non-differentiable and more complicated and more realistic? The reason is also, yes, we can transfer our adverse examples into the black box render as well, which pave the way to like attack the physical like uh, environment. And here we also like transfer to attack the object detectors as well. So 
uh, as I mentioned, like uh, for the like uh, uh, autumn streaming system for the three D space, uh, uh, camera is not only sensor. We I also have some other sensors such as lidar, right? So a natural question is 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 like can we like uh, also for the lidar perceptual system, for example, for the autumn streaming like systems. So in order to do it, uh, first, what we need to do is we need to see how LiDAR works, right? So the LiDAR sensors fires off an array of leader beams constructed in the horizontal and the vertex directions. And it then captures the light intensity reflecting back and calculates the time of that photons have traveled along each beam. So the distance and the coordinate of the surface point along this beam can be computed. Therefore, uh, we could get the point cloud representation after the um, LiDAR preprocessing, right? So different from like the camera space, which we can like uh, uh, attack the illumination or texture or the shape to for the camera system, right? For the LiDAR perceptual system, because it can only capture the shape information, so we cannot like uh, attack the texture to for it, right? So here is uh, we want to manipulate the shape information to attack the LiDAR perceptual system. Okay, cool. We know like what we could manipulate. Then we can design our like loss function. As I mentioned before, we can have two loss. One is adversity loss, which want to fool the machine learning system. And we have perceptual loss, which want to constrain the shape. Right? And then, so this is the, the pipeline, which we simulated the autonomous driving pipeline. So we have like object, and uh, we have a LiDAR which can get the point cloud of like this object and we fit it into the uh, AV perception model. So here we use the Baidu Apollo's model, which is like uh, open source, like uh, real world uh, industry level, like uh, uh, autumn streaming models. And then finally, it can, we can get the like detection result of this model. So here our target goal is not uh, to make the object uh, not detected by the AV system. So we design our like uh, uh, objective function as follows. And similar for the adversity loss, uh, we hope to miss the detected bounding box so we can use uh, the uh, adversity loss looks like this one. And also for the perception loss is because we want to finally print the 3D object by using 3D printer, right? So we hope the surface of this object as smooth as possible. In this case, it is either for us to use the cheaper like 3D printing equipment to print it. So here we also use the 3D like a, a distance loss, which is also the total variance loss. The idea is also we want the ships, uh, we want the adjacent vertex to move towards the same directions with the same magnitude. Okay, cool. By doing this things, it seems that we can generate uh, like uh, adversary object, right? But uh, the difference uh, in the LiDAR perceptual system is uh, it has a lot of like non differentiable part, uh, which you cannot uh, directly back propagate the adversary gradient from the output of the machine learning models into the input 3D object. So for example, for the AV perceptual system, it has a lot of like non differentiable pre-processing and post-processing. So uh, in order to do it, we use some like approximation functions to make them differentiable. In this case, we can back propagate the gradient from the uh, input of the machine learning model to the point cloud. And also uh, the gradient from the point cloud to the uh, uh, object is also like uh, um, captured by the LiDAR physical equipment, right? And for this physical equipment, it is also non-differentiable, right? Because this is a LiDAR equipment. So in order to also make the gradient come back propagate from the point cloud to the 3D uh, meshes, we use some like uh, uh, differentiable like uh, render to simulate the functionality of the LiDAR to back propagate the gradient. And then by doing all of these things, we can generate an object to attack the uh, LiDAR perceptual systems. So here is like uh, an example. So this is the object which we generate and we put it on the road. And there is a real world autonomous driving cars to scan it. And here is a demo and we can show that if we put a benign object, the system can detect the bounding box of this object. But if we put our object, uh, other objects in the road, 
we can see that uh, even though uh, the car is moving towards these things, uh, but uh, the bounding box can still not be detected. So it shows that the LiDAR is also like uh, not really like a safe sensors. It also can introduce adversary behaviors. So we still should uh, uh, study the robust like LiDAR perception system. Also like uh, we can extend it into the uh, sensor fusion like system because for the autonomous driving, finally they use the multi-sensor fusion to serve as the perception module. And here we can like uh, generate object uh, like a shape object to attack both like uh, uh, camera and uh, like a LiDAR part. And here is uh, our demo. And uh, this is the binary call and this is the adversary call which we generate. And we can see that uh, uh, if the car, oh, let's see the video. We can see that uh, uh, if the car, if there is a binary call, the car will stop here because it detected it. The final like uh, uh, model like uh, decision is stop here, but uh, however, if there is an adversary call, the car can still like uh, uh, go across it because uh, it didn't uh, detect it. So in the real world, it will move towards this object and uh, cause the crash. And also, like uh, previously, we discussed about like we can print a 3D object to fool the LiDAR perception system. And also, we can use some like physical equipment, uh, like to spoof some like LiDAR point cloud to fool the LiDAR perception system as well. So here, the setting is like a re reverse setting. So originally, there is no object here. But uh, what we are doing is like we use some physical equipment uh, to spoof some point cloud here. And uh, the car will detect, oh, there is an object, even though there is uh, no object uh, actually. And uh, also like uh, in the reinforcement learning systems, it's also vulnerable. We can still generate all those examples. And even in the physical world of this system, we can still generate all those examples. Here is a demo. Uh, we can say that uh, this is like a, a car which we use the reinforcement learning to train this car and the car can go smoothly from the left images, which is like uh, B9 images. And here we have like some adversary like object here. And we can see that the, when the car like uh, detects these things, it will move towards it to this like object and the cause the crash. So it shows that uh, uh, in the physical world, even for the deep reinforcement learning systems, it also really vulnerable. So, uh, I already discussed a lot about like the attack method. So how to so solve it? So what is the solution for these things? So next, uh, let's uh, discuss something about like the defense. So actually, uh, okay. So defend against other worst example is a really hard question. So, a brief history of the defense is there is so many paper at the early stage published in the top conference, but after a while, most of them uh, has been like attacked. Uh, and even for the 3D domain, like uh, there is some like defense method also published in the top 10 conference, but it also bro broken like uh, recently. So uh, the aerospace which contains all those uh, like uh, phenomena is really large. So it is really hard to have like a really robust system. But uh, how can we solve that? We still want to like have a robust uh, move towards to the robust like uh, uh, 3D like uh, machine learning system. Right? So here like the adversary training is still the effective way. But uh, in the 3D domain, different from the deep learning for the 2D domain, it has a lot of like uh, difference and a lot of challenges. For example, deep learning for 3D perception models is a relative like uh, uh, nascent field. It is still an active area of the research to find the proper universal 3D backbones. So unlike in the 2D space, uh, we use like, uh, for example, the convolution network, like the ResNet or some like DeathNet as our backbone. In the 3D domain, they use totally like different like uh, backbones. For example, uh, the three representative like a model is like the point net, DGCN, or the recent like point cloud transformer based architectures. And also in the 3D domain, the annotation is really expensive. Take this figure as an example. Different from 2D images, 
which has texture information could help human to label the images. In 3D domain, for the 3D point cloud, it do not have the texture information, right? So if we only give the label, uh, give the uh, worker to label like uh, this, uh, like uh, box areas, uh, it is uh, really hard for them to recognize, okay, what is the object for these things, right? So this also motivated us to study and uh, given these challenges in 3D domain, it motivated us to study and uh, improve the advanced robustness in 3D domain by using the limited like uh, data or label information. So here like uh, in this work, we started like why there can leverage the self supervised like uh, learning to improve the robustness on the 3D domain. So uh, here we, we started the self-supervised learning to improve the advocacy robustness and also perform a systematic analysis of the advocacy robustness in different like 3D like uh, uh, architectures like backbones. So in order to start it, we should design the attack strand models, right? So here we select the different attack strand model, such as we shifting the point cloud, we adding the point cloud, or we dropping some like point cloud. So this is three like strand model what we uh, started. And also because we hope to start the self-supervised learning with the robustness, we need to have some like a self-supervised learning pre-task. So here we select three like a representative like a version. One is a 3D rotation, one is a 3D jigsaw, and another is like a autoencoder. So for the 3D rotation, it's like a perform the global change, right? So it uh, directly like change the uh, rotate like the uh, 3D object, the point cloud. However, for the uh, 3D jigsaw, it's like it cut the 3D like point cloud into the different like pieces, and then formulate these pieces to make the machine learning model to predict the order. So this uh, like uh, pre task uh, can be viewed as involve some like uh, local changes of the like uh, uh, 3D information, right? Uh, so in order to start how self-supervised learning influences the advocacy robustness, here we should start like two pipelines. So one pipeline is we call it uh, advocacy pre-training for fine-tuning, which means that we use uh, self-supervised learning to do the pre-training and then we do the advocacy fine-tuning. We want to see whether it can improve the robustness. Another setting what we can start is we can do the joint training, right? So we have the 3D self-supervised learning task and we also have the advocacy training task. And we joint train them to see whether it can improve the robustness. So the result is really interesting. We find that for the advanced pre-training and fine-tuning, it can consistently improve the advanced robustness compared to the pure advanced training like strategies. And also for the 3D jigsaw task, which predicts the permutation of the 3D point cloud patches can help achieve the stronger robustness than the others. And also for the uh, DGCN like uh, uh, network, which is a convolutional based net network, it can also like achieve the better performance. So this uh, result uh, motivate us uh, that the robust the local features in the 3D like domain can help limit the, the propagation of the adversary effect from the point cloud level like uh, point, point, point level input perturbations to the model final output. So it can help to achieve the better robustness. So it, um, it uh, uh, motivates us to design some like local strategies to improve the robustness of the 3D model. Also another interesting finding what we find is that uh, if we only doing the advanced joint training, it not always like improve the robustness. So, uh, so this is like different from the uh, phenomena in the 2D space, because in the 2D space, uh, uh, even though the uh, self-supervised learning can help model to learn strong priors and contact information, but it is still a separate learning task, right? So in the 2D space, the rotate and disassemble images still preserve the similar local features to the original images since the RGB value do not change, right? So that the accelerate optimizing in the advanced joint training strategies will not distract the advanced training, but help the model learn the robust global features. Uh, 
However, for the 3D space, for example, for this point cloud models, if we do this rotation or we do this like a jigsaw task, it uh, uh, already changes the uh, vertex uh, like uh, uh, of the uh, point cloud. So it already changes the input information of the input. So it will divide like the input into the two distribution. So one is the original point cloud, another is like uh, the like uh, uh, transformation, the like uh, point cloud, which transformed by some rotation objects. So, so this is like a two distribution. So if we do the joint training, it is well distract the adversary training result. So it will reduce the performance. Even though here we also use the dual batch normalization, which uh, like uh, uh, suggest, uh, which proposed by the Sahans ADV prop paper, but we found that because here the distribution is uh, like uh, a draft a lot, so it still cannot like improve the result. And also we uh, started, uh, we performed the transferability studies. So here we have the different like, uh, uh, like uh, self-supervised learning print task. So we generate a basic example for each of them and test on the other like self-supervised learning task. And we found that uh, the transferability is not really strong, which means that if we have a basic example, which generate uh, by attacking the uh, model trained by the uh, 3D rotation print task, and it cannot generalize to the other two tasks really well. So it proved it proved the ways to do some like ensemble strategies. So here we do some like ensemble strategies by combining the three tasks, and we found that it can further boosting the robustness of the machine learning models. So uh, I hope like this study is paved the ways of the uh, systematic study of the adversary robustness in the three D space. So uh, thanks for all of my like uh, amazing collaborators. And uh, here is also uh, another testament is like, uh, we have like host uh, a special topic on this uh, frontier journals. We have like uh, trust words machine learning like sections. So if you have any like related paper, welcome to submit to this like uh, uh, journal. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, anyone has any questions? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Charlie, for this talk. So for, for the audience, uh, if you have questions, you can just unmute yourself and bring the question here. Okay, so in the chat, uh, in the chat, I, I saw uh, Andong Wang bring two questions here. The first question is, are you using the V loading uh, 64 LIDAR? And the second question is, can the LIDAR perturbation be added on the 64 by 1008 data matrix? Do you have any thoughts on the question here? Also here, we use the 16 four lines like a LIDAR. So because uh, it can get like much rich information and it also like uh, widely used in the autonomous driving systems. So because it used in the Baidu Apollo system, which is our like uh, targeted systems. Uh, so what is the second question? I didn't uh, hear it clearly. Uh, okay, that is, uh, uh, we have 64 beams uh, of later, okay? And each beam may receive a point uh, uh, in three, three, uh, hundred and sixty degrees and uh, yeah um, okay it, it gets uh, oh, oh, one hundred one thousand and eight hundred points in a circle okay yeah um, so the, the, the data matrix is uh, formed by 64 beams and each beams has uh, this data uh, in in the ridges yes ridges okay so what is your question? Yeah. My question is, uh, if we add perturbations on the later points in three D dimensions, uh, then it, it seems not very easy to to index to index the points, uh, such that uh, nearing 
neighboring points are near. Okay. Okay. It's not easy to index the little points like uh, image pixels. And uh, if we reform the data in this, uh, we use the 64 times uh, 1,800 data, data matrix, then we can reference it uh, or index it uh, somewhat easily, I think. Okay. Oh yeah. So here is like uh, I think uh, what you are mentioning is about uh, how we implement this like uh, uh, render of the lidar, right? So we have yeah, like yeah. more render, and uh, so yeah. the implementation is like similar at what you are like just saying that uh, we simulate uh, how the lidar works, right? And uh, that we uh, we have some oh. like okay. Yeah. okay, okay, I understand. You simulate the the lidar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, like we just like uh, moving the like uh, vertex positions, but it also like uh, needed to like uh, obey the physical constraints of the lidar systems. So in this case, we can like uh, uh, attack the whole pipeline, the whole system. Otherwise, uh, it cannot attack it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I have another question. That is, how can you label an obstacle in three disappoints? In your experiments, I, I think it is not very difficult to design such uh, such an application an app. How how did we uh, label what? A label an obstacle. You see the chat window. Yeah, uh, label an obstacle in the data points. If we want to detect some obstacle, and then we want to label it. Okay and how to label the points before our training. Uh, you mean like how can we label the 3D point cloud like uh, before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, in, yeah be, in, for training. Uh, so here the setting is like, uh, so here we, we already have like object, right? And then, okay. We already okay. know, like, okay, there is like a uh, we oh, fit it's global position, okay. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's global position or the truth or the truth. Yeah, uh, I understand. Okay, yes. okay. And also, like, uh, here we attack the uh, by the Apollo system, so they already like release their model, they can get the bounding box. So, we already know the bounding box like uh, positions of this object. Uh, so okay, thank you, thank you. Um, hi, uh, thanks for your great talk and I have a question. And in your slides, you show that uh, the attacker can um, use some specific 3D object to avoid the detection of the LiDAR. So I'm curious that uh, um, what knowledge the attacker should know before the attack, such as the type of LiDAR or the model of the LiDAR use or something other. Like Oh, so here is like, so yes, uh, here we have like different settings. So we also have like black box settings, which we assume that the attacker know nothing information about the uh, machine learning system. And uh, we, we cannot get the gradient. But the only thing what we can get is the uh, out, uh, output of the machine learning system. And we can find that we can still like successfully attack the LiDAR perceptor system, even the multi-sensor fusion system. Yeah, in our recent paper, yeah. Thanks. Great. So, is there any other questions? Okay. So, I think we're running out of time for, for this lecture. So, thanks to Chawi again for, for a great talk. And then we will be moving to our lunch break and we will be returning at 2 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone, and see you soon.
Hi, Tom. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Perfect. So I will introduce you like at around 2 p.m. So and then you can take over it and do the do the lecture sounds, here. Sounds good to me. I don't know how they're uh, working it with the technical stuff this time around. So I'll just kind of hang okay. on here. Is it, should I keep my screen share up? Uh, maybe let me share first. Like I got a lot of slides for you. So great. All right. Cool. Oh, okay. Very professional, I like it. Yeah, I, 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 I put a lot of time on making those slides. Hey, cool. Even the lunch, the lunchtime uh, graphic is pretty good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's. Okay, I think it's it's two p.m. now. So let me introduce you. So that then you can take uh, share your slides. So, uh, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Goldstein uh, is our first speaker in our afternoon session. Tom is our Associate Professor of Machine Learning in the Department of Computer Science at University of Maryland. His research lies at the intersection of machine learning and optimization and focuses on safety and security for autonomous systems. He works at the boundary between theory and practice, leveraging mathematical foundations, complex models, and efficient hardware to build practical high-performance systems. Professor Goldstein completed his PhD degree in mathematics at UCRA and was a research scientist at Rice University and Stanford University. Uh, Tom, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen now. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, just quick audio and video check. You can see in here, yeah, I hope. Yeah, everything works great. Okay, great. And if you, there's any questions or anything you think I should address uh, while I'm speaking, feel free to feel free to interrupt me. Okay, all right. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, um, I am Tom Goldstein. I'm gonna talk to you a bit about poisoning attacks on computer vision models. Um, and there's a bunch of different things that I would, I would like to be able to talk about. First, I'm just gonna introduce what uh, poisoning attacks are. I'm gonna give you sort of an overview of, of uh, what's out there and then we'll sort of focus down on uh, some particular types of attacks that I think are interesting. Okay, so poisoning attacks are a little different than conventional adversarial attacks. Most adversarial attacks happen at test times. So you have a model that's already trained and then after the model is deployed, you wanna create some sort of attack that will subvert uh, the efficacy of the model. But poisoning attacks are training time attacks. So instead of manipulating testing data, you will manipulate training data, or in some situations you manipulate both. And one of the things you might wonder is, is it actually realistic to think that your training data could be manipulated? It seems like if you allow an adversary to control your training data, then they could make your model do all sorts of things. But it turns out that it, it, there's a lot of situations where you do give the outside world access to your training data. And in particular, I think this happens a lot when you scrape things from the web. So a lot of uh, computer vision systems are trained with images that are just scraped from the internet using bots, oftentimes with very little uh, human supervision. And in those situations, you don't necessarily know whose data, um, whose hands your data has been in. And there are other situations where you might even allow people to submit things to your system. For example, if you're harvesting system inputs, you have something like a spam detector where anyone can send emails to your organization and they get scraped and put into the training data set for updating your detector. You're basically giving anybody the ability to pick and choose what ends up in your training set. And then there's also situations where you might just have bad actors or inside agents that, that wanna manipulate your data in some sort of uh, a way that elicits bad behaviors. So the uh, the landscape of poisoning attacks is huge. And I just, I just in this time period, 
Uh, I just don't have time to talk about everything. So I thought I would just mention some of the, the really cool stuff out there that I'm, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but a lot of the original work on poisoning attack is actually on regression models. I'm going to focus on neural network models in my talk, but there's still a lot of ongoing work on regression models. Uh, so, you know, how do you uh, poison SVMs? How do you poison logistic regressions? How do you poison random forests, nearest neighbor classifiers? A lot of work done on classical models. Uh, there's also been a lot of work done on label flipping attacks. So if you have control of the labeling function, uh, then you could take, uh, for example, images and stick them into a data set with the wrong label. And that might seem like a very strong uh, threat model, but that's actually realistic in certain situations. For example, in federated learning, where you're relying on a distributed cloud of agents to, to send gradient updates to a central server, you don't actually have any control over the data that's being generated in the model updates being produced by those agents. And so in the federated learning setting, I think these kinds of attacks are really interesting. Uh, in the cryptography, uh, and theory community, there's been a lot of work on what's called p-tampering, which basically just means online data poisoning. So data poisoning for online systems. Uh, there's some great uh, theoretical results on this. Um, there's just a selection of papers, by the way. I'm not trying to give a, a comprehensive uh, list of all the work in these areas. Um, and then there's a lot of works that are that are really just focusing down on this uh, federated learning model, look, looking at things, for example, uh, poisoning model updates, uh, doing other kinds of poisoning attacks that only exist within a federated learning framework. I'm not going to get to talk about all of these things uh, just because of type, time limitations, but I wanted to make sure that I uh, at least pointed them out uh, because I think these are really important. Uh, uh, there's a lot of really important work being done in the poisoning uh, community in these areas, both in attacks and defenses. Um, if you are interested in reading about these things, I am going to shamelessly promote this recent review article. It was a big uh, team project with a number of uh, of people, some of which are organizers for this workshop, uh, but data set security for machine learning, data poisoning, backdoor attacks and defenses. And we just review uh, a whole bunch of uh, the poisoning literature, including more historical literature and classical methods and, and things that are going on now for a wide range of models, not just uh, neural networks, including the federated learning case. So in this talk, because I don't have infinite time, I'm gonna just pick a few things uh, that I find to be particularly interesting and then that we work on in my lab. And I'll try to tell you a bit about them um, and make sure I point out uh, related things that are going on in the community when I can. Okay, so there's two kinds of poisoning attacks. I think when people say poisoning, they oftentimes just refer to these training only attacks. So the idea is that at train time, you're going to take an image and you're going to add some sort of adversarial perturbation to it. So now you have this perturbed image, you stick it in the training set and the pertur perturbation is crafted in such a way that if you train on this data, then at test time, uh, a target image will come along and it will get an adversarial label. So by, by inserting this poison image into your data set, you basically embed some sort of behavior that is desired by the adversarial agent. And in most papers in the literature, that, that behavior is that when there's a, there's a particular test image that will come along uh, that, will, that will then be misclassified. There are also training and testing times attack, time attacks. These are often called backdoors or Trojan attacks. Um, and the difference is that these require you to, to modify both the training and the testing data. And so you might modify the training data by sticking a trigger in it. You might put a star on a bunch of images, for example, and then at test time, you embed that trigger in an image and that will elicit the desired behavior, right? And so this is a stronger threat model in the sense that it requires you to modify both training and test images, uh, but it's also a more powerful attack in some sense because uh, you, can, you can, in principle, uh, change the label of any image just by inserting a, a, um, a trigger. And one thing I'll point out later, there are also hidden trigger attacks where you're going to modify the training images in such a way that it's not so apparent what the trigger is. Okay, so um, when I talk about uh, a diff different kind of poisoning attacks, there's certain properties that, that they will have. And these are two properties that are, that are uh, often discussed, but there's this clean label property. Clean label, uh, an attack is clean label if the, the images appear to be labeled correctly by a human. So if you someone decided to audit the data and check that all the labels were correct, they wouldn't necessarily notice anything funny, right? The images look like natural images. They appear to be labeled correctly. Um, and a lot of the attacks that I talk about are also targeted, which means that they're only going to change the test time performance of the model on selected target images. And this makes it difficult to detect uh, that poisoning has occurred if, if those selected images are not in your test set. Uh, this is different, targeted attack is different than what is called an availability attack. An availability attack, the goal is to just degrade model performance on average as much as you possibly can. 
Availability attacks are frequently studied in the context of classical models like linear regressions and SVMs, whereas targeted attacks that, that sort of pick and choose different behaviors on different test images, these are, are, are usually done using neural networks. And you really need the, the fluidity of the decision boundary of a neural network in order to make a targeted attack work. Okay, so I'm going to start by reviewing a couple of these different attacks. And uh, in particular, uh, a lot of the early work in this area was done in the field of transfer learning. So we assume that the victim already has a pre-trained model and they're going to fine tune that model on a relatively small data set. In this fine tuning regime, one of the uh, a really useful heuristic that has been used to craft a bunch of different atta attacks is this uh, collision attack heuristic. And the idea behind the collision attack is that suppose that I have an airplane and I want to create poison frog images, and I'm going to attack this airplane with poison frogs. But one way we could do this is you could start with an unpoisoned feature extractor, and that feature extractor tends to group all the frogs together in Frogville and all the airplanes together in airplane land, right? Decision, uh, a feature space tends to be very well structured. So this is a diagram of feature space. And then I'm going to solve an optimization problem that says, take this base image B, this is a frog. That's the base image you're going to start with and reconstruct a poison image X. This is the image we're trying to solve for in, in such a way that X lies close to B in pixel space. So to a human, the poison image looks like the original frog. And at the same time in feature space, there's a collision between the poison image. So the features extracted from the poison image X and the features extracted from this target image, which is an airplane. So you solve this optimization problem and you find an image that looks like a frog to you and me, but in feature space, it lies in exactly the same location as this airplane. And so you fine tune on this data and neural networks tend to overfit on small data sets. And so when you fine tune, you move the decision boundary to accommodate the fact that there's a, an image at this location in feature space that is labeled as a frog, right? That came from this base image that's been perturbed. And so now at test time, and this airplane comes along, it lies in exactly the same location. And so it's also classified as a frog, right? And that's called a feature collision. There's a bunch of different variations on feature collisions. For example, you could actually drop a, a trigger in here and you could train this image to collide with a uh, feature collide with any other image that contains this, uh, that contains this trigger, right? Uh, and if you did that, you could create something like a hidden trigger backdoor attack so this is uh, using the feature collision heuristic, but to create a poison attack that has a trigger instead of creating an untriggered attack. And there's also a bunch of other variations on this. For example, there are these polytope based methods. This is something we've worked on in our group, but actually I think the most powerful polytope methods right now are from, from other teams. Uh, the idea behind a polytope method is that instead of trying to collide exactly with the target image, what you'll do is you'll put down a, a, a basically a polytope of poison images. So you create uh, sort of a cage of poison images that surround the target image. And the idea is that the target image lies inside the polytope mapped out by these poisons. When the decision boundary uh, moves during fine tuning, it generally tends to envelop this entire uh, polytope. So the whole convex hole of this set of poisons tends to get wrapped into, the, into a different class. And then that allows you to po poison very large regions of space. So this is very useful, for example, if you don't know exactly what feature extractor the victim is using. If you want these kinds of attacks to work in more of a black box setting, they're much more effective if you poison these large regions of space. And in particular, I think uh, this bullseye polytope method is, is probably one of the most effective poisoning methods right now for fine tuning, where they, they create one of these polytopes in such a way that the target image lies right in the middle of the polytope. So these kinds of methods tend to be quite um, effective. Uh, so here's just some examples. This is poisoning a fine-tuned ImageNet model. So I'm going to take this original image of a dog, and I'm going to poison it. And if I create this poisoned dog, it might look a lot like a regular dog to you and me. But if I stick that one image in the training data set, then the image above it becomes a labeled as a dog at test time. If I stick this poison image in, then that then this fish above it is now labeled as a dog at test time. I can create poisons for all of these. Uh, fish, and they're usually very difficult to see, especially when you're poisoning high resolution data sets like ImageNet. And just to show I didn't cherry pick too badly, I can flip this problem around and I can poison these fish images uh, to change the label of all of these dogs and make the classifier think that all of these dogs are fish. So this is a really simple and very reliable kind of attack, uh, but it really is focused in the transfer learning scenario. Getting this to work for end-to-end -end training where you don't have any knowledge of what feature extract is going to be created is more difficult. And so a lot of work that's been done recently is on looking for ways to push poisoning methods further. 
So you might look at, particularly we're interested in being able to poison end-to-end -end training and being able to defend end-to-end -end training systems. Uh, but there's other things you might be interested in, like maybe you want to be able to poison using any base images, right? With uh, feature collision attacks, you're taking frog images and using them to make other test images into frogs, for example. Uh, maybe you want to be able to poison uh, using any base image. Maybe you want to have other attacker objectives other than just misclassification. Um, for example, maybe you want to attack something like fairness. Um, uh, and we also want to know whether these can scale up to industrial systems. Can we get them outside of the lab and get them to work on these large scale complex systems? So here's one of our first attempts uh, to sort of scale things up to more uh, <coughs> complex systems. This is called Metapoison. The way Metapoison works is we're actually going to uh, simulate the training pipeline of the victim. <coughs> so the attacker will simulate the training pipeline of the victim and try to directly craft perturbations to training images that will have specific impacts on that pipeline. So here's what happens. The, the adversary runs a, a standard SVD training process. They have a, a big batch of data and they have a small catalog of poisons that are going to float around in the data set. So you sample a random batch of images. Maybe it contains a poison or two, maybe it doesn't. You're just doing random sampling just like the victim will do. Then the adversary runs uh, SGD. So you simulate SGD, you start with model parameters, uh, theta. You run SGD using this sampled batch and that produces updated parameters theta prime. Then the victim measures how well those updated parameters accomplish the adversarial objective. So this loss is the adversary's loss. It measures whether certain test time images are classified with an adversarial label. So are they classified incorrectly? And then the adversary backprops this entire process. So you backprop through from this uh, adversarial loss through the entire training algorithm back to this image and you're going to make a gradient update to this poison image uh, so that after you use it for training in SGD, you get an adversarial objective that is low as possible. Uh, because we're backpropping through the training loop, this looks a lot like meta learning, and that's why we call this uh, framework meta poison. So meta poison is really nice because uh, as an attacker, because it can create uh, uh, attack images that are very difficult to see. So here's two columns of uh, CFAR images and then two columns of the corresponding poisons. And you'll see that it's very difficult from looking at this clean image and this poison image, it's very difficult to tell the poisoning has happened. But by inserting po these, uh, these very difficult to discern poisons into a data set, we can actually change the label. For example, this bird can be changed into a dog. Another thing about meta poison uh, is that it tends to be very transferable. So for example, if the uh, attacker is crafting uh, attacks using a ResNet 20, then those attacks work about 72% of the time on a ResNet 20. This is assuming that the attacker can poison one tenth of 1% of the data. Um, but it actually works even more uh, frequently on VGG and it works almost as frequently about 63% of the time on a simple four layer com net. So the transferability of these methods uh, in, in the black box setting actually tends to be much stronger than we've observed for other kinds of attacks. But the interesting question then is, is how realistic are these sorts of attacks on industrial systems? Could they actually work on realistic systems? And so to test this out, we actually deploy this attack on uh, Google Compute Engine. So Google has an AutoML API where you upload your model and it will create a, a you upload your data set, it'll create a model for you in an automated way. And I don't know, this is a complete black box. I don't know what optimizer they use. I imagine it's probably a proprietary optimizer. I don't know how they're doing it. They're doing some sort of architecture search, but I don't know how they're doing that architecture search under the hood. I don't know what learning rate schedule they use. I don't know whether they're using momentum and weight decay. I don't know any of these things. Um, but if we upload our poison CFAR data set, we can change this 82% bird into a 69% dog um, by poisoning about one fifth of 1% of, uh, of the data points in CFAR. So then the question is, you know, that we got that to work against an industrial system, but that, how well will this scale? CFAR is a pretty low resolution data set. For imaging, it's not necessarily very realistic. The question is, can we scale this up to ImageNet? And so we looked at other kinds of methods that are a bit more scalable. So here's one called, um, it requires a lot less computation than Metapoison. Um, and this we call gradient alignment. So here's the idea behind gradient alignment. What the adversary would like uh, the victim to do is train on the adversary's loss. The adversary has a loss with, with target images in it and target labels that the adversary wants to be placed on them. And for the adversary, what they'd love to be able to do is get the victim to train on this adversarial loss, right? So what they'd like them to do is start with theta, network parameters, and then march down the gradient of the adversarial loss because that will, that will lower the adversarial loss function and accomplish the adversarial objective. 
The adversary can't really make that happen though, because the victim is not training on the adversarial loss. The victim trains on this loss that is crafted using a data set that contains a range of uh, poisoned and mostly unpoisoned images. So the idea behind gradient alignment is that the adversary is going to look at the training gradient. Let's, let's look at this natural uh, gradient using, uh, using natural images, so not poison. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a small perturbation to a subset of these images. Uh, and we want to make that perturbation delta in such a way that we align the, this, uh, this, this natural training objective with the gradient of the natural training objective with the gradient of the adversary of the adversarial objective. So we have this, uh, we want to maximize the correlation between the adversarial gradient for a, a value of theta and the natural gradient for a particular value of theta. And we do that by making, by optimizing uh, delta, this perturbation to the images. So you wanna find a small perturbation of training data that, that has the, the effect that uh, now this natural gradient that the, that the victim is going to use is highly correlated with the adversarial gradient. If you, can, if you can accomplish this, if you can make this correlation large, then doing gradient descent on the natural data set is gonna have the same effects as if you were optimizing the adversarial objective rather than, uh, rather than this natural objective. Um, and it turns out that from a computational standpoint, it's much uh, cheaper to optimize this correlation than it is to do the original meta-learning, uh, the original meta-poison attack. And as a result, we're able to scale this up to ImageNet. So here's an example. This is also poisoning Google AutoML. Um, this does not work 100% of the time. So what we did is we uploaded five, this data set to Google AutoML five times. And one of those uh, times our poisoning attack was successful using one tenth of 1% of the data we could train. We randomly chose images, but this, this otter ended up being changed into a dog uh, in our, in our, uh, with our attack. Um, now, I think we could probably optimize this further to get higher levels of uh, success, but these experiments are uh, quite costly. It costs about $1,000 to train ImageNet from scratch on AutoML, and so we're not really willing to run hundreds of experiments to try to, to, try to fine tune this behavior. But I think it's at least an interesting demonstration that these sorts of attacks can work against commercial APIs. Um, another thing that I'll mention is that this isn't just for un, untriggered attacks. You can do this for triggered attacks as well. Uh, so here's an example of using gradient alignment to craft a triggered attack. So here's a clean image and its corresponding po poisoned image net image. Um, and then here is a, uh, a target image you wanna change the label of and we can change its label by inserting this trigger patch into it. And we can accomplish the same sort of attack uh, using gradient alignment uh, in both the triggered and untriggered uh, setting. Okay, so I'm just gonna say a few things real quickly um, about defenses. Now defenses, just like attacks, is also quite a wide area and there's a lot of different uh, defenses. And this is an area that also is rapidly evolving. I think things are changing quite quickly um, in this area. And I think that they should be rapidly evolving. I don't think that uh, the defenses we have really stand up really very, very well at all to state-of-the-art attacks. Um, but there's a range of different attacks that are out there. For example, uh, there's a Steinhardt 2017 paper that tries to detect image outliers. And this is particularly effective for uh, low dimensional, lower dimensional data sets, but it could be used on images as well. Um, in images, I think it's generally considered more effective to try to identify image outliers in latent space. So the idea behind these attacks is that poisoned images are probably going to lie in strange locations in feature space. If you use a feature collision attack, that's probably true. You take a frog image and you're going to poison it to lie in airplane space. And so you might have frog images that are in, in latent space that might be outliers with respect to the rest of their class. And so you can try to prune those outliers. Um, and I think that these kinds of attacks are, or these kinds of defenses are, are effective against simple feature collision based attacks. But actually uh, in our research, we've shown that this doesn't really work well against uh, more direct, uh, uh, like uh, meta learning or gradient alignment types of attacks where uh, you can actually craft poison images that are not outliers from their, from their class in feature space. Um, there's also a range of really interesting methods for identifying when models have been poisoned. And I, you know, when I first uh, read about this line of research, I was a little skeptical of it, but actually it seems like these methods work quite well. And some of them are quite effective at identifying poisons, uh, even when there's a range of different poisoning methods that have been used. 
Um, and then there's also these certified methods, which I think are quite interesting. There are methods using Gaussian smoothing, and there are methods that use differential privacy um, in order to, to get uh, robustness against poisoning. I think all of these are really interesting. Um, one particular direction that I've been uh, interested in recently is taking the adversarial training framework, which is a state of the art for defending against adversarial attacks. Um, in fact, it's considered to be one of the only really strong uh, frameworks for defending against adversarial attacks. The question is, can you take this adversarial training framework that is used to defend against evasion attacks and repurpose it to defend against poisoning? Um, and so we've been looking at what we call adversarial poisoning instead of adversarial training. And here's the idea. In adversarial training, you inject adversarial attacks into the training set with the idea that by doing so, you create a classifier that is immune to adversarial attacks. In adversarial poisoning, we're gonna do something very closely related. Instead of injecting adversarial attack images, we're gonna inject poisoned images into the training set, and we're going to train the network to be immune to those poisoned images. So it's sort of like directly porting this adversarial training idea, but using it to fend against poisoning rather than using it to fend against uh, evasion attacks. Um, so here's how this kind of defense would work. So um, the, the, uh, the defender, the potential victim, is going to basically simulate a poisoning process at train time and then try to deflect it. So every training batch is going to contain two kinds of images. We'll sample some regular training images like this frog, and we'll sample some target images like this airplane. And then here's what happens. So on stage one of training, the, uh, the defender is going to do a forward pass using this frog image. So you pass this, uh, you pass this image, I'll go back a little bit, you pass this image into SGD, you update your model parameters, right? And then the victim will, um, and then the, uh, the defender will measure the accuracy of the classifier, but the accuracy is going to be measured on this other image, this, uh, this target image that was sampled. So half of the batch of these poison images, half are the target images. The victim does a forward pass on these poison images and then evaluates the accuracy on the target images. Then the defender backprops through that training process and creates a poisoned image that tries to change the label of this airplane. So now we have a poison frog that tries to change the label of this airplane. So that was stage one. In stage one, we sample uh, two batches of images, the poisons and the targets, and then we update the poison images so that they are, are poisons for changing the label of the targets. Then on stage two, which is a training stage, you put both of these images together into a big batch and you do a forward and a backward pass and you train on them. So the idea is that the network now gets to see the poisons and the targets at the same time, but these targets, it knows what the correct labels will be and that we get to update the model parameters so that even in the face of these poisons, even when poisons are in the batch, it still assigns the correct labels to these target images. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different uh, defenses that we have uh, studied and implemented and they're all, they all have their pros and cons. Um, you know, it, and it's nice to, you know, everyone likes to publish papers and say that they're the state of the art and they're the best in some way, but the truth is there's sort of a Pareto frontier of, of, of different attacks. So this is looking at uh, average poison success on one axis and validation error on the other axis. You can always make, uh, you can always deflect all poisoning attacks just by not training your model, right? You could, uh, you could just start with random parameters and then, and never train them and poisoning becomes impossible, right? But then your validation error is going to be very low, right? Um, and at the same time, you could do nothing to defend against poisons. You might get very high validation area, error, error on natural images, but the poison success rate might be quite high. And so there's really a Pareto frontier. There's sort of a trade-off um, that you can make between these two. And what we find is that these adversarial poisoning methods are quite uh, effective. They definitely seem to be on this Pareto frontier and they manage to be, at least among the things we've tested, they, they manage to get the lowest average poison success but like I said, there are other things you might care about like validation accuracy. And there are even other defenses like we find this training with cut mix uh, plus Gaussian noise, for example, um, is also basically on this Pareto frontier, right? Um, it doesn't uh, suppress average poisoning success as much as something like adversarial poisoning, but it does manage to preserve a lot of, um, a lot of validation accuracy. And then one thing I'll also point out here is there's this, uh, this green line here. These are differential privacy based defenses and they have their own, you know, sort of Pareto frontier. Uh, we've done some work recently on uh, new kinds of mix up based defenses. Like we have a, a defense called um, called DP insta hide 
that can that can sort of break through this Pareto frontier a bit and allow differential privacy defenses to perform better, but they still don't perform quite as well as these more heuristic defenses. I think that this uh, differential privacy based defense area is really interesting because differential privacy defenses come with uh, certifiable guarantees. And so if we can continue to improve the performance of these differential privacy methods, I think that will be uh, uh, really good progress for the field. Okay, so one last thing I just wanted to mention is if you're interested in studying poisoning attacks, um, my student, Avi Schwartzchild, created this benchmark, uh, just how toxic is data poisoning. And the idea is that he wants to benchmark the effectiveness of different poison attacks in different settings, like a white box setting, a black box setting, and an end-to-end -end training scenario. And one of the reasons why we created this benchmark is just because we found that different attacks uh, we're really evaluating uh, in, the, in the literature, evaluating in completely different scenarios. So you can use different epsilons for how much an image can be perturbed. Uh, you can use different percentages of the data set, uh, to be poisoned. You could poison 0.1%, you could poison 1%, you could poison 10%. Um, and so there wasn't really any consistency among the kind of threat models that people were using in the literature. And so to actually compare the effectiveness of these uh, different kinds of attacks, what we did is we created this benchmark where there's a, there's a standard toolkit for training, it sort of standardizes all of these test scenarios and allows you to uh, quantify the effectiveness of different attacks uh, in a fairly precise way so that we can actually compare these different attacks a bit better. All right, and finally, I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, and I spoke about a bunch of different uh, works from my group and others, but in particular, I just wanna say thank you to uh, my co-authors that worked with us on uh, this uh, review article uh, on poisoning. This is a project that was led by Michael Goldblum, who's been a, go uh, a postdoc in my lab, and he's moving to NYU at the end of the summer. But we're sad to see him go. Um, and then Demetrius Tsipras, uh, Chu Lin Chi, uh, Jin Yun Chen, and Avi Schwarzschild. Uh, these folks really uh, led this project, and I think they did a terrific job. And I also want to think, uh, thank my uh, faculty co authors, Don Sung, Alex Madri, Bo Lee. Um, they were also uh, fairly involved in this workshop. So thank you to everybody, and thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, hello. Yes. Uh, thanks for your great talk. And I have a question about the adversarial poisoning method. You mentioned that we can add some poison to the training data, and then we can uh, use this as a data augmentation method to make the model uh, immune to the poisoning attack. Uh, I have a question. There are many types of triggers. Uh, pixel trigger, pattern trigger, clean, uh, clean label, backdoor attack. So how can we make the poisons in the training data so that we can defend uh, all types of backdoor attack. Yeah, so one of the difficulties here is just like in the adversarial training scenario, there's this problem where you can adverse, you know, if it's on evasion attacks as well, you can adversarially train against one modality, you know, one kind of attack, and that doesn't necessarily guarantee success against a different kind of attack. So, you know, adversary training against L2 bounded attacks doesn't make your network immune to some sort of semantic attack, for example. And there is, but but in, just like, in, what we found is just like in the um, adversarial training literature, there is crossover, right? So if you robustify against one threat model, you gain robustness against another, but the, just you don't gain as much robustness as if you had trained against that threat model specifically. And we do look at these um, crossover attacks and we do look at adaptive attacks also that specifically try to attack um, this adversarial poisoning method um, in, uh, in our paper, what doesn't kill you makes you robuster. And we do find that the effectiveness is lower when you when you test on an, uh, an attack that is different than what you trained on, but still some of the robustness remains. So I think in that sense, it's, it's comparable to what you might observe for you know attack crossover and adversarial training. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Okay, any other questions? I can't see the, uh, it's, I think there might be some things in the chat, but, but I can't actually see them with my screen shared. So feel free to chime up if, uh, if there's anything else anyone would like to ask. Yeah, if you have, uh, uh, thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have a question related to the uh, adversarial trigger. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, is that trigger uh, universal across all the images? And I, I'm still a little confused uh, on how is that different from adversarial patch or uh, mask PGD? Uh, how is it different than an adversarial patch? Oh, um, so these are, okay. Um, 
there, this is all, these are all closely, uh, you know, almost everything that happens in the adversarial training literature is, has sort of an, an analog in the poisoning literature. Um, so it is the back, the, the trigger, the trigger is very close related to an adversarial patch, right? So in the adversarial training uh, setting, you can have, there are patch attacks where you try to do, when you say adversarial patch, I usually associate that language with, uh, with a test time attack, so an evasion attack. Um, and this is essentially doing the same thing, but in the poisoning scenario. So it's, it's basically an adversarial patch that, that uh, causes a particular bad behavior. Okay, so how, how is it different? The difference is that it's a stronger, um, an adversarial patch threat model, you do not have the ability to manipulate the training data. Whereas uh, in the poisoning scenario, you do. So with the simplest kind of triggering attack, for example, you might take a bunch of um, Boba Fett images and put a little star on them and put those into the training data set. And then the neural network will learn that that star is something that appears in a Boba Fett image. And then you can put that star in any image at test time and it will become Boba Fett, right? So um, it is, there are ways to do backdoors and Trojans that are more agnostic to the architecture. So for example, that simple process so I just described only depends on manipulating the data set. It doesn't depend on the neural, it doesn't even use information about the neural architecture, the optimizer, or anything else, right? And so it's a much more powerful attack if, uh, if, if, the, if you allow the, the adversary to have access to the training data as well as the test data, you can create much more powerful patch attacks than if you only have access to the, to the test data. But I, I would say, you know, once the DIM model's already been trained from the attacker's perspective, it's sort of the same as a patch attack, right? You have a patch that you're going to insert um, to change the model behavior. It's just that if you if you can poison, um, you can be a little bit more certain about the behaviors you're going to get at test time. Okay, I see. Uh, so is that trigger universal across images? It is. And it is also uh, yeah, there's, so there's a lot of different kinds of trigger attacks, but most, most papers that, that study this it is universal. It is universal. And also universal across training and test? Across training and test. So du during the, is that a pattern, a trigger pattern universal uh, in the training data and, and uh, also the same in tested? Oh, you're saying is it, um, I would say, so there are methods that will will try to like re regenerate patches at test time that are customized for a particular image, but by and large, they they craft a universal uh, patch. Then you 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 poison all the images with with a trigger, which might look like a patch, and then you test with the exact same patch. So I guess I think that's what you're asking, right? It's it is universal in the sense you use the same patch um, for training and testing. And there are methods where the the where the where the attacker chooses what that trigger is. So it could actually be something like a star. It could be a weird pair of sunglasses or a piece of jewelry that you wear. And then there are also methods where you craft, uh, you use optimization to basically craft an optimal trigger. So you'll learn a patch that is uh, an optimal attack, right? And now you could do that without manipulating the data at train time. You can learn an optimal patch just to attack a model at test time. But these sorts of methods will will also exploit the train time behavior. Um, and they'll learn an optimal patch for poisoning that is also effective at test time. So it's just a way of, of boosting the effectiveness of that patch attack. And it, so, but yeah, to answer your question, it is universal across both, usually. Okay, yeah, thanks for the explanation. Great, uh, we got a one last question from the chat. Uh, the question is, could you provide a little bit more about how the loss function and the gradient can help the model to identify the poisoning. How the loss function, do you mean for, for, is this a question about defending against poisoning? I, which I, I, I believe it is. Well, uh -huh. Uh -huh. it sounds like they're asked, so how can the loss function and the gradient be used to defend um, against poisoning? Maybe I'll say, um, so there's, there's, hmm, I don't, I, I don't know that there's any works that explicit that, that, uh, that are as quite as straightforward as, and I could be wrong about this. I don't think anything is quite as straightforward as looking at the loss function uh, and the gradient uh, alone. There are works though that detect, um, so let me go to some of these detection based uh, defenses. There's a bunch of work now on methods for detecting when your model is poisoned. And there are works for actually trying to fix those 
those models. Uh, so things like deep inspect, uh, like neural cleanse, uh, this Tabor, MNTD, these sorts of, of defenses. And uh, one thing that they'll do, so here's like one, one particular approach is you can actually create, um, you can learn images whose test time labels tell you about whether the model has been poisoned. So for example, you can learn an image, uh, it'll be like a weird looking pattern, but you can learn an image that has the property that it gets one label when you, when you show that image to a poison model and it gets a different label when you show it to an unpoisoned model. Um, and these are the kinds of defenses that I said, you know, to me, it's, it's quite amazing that you can create an image like that. It's not, in, it's a little bit unintuitive to me that that would work, but actually empirically, um, these methods seem to work quite well. Um, and I think maybe there still needs to be some more work done on studying how these methods work across real, you know, really diverse types of poisoning attacks. How, how effective are they at, at, at uh, detecting, you know, really different kinds of poisoning attacks, maybe things that the, um, defender isn't aware of when they when they create that image but so far it seems like they actually a lot of these defenses actually work quite well uh even even across different types of poisons but that's the most effective um that's one of the most effective ways i can that, that has been presented for uh for detecting poisons using sort of an optimization framework okay great uh thanks for for your talk and uh it's a very nice overview of the poison attack. And you, you may stop, share, stop sharing your screen so we can move to the next one. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, so our next speaker is Judy Hoffman from Georgia Tech. Uh, Judy Hoffman, uh, her research uh, lines at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning with a specialization in domain adaptation, transfer learning, and adversarial robustness and algorithm fairness. She received her PhD in EECS at, from UC Berkeley in 2016, after which she completed a postdoc at Stanford University and UC Berkeley. Uh, Judy, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Great, thank you. All right, um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And um, I'm excited to be here and talk to you a little bit about um, some recent work that has to do with detecting reliable instances for learning. Um, and to get started, I just wanna <clears throat> briefly talk about the standard supervised learning setup. Let's get ourselves acclimated. Uh, with this setting and try to understand why it is that we might need to be able to determine something about particular instances um, and their reliability when we're going about the learning. So the standard protocol involves, of course, collecting some large data set. And then when you're training in a supervised fashion, you're going to have labels for this data that were collected by human annotators. And at training time, you're going to randomly sample throughout every mini batch, some collection of images together with their labels and use that to train with a supervised loss. So what are some of the potential downsides of just using this random sampling type approach where you, you treat every instance um, essentially equally um, and you're going to have the same likelihood of viewing it, the same amount of time is gonna have the same impact on the learning process. Well, the first potential downfall is that sometimes throughout the labeling process, you may have incorrectly labeled instances. Now, this could be because of benign causes, um, an annotator made a mistake maybe, um, or it could be because of malicious uh, cause, like in Tom's talk right before this, maybe an annotator explicitly tried to um, provide an incorrect label, or maybe they provide a manipulation here that um, to, to the image itself that would impact the training process. Um, it could also happen when you're using semi-supervised learning protocols where the label is not necessarily curated by a human annotator and instead it's been inferred through using an auxiliary um, model. Another way in which uh, your data can cause you some problems is if the image itself has been manipulated. So maybe the label is correct, but your model has a difficult time being able to predict 
um, the, the label that you'd like it to predict at the end of the day. And then finally, there's just always going to be circumstances where an example is difficult to learn um, or inherently ambiguous, um, like this example of a dog that also has many features that, that are reminiscent of a cat. And of course, there's lots of different literature studying these types of problems and ways in which we can um, explicitly try to account for these potential data pitfalls um, throughout our learning process. And we heard about a lot of them today, especially in the adversarial robustness space. And I'll talk about that a little bit in today's talk. Um, but there's also, of course, curriculum learning for trying to understand some of the easier samples first before we move on to the more ambiguous samples. And then, of course, there's learning if you know that there may be some label noise. So at the end of the day, because you're going to have data um, of variable degrees of trustworthiness, we'd like to be able to make sure that when we're learning with our data, we have some sense of reliability, both in terms of the model outputs, but also in terms of the data that we use as input to the model training. And of course, um, I think a speaker earlier today already mentioned that this slide is, is probably going to be shown over and over and over again. Um, you have these instances where we have images that have maybe been manipulated, um, potentially in imperceptible ways, and they cause dramatically different predictive outputs. And, and this is really why people are so focused on this is because um, it, it's concerning that um, they are imperceptible to people, but they can result in, in such different outputs um, from our learned models. So this kind of implies to us that there is some fundamental limitations of our models and um, certainly some vulnerabilities. So if we are trying to be able to understand which images we might uh, want to rely on more for training, perhaps some of these um, vulnerabilities that are uh, illuminated through the adversarial examples can actually provide us some pieces of information. And to start to understand that, let's first start to think about what an adversarial example does. So let's imagine we're taking this MNIST example of a zero. Um, and just for visualization purposes and, and to gain some intuition, um, let's just take this tiny image, vectorize it, and map it into a 2D projection space so that we can use um, uh, visualization. And for this particular example, we're using just a random 2D orthonormal basis, um, but you could imagine using other projections, especially projections where a particular direction is found through an adversarial approach. Once we've projected into this 2D space, we can now imagine applying uh, different, in this case, random perturbations using a, a grid-like search over this 2D space. And each of these um, grid-like points is gonna correspond to another image. Um, here's one example output image here of a different zero. And we can imagine taking all of these perturbed images and passing them through the same trained model. The reason we want to do this is we want to gain some understanding of what would the model's behavior be as we manipulate an image um, in a particular way. Now, in this case, it's, again, a random manipulation, but you could do this for any image um, across uh, directions that, that were learned using some sort of um, gradient or, or signed gradient method. Well, once we do that for this image, we're going to get a decision um, landscape output that looks like this. Now, the training data point is shown in the center, and you can see that, I mean, this is an MNIST classifier. These work really well out of the box, so it's, it's correctly classifying this zero as a zero. But what's interesting to note is that if you move in a particular direction here um, with a partic particular step size, you can start to change the output of the model. And overall, this is not necessarily going to be the same amount or same magnitude of movement that you need to walk in all directions. So there are some directions that are more vulnerable than others. Um, but the takeaway is that it's a fairly small perturbation that's needed in order to start changing the outputs of the model itself. And uh, we know in this workshop, we're talking a lot about adversarial examples, and this is exactly the sort of phenomenon that's exploited in order to create those examples is by finding the direction that you need to walk the least amount in order to 
um, be able to start changing the output of the model. Now, in order to defend against this, and, and I know Tom talked about this in just the last talk, I'm sure people talked about it in the morning session as well, a really common technique is to just say, well, um, let's make sure at the end of the day, my model is reporting the correct label that I would like it to label on this output image. So adversarial training is just really augmenting your data set with these adversarial examples. So, so adding a new point um, from that decision boundary, which previously was misclassified and making sure that the model kind of increases um, its margin around that particular sample. And this, this should increase the reliability of that sample and make it more robust against that particular style of adversarial attack. Now, this is something that you can do when you have access to labels. Um, but another question you could ask is, aside from training with all of these adversarial uh, images, using the, this, this kind of augmented training procedure, we can also just think about asking the question of how vulnerable is a particular image um, by thinking about whether or not manipulations to that image with a particular, um, with a particular step size, particular epsilon ball, is going to result in a correct output prediction or a manipulation to that correct output prediction. So in standard robustness metrics, what we're going to do is we would normally look at the data set in aggregate and we would think about how um, robust is my model against a whole collection of images. But an equally valid question to ask is how, how vulnerable is a particular image to being manipulated in this way? And once you start thinking about that, you realize that you can leverage the fact that there's a spectrum of instances, some that are less vulnerable and some that are more vulnerable, and um, you can explicitly use that information either to improve your learning procedure or to gain some insights into um, how your model performs overall. And so in this work that was led by Yogesh Balaji, and um, it was also joint work with Tom from the last session, um, we thought about this problem of having um, an instance adaptive adversarial training. So in the case of this work, what we were trying to do was just understand um, how vulnerable each particular instance is and see whether or not we could change the amount of uh, perturbations that were applied to each instance during learning um, so that we could avoid having drops in clean accuracy in order to have the, the desirable robustness benefits that you get from adversarial training. But for the purpose of this talk, um, the key piece that I want to point out is just that uh, when you are thinking about the reliability of particular instances, um, one way in which you could measure this is you could think about how much that image needs to be perturbed before you start misclassifying it. So here's an example where we have both an instance on the left here, um, which doesn't need to be perturbed very much before it starts to be misclassified. Uh, and an image on the right that needs to be per, um, perturbed really more significantly than even is, is usually done um, inside adversarial training with an epsilon of 28 before it starts to be misclassified. So this gives us some sort of a curriculum or a sense of how canonical, how easy to manipulate a particular image is. And so this might um, be able to be leveraged um, either directly as it was in this work uh, to incorporate different amounts of robustness for different instances, or to create an implicit curriculum that tells us which instances are perhaps more canonical um, and, and more closer to the mode of the distribution for a particular category of interest. So in this work, we, we changed the standard adversarial training procedure, and instead of applying a fixed epsilon parameter to every instance, we had an instance adaptive epsilon parameter um, that was derived in a very simple search procedure. Um, and um, by doing that, we were able to find a set of samples that could be manipulated. This was in the CIFAR data set uh, with really small epsilons. So these are going to be samples in this case that were kind of ambiguous to begin with. And perhaps we don't want to devote a lot of our effort during robustness training to making sure that you're robust against those types of samples. And maybe it's more important that we focus a lot of effort on making sure that you do not, uh, that you're not um, uh, lacking robustness on these canonical samples on the right here. And 
by doing this, we're able to produce uh, an algorithm that can produce a single model um, that was outperforming adversarial training with a fixed epsilon ball, um, both in terms of the combination of natural accuracy and adversarial accuracy. So for this work, we were really just thinking about how can you use different perturbation, different strengths of perturbation and different measures of robustness for across your instances as a way to have a more flexible training procedure that doesn't over prioritize robustness over just model performance in general. But this was all in the supervised learning context. And this was again, focused pretty heavily on, on pure robustness. But you can actually have degraded model performance um, pretty substantially due to variance in your data when you're talking about semi-supervised learning. So even before you have an adversary in the mix, just through the learning procedure, when we think about how semi-supervised learning works, we of course have some amount of labeled data that you can train with a supervised loss and get strong generalization performance as a result. But aside from that, you have potentially a larger amount of unlabeled data, and you need to be able to learn with an unsupervised loss. And quite frequently, the way that these models are learned is that they're going to leverage the current model's best output guesses on these unlabeled data um, by generating what we'll call pseudo labels, and then training a model using either an explicit pseudo label loss or potentially something like an entropy minimization loss. But what this means is that any vulnerabilities that the model has, and it may potentially have many more vulnerabilities than the standard um, models that we will look at in adversarial robustness, are going to be exploitable by this unlabeled data. And sometimes if we're thinking about the adversarial training, um, the standard idea is that we're going to explicitly use the label that was available from your clean image for training with your adversarial image. But if you don't know what label, um, because this is unlabeled data in general, then a common procedure that people would use is, is called virtual adversarial training, where what you first do is you predict um, on your clean instance and take the output prediction as the ground truth target uh, and use that for your adversarial training. That seems like an intuitive algorithm because you're basically just saying that what I want to do is make sure that the model continues reporting whatever it was already reporting on my clean data. Um, I don't want it to change that uh, on my adversarially perturbed data. And so it's kind of still adding some robustness around the current prediction. But the problem, of course, is what happens when the clean prediction is wrong itself? Well, now you're going to be incorporating some sort of robustness and padding around an incorrect pseudo label. So we need some way to understand whether or not we can rely on the current labeling, the clean labeling of the model itself. And this problem is exacerbated when we start to think about a semi-supervised learning problem uh, where the labeled data and unlabeled data may not be drawn from the same distribution. So this is what we see in unsupervised domain adaptation. Uh, where the standard setup assumes that you have a labeled source data set, and this data uh, is going to be drawn from some imaging distribution. In this case, it's going to be the, the sketch domain. And then you have a large unlabeled data set that you would like to deploy your model on. And um, the key idea is that you'd like to be able to leverage information from the source data set for use in the target domain, even though you don't have access to labels in the target. And people have looked at using virtual adversarial training as a way to encode some amount of uh, adaptive performance benefits. Uh, this one method called DIRT-T or um, VADA was really the key underlying piece of the model that used the virtual adversarial training, looked at both an alignment mechanism using a standard domain divergence or, or um, aligning distribution outputs but it also used a virtual adversarial training. And the way that it used it was it, it assumed that you had a source model. So again, a source model in this case could have been trained on this um, domain up here, maybe a sketch domain or more generally just some domain where you had access to lots of labels. And then what would happen is they would 
look at the output prediction from that source supervised trained model um, as it's applied to these unlabeled images here. And they would assume that's my clean prediction, whatever the source predicted on this unlabeled target instance. And I want to now train with an adversarial um, perturbation, um, an adversarial loss, to be able to make sure that I am updating my model to predict the same output that I had from the clean and from the adversarially perturbed. And it worked decently well. But of course, it's going to be highly susceptible to the same problem of what happens if that original clean label was incorrect. And to give you an example of how, how this might happen more broadly, just simple example for semi-supervised learning, why would my original labeling sample be incorrect? If I have two classes here, circles and triangles, um, if everything is labeled, I can learn a decision boundary that, that classifies everything correctly. But if I have only the filled in points labeled, I might learn a different classifier that would, in particular, um, if I use the current predictions as my clean predictions, um, either through a pseudo label loss or through a virtual adversarial training loss, I would now have some samples that are incorrectly labeled. And if the goal of my semi-supervised learning approach is to say that the current prediction should be amplified, I'm going to result in a situation known as error accumulation. I'm going to be updating my, my model parameters to make sure that whatever prediction I have now just has an even stronger buffer but same labeled output. Um, and, and this is a problem and it's hard to recover from and sometimes can lead to, to models that are trained in this semi-supervised fashion completely diverging. And when we're talking about a, a domain adaptation setting where my original labeled data set is drawn from a different distribution than the target, then this initial model that I learned on my labeled data um, is very likely to be misaligned with the unlabeled target it, uh, instances. And so any poor initialization, which by definition, because they are drawn from different distributions and because we want to adapt it for um, more effective use, it is going to be the case, then the initial labelings that you find from the source model on the target instances are going to have a high likelihood of being incorrect. And so we're going to be really stuck in this situation where if we use any supervised learning objective, entropy minimization, pseudo-label loss, or adversarial, uh, virtual adversarial training, any of them are going to um, have this challenge where the instances that are currently um, labeled incorrectly are going to, um, those errors are going to be reinforced and we're going to just accumulate them more and more over time. And so we'll, we'll result in this situation where we pull all of our instances, especially with entropy minimization, we pull all of our instances closer to the cluster means, but we're not necessarily resolving any incorrectly labeled instances. So what can we do about this? How can we make sure that we can leverage some of these um, robust training procedures and um, training procedures that can really be used in a semi-supervised context, but without uh, hurting our performance by over-trusting every instance. We want to instead only trust the instances that we deem to be more reliable. So there's been a lot of work in this space. I, I only am going to mention a couple of different things, but one big area where people have looked at um, trying to understand whether or not an instance is reliable is in trying to detect something about errors in the model. Um, and one such work that I'm highlighting here from 2019 used really simple procedures where they just applied standard off the shelf, simple image transformations and asked how much did the model change as a result of applying those transformations. You could imagine doing something really similar with adversarial perturbations, just asking um, same thing as in that instance adaptive adversarial work where we ask the question of which examples do we think are more reliable, more canonical by seeing how much of an epsilon ball I can 
perturb the image before it starts to change this classification. But you can do the same thing um, with other types of transformations to the images as well, and that's been shown to be effective both at detecting adversarial examples as well as um, somewhat less effective but still reliable at detecting um, natural image errors. And this key insight about looking at different uh, transformed images and, and trying to make sure uh, that a model is invariant to these different transformations, of course, with the adversarial perturbations has been leveraged through adversarial training and virtual adversarial training, but also in standard unsupervised learning, it's been leveraged um, in the contrastive learning framework to popular methods, Simclair and MoCo, use these different image augmentations and ask for learning invariance um, during training. So we wanted to see whether or not we could use some of these um, image augmentations as a way to detect reliability of instances before we use them for our semi-supervised training. And in this work, Sentry, that's what we did. The key idea is that we're going to try to derive a predictive consistency measure, and that will be used in order to um, overcome the fact that the original output models confidence scores, especially when you're dealing with a domain adaptive setting uh, where the initial model is trained on a different distribution than your test distribution, um, those scores can tend to be miscalibrated and can't be used out of the box necessarily. Um, and then we'd like to be able to use some sort of semi-supervised learning where we're going to increase the, the model's confidence, but only increase it on the target instances that are deemed to be reliable. So briefly, the way that the model works is that we start by learning a supervised model on our labeled data. We then train um, a model on our target data by first predicting on a particular target instance. And then we're going to add together with the original clean target instance uh, a set of augmentations. In this case, we used RANDAUG, um, but you could also use adversarial augmentations. We're going to retrieve a new set of predictions and um, encode a selective entropy loss. The way that this selective entropy loss works is that we're first going to check for consistency or consensus among the different votes. And this could be any type of voting procedure. We tried a bunch of different ones in the paper. But the key is if the votes are consistent, well, then we can use standard entropy minimization, which means that we're trying to increase the confidence of the model on this particular instance. And if it's inconsistent, we don't want to increase the model's confidence. We want to, in fact, decrease the model's confidence so we maximize entropy. So it's a very simple learning procedure. The key difference is really that instead of treating every instance identically, we're going to make sure that we first judge each instance based off of its notion of reliability under the current learning setting. And we're only going to trust the instances that were deemed to be reliable um, by having a consistent output across augmentations. And this simple change results in, in um, some pretty substantial performance improvements. Um, I'm going to show you a few examples here from the domain adaptation literature. but. Uh, and in this particular paper, we were explicitly very focused also on trying to understand performance on the categories that are highly susceptible to these divergence criteria, um, namely the categories that had very few labeled samples in the source data set tend to underperform in the adaptive setting because the model is, is sort of more vulnerable to um, the instances where it just didn't have as many training data. But here's one example, this mini domain net data set, um, which is a popular benchmark in the domain adaptation community. And um, the performance is measured across 40 classes and averaged here across 12 different shifts, meaning um, different source to target transformations. And if you were to just take the source model and apply it to the target without doing any adaptation, you would get about 66% on this task. There's a number of different um, methods, including distribution matching, base methods, label shift methods, and um, some prior work that looks at both the data and label distribution shift, which is what's happening in this particular setting. Um, <clears throat> they work based off of things like a relaxed distribution matching criteria, some self-training, but using um, only confident pseudo labels, so using the output 
predictions of the source model rather than um, using some sort of a consistency metric. And um, this more recent method that uses entropy minimization together with contrastive loss, so really using in, um, augmentations but learning invariance rather than learning um, selective optimization. And then finally, this work, which is using the selective entropy optimization. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to actually skip the next couple of results. Um, this, the paper is on archive and has a number of different uh, results if you're interested. One last thing I want to show here is um, just that when you are optimizing only over a select set of instances rather than over the whole data set equally, um, one question you might ask is how many instances are you selecting? And especially throughout training, how many are deemed to be reliable or unreliable? Um, and so we, we looked at that here and found that um, the number of instances that are selected or included in training does actually increase over time, which was a positive sign. It meant that the model um, was somehow um, learning to incorporate more data over time in some sort of an implicit curriculum fashion. And the other question you might ask is just, um, how reliable is this? It's a very simple consistency checker. It's just data augmentations and passing it through the model and asking how uh, many labels are the same. And uh, we found that it actually had pretty high precision for detecting uh, consistent samples, and that precision remained constant throughout training. Um, interestingly, detecting incorrect samples by finding samples where um, all of the output predictions were, were not the same that did not have quite as high precision, but it did increase over time, meaning that um, later on in training, the samples that were still inconsistent were, were much more likely to be incorrect. So we found that this was reliable enough that it actually improved performance over doing just standard entropy uh, minimization or semi-supervised learning. And it was kind of a promising, very simple, intuitive approach, easy to implement, but offered some pretty substantial gains um, and av really avoided some of the divergence that happens in standard um, unconstrained entropy minimization. So overall, in this talk, what I was focusing on is a little bit different probably than most of the talks of this workshop, but what I'm focusing on is really trying to drive home the fact that when we want, if we want to talk about robustness or reliability of our models overall, um, and we're thinking about different ways in which we can encode that robustness throughout training, we should be thinking about it at an instance level. There are different images that can be leveraged um, in more or less a different amount of reliable way, and you might be able to um, really add more robustness to your model overall if you don't try to um, ask for this equal amount of robustness across every instance, but rather have it be adaptive per instance. Um, and this is applicable both in a supervised learning context and also in a semi-supervised learning context. So I wanna thank um, some of my group members that weren't already highlighted on the slide. Um, a lot of them had input throughout discussions and um, many of them uh, also just contributed a lot overall to this work. And um, I have hopefully a couple minutes to take any remaining questions that people might have about this, this line of work. And otherwise, thank you for your attention. Mm, Thanks, hi, Judy, I, for, okay. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Go ahead, yeah, ask your question, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your talk. And I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that um, is a vulnerable uh, extend for an attack method on a data set uh, is measured by the uh, accuracy drop, uh, which means the more it drops, the more um, vulnerable it is. So, um, I mean, how can we evaluate the uh, vulnerable extend of an instance? Uh, maybe the probability of the predicting the uh, correct label? I think that's an interesting question. And if I understand correctly, what you're saying is um, how how can we even define this notion of reliability of an instance? And I think yes. there's a lot of different ways people look into this. Um, and I, I highlighted a couple, but I don't think we have a definitive answer. So one way in which you could look at it is, of course, you could just look at the output score of the model. That's be like the classic standard thing to do. Of course, many of the models are miscalibrated. 
um, especially when you start applying them to out of distribution data. And so that's not usually a great metric, um, but that is one thing you can do. So if the model has an output score that's pretty low, you could maybe guess that the model isn't very confident on that instance and not, um, not trust the output of the model. Another thing you could do is you could, um, like in the instance adaptive adversarial training work, you could apply um, a, a different set of targeted augmentations. Um, in that case, they're gonna be adversarial attack augmentations. And you could ask um, how likely is it that the model changes its predictive output? So this is giving you a sense of um, how vulnerable that model is to a particular set of fixed attacks. Could also be like this last work in Sentry where we used not necessarily attacks, just standard augmentations that were assumed to not they, they should not be changing the uh, output semantics of the model. And if your model is going to be um, changing its predictive output in response to the, those data augmentations, that gives you a sense as well that the model is not necessarily as reliable on that instance. Well, thank you. And uh, I have uh, the, the second question is that on the domain adaption, mm -hmm. regarding the trade-off between the robustness and the accuracy, so are there any thoughts or insights about the difference between the video classification and the image classification? Oh, in terms of robustness? Yes, and the, the trade-off between the robustness and the um, accuracy. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question exactly, but um, so, insights about video as opposed to images like what would yeah. what would change between the two yeah the, um yeah. i think that's an interesting question it's not something i've looked into too much and um i i think that if you had videos there's a lot more information that you could leverage um in order to try to understand something about the robustness of the model um just explicitly from the video itself i mean there's a lot of temporal information um and if you move beyond classification and start thinking about um, some sort of spatially varying semantic output like segmentation or detection, um, there's a lot of implicit information just within the image itself. Um, so if you're operating on any of these domains or a multimodal domain, let's say, where there is explicitly a set of paired information, um, I can imagine you could leverage that in order to, to get a robustness or reliability output measure. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, then thanks, Judy, for this great presentation. Uh, we can then move to the next one. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for uh, uh, Judy for the talk. So uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Ci Han Xie. So uh, Ci Han is an assistant professor of computer science and engineering at University of uh, California, uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, his research interest lies in computer vision and uh, machine learning, intending to build human-level computer vision systems 
particularly in securing model performance under the worst case scenario and enduring models with interpretability. He received the Facebook Fellowship in 2020. So the top title is Adversarial Example Improves Image Recognition. So uh, let's welcome Siham to give the talk. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just give me one minute to set up this, this slides. Uh, let me see, okay. Okay, cool. So, uh, as mentioned, like in a lot of previous works, uh, adversary examples generally are treated as threats to deep networks, right? And a lot of previous efforts on this direction is trying to say, okay, can, how can we build more robust models and make these models to get rid of adversary examples? Uh, while in this talk, I will try to bring, uh, bring some different things to you guys. Uh, specifically, in this talk, I will try to show uh, how can we use adversary examples to help your deep networks. For example, like suppose you get your networks with adversarial trained, your network will have say better uh, in domain and or and the out of domain generalization ability. So first, let's talk about the motivation. Uh, before our work, there are indeed a lot of works showing that adversarial trained models indeed get some valuable and new features. Uh, okay. So for example, uh, in this loss gradient uh, visualization where like the people just do the loss gradient with respect to the input pixels. Uh, the second column uh, row here you can see is a visualization from the Awanina trained models. You can see basically like this patterns are completely noisy and a human cannot see any patterns here, right? But for a third column, a third row here, that's the visualization for the adversarial trained models. You can see this visualization are highly human aligned, which means uh, the adversarial learned models and the Wallina learned models are indeed learn some different features. And in the other points that this adversarial learned features are more aligned to human perception. And also people are showing that adversarial trained models are pretty good at tagger image synthesis task. So given these two works, there's also another dilemma here is that when you use features exclusively from adversarial examples, they usually degrade your model performance. And then here you can see we train two models, B3 and B7. Uh, currently, like you do not need to know like what is B3 and what is B7, and which I will detail it later, but you just need to remember that B3 is a small model and B7 is a large model. The blue bar indicates this model is one in a train, which means you just apply some clean images, do the training, and this gray bar are adversarial training. And the Y axis is the ImageNet top one accuracy. You can see that compared to the blue bar, the gray bar has significantly lower accuracy when testing on the ImageNet validation data sets. This indicates that training in exclusive on adversarial examples will significantly degrade the performance on clean images. And one hypothesis we make, we try to explain this phenomenon is that probably adversary examples and the clean images, they came from two different distributions. Okay, so that's why you train on the adversary examples and then test on clean images that, that cannot generalize pretty well, which causes this significant performance degrade, right? So to validate this hypothesis, what we do next is we take these adversarial trained models, we then fine tune these models with clean, clean samples. So this step can kind of simply bridge the, the domain gap, right? Because you first train with adversarial and then you fine tune with clean images. And then you, the results is shown in this orange bar. You can see that compared to this, this gray bar, this result gets significantly improved. 
which kind of can validate our hypothesis about the distribution mismatch between the adversary examples and clean examples. And furthermore, when we compare this first portraying on the adversarial and then fine tuning on the clean images to the like the popular the popular uh, Valina baseline that uh, only train with clean images, you can find that for B3 model, these two performances are already pretty close. And for B7 model, which is a larger model, you can see this green orange bar can even outperform this blue bar here. So given these results, and also what we just applied for the orange bar is a very, very simple algorithm. The next question is, can we design some more sophisticated algorithms to further uh, improve the, uh, the, 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 the model performance if we utilize adversary examples? So let's bring our solution called adversary propagation. The key point in our adversary propagation is we should do joint training, but with distinguishing. For the joint training, uh, re recall that in the previous pipeline, we first pre-train on these adversary images and then fine tuning on these clean images. But this first pre-train and then fine tune paradigm may cause some catastrophic forgetting issues, right? Because uh, you later train on some clean images, probably you forget some useful features that you learned from adversary images. So a better choice is that we should join, like train with adversary examples and clean images at the same time. And this is uh, proposed by Ian Goodfellow in 2015 about the adversary training algorithms. This is something not new, right? But for our contribution in this solution is when we do the joint training, we should care about the distribution mismatch. The main reason that we should care about this problem is that in the in this training framework, uh, the network usually contains a block called the batch normalization layers. And for the batch normalization layers, uh, the basic function is that it takes the inputs and calculates a single mean and a single variance over this batch, and then applies this mean and variance to normalize your input features. So this is a milestone in the deep learning history because it can accelerate your training and also make your training much more stable. But in, the, in this joint adversary training case, this will, the BN layer will cause some problems because as we mentioned before, we think adversary examples and clean images, they came from different two different distributions. So if you just naively apply the batch normalization layer over this mixture of distributions, you will go, cause some confusions, right? As you illustrated here. The originally you should estimate like two mean and two variance for adversary distribution and clean distribution respectively. Or here you just do the mixture one, right? So the statistic estimation at the batch normalization layers will be confused while facing this mixture case. So our solution, again, is pretty simple. What we do is we add an auxiliary batch normalization layers. So that means for the mixture of inputs only at the batch normalization layers, the clean images will go through the main batch normalization layer and the adversary images will go through this auxiliary BN layers. So such design can guarantee that the data from dis different distributions are normalized separately. And basically just as illustrated in this figure, you can say by this simple design, you can again, like say, get the right statistic from clean images and the, and the adversary images with the right statistic. And at the test time, uh, our adversary propagation, because you have two batch of there, right? And uh, one is, the main BN you get from the clean images and one is the auxiliary BN you get from adversary images. And for simplicity, at the inference time, we just drop this auxiliary BN and only the main BN, which is obtained from your clean images for the inference. Before we go to the experiment session, I wanna give you a brief background of the network we use called EfficientNet uh, in our experiments. So before EfficientNet, 
people know that for a baseline network, if you make this network be wider or deeper, or your input get larger resolution, you will get better performance. And efficient is just take a step further and say, okay, if you already know, simply go through the deeper, wider, and the larger resolution can improve. Why not do this, this scaling, these three factors at the same time? And they call this factor as a compound scaling, which and use the neural architecture search techniques to search this the, the right factor for scaling these three parameters. And basically with efficient net, at least in 2020, this is the best uh, architecture on getting this data lot performance on the ImageNet data set. So the X axis is the flops and the Y axis is the ImageNet top one accuracy on the validation data set. You can see basically for the efficient net B0, that means it's a very small efficient net and which can run on your mobile device and the B7 here is a very large efficient net mode. As a side note, efficient at B7's 84.5 top one accuracy on ImageNet is the purest state of art on the ImageNet classification data, data uh, task. So by building upon this already pretty strong baseline, uh, our ADU prop can consistently improve the, the baseline model. For example, like on small models like B0, we can get 0.3 improvements. And for B5 and B6, you can get a 0.6, right? And for this already like very big and the, the period still about B cell model, our model can again give some additional performance gain. It can further improve the performance to 85.2, which is again like the state of our performance on internet classification. And if we just solely look at this ImageNet in domain generation performance, you probably think, okay, this like your master, the benefit you bring by your master is kind of pretty small, like say 0.3 improvement, 0.7 improvement. So to further support the effectiveness or the power of our master, we also do some out of distribution generation tests. The first test that we performed is on the image and the C data set. Uh, the, the purpose of this image and C data set is to benchmark the model's robustness against the different image corruptions. For example, your image may go through some blur, the JPEG compression, and give this new images for testing the robustness. And the second data set we choose here is called image and A data set. Basically, image and A data set is our collection of some very hard natural uh, real world images. For example, the true label of this image is actually a bird, but you can see the bird is pretty small here, right? Which is even very challenging for our human observer to recognize this image. And the third data set is called a stylized image net. Basically this data set is just try, is removing the, all the texture patterns and uh, the purpose here is to benchmark the model's shape uh, representation power for recognizing, for recognizing these images. So for the original efficient at beast seven models, when we test on those three different data sets, uh, we, on India C, we got a 53.1 accuracy. On India A, we got a 37.7 uh, uh, accuracy. And on satellites in general, we got a 28.8 uh, accuracy. And uh, do you recall that on the original internet, efficient at B7 got 84.5 top one accuracy. So that's a huge drop on this, on this data set. And also demonstrate that this task is extremely non-trivial. And by adding adversarial propagation, we can see that on image C data set, our accuracy, we can improve the accuracy by 5.1 top one accuracy. And on the image A, our, our improvement is a seven percentage. And on the stylized image net, our improvement is 4.8 uh, uh, improvements. And again, as our 
side note, the very popular ResNet 50 baseline here, you can see it only got 40.7 on the MGS-C dataset, 3.1 on the MGS-A dataset, and 8.0 8 on the Stalaz internet. So if you just look at the absolute value here, you can see this is a huge improvement over the existing methods. And then we compare our models to the purest state of art uh, on MGI classification. The purest state of art is, uh, model is released by Facebook, uh, where they train the models on billions of Instagram images with weak, with weak labels. And by comparing our methods, uh, which is the first row here, you can see in terms of parameters, we're 10 times less. And in terms of actual data, because we're only trained on ImageNet, while this, the, the, the second model trained on billions of Instagram images. So we're 3,000 times less training data. But in terms of accuracy, we're even 0.1 better, which demonstrates the power and the effectiveness of our proposed method. So after this work, we also do some follow-ups. The first follow-up is using this adversary propagation to improve object detection. And this paper is accepted by at CPR 2021. Uh, however, the motivation here is a little bit different. We all know that for the object detection, we need to first go through our pre-train and then fine-tuning learning paradigm, right? And by following this uh, learning paradigm here, we note that fine-tuning different pre-train models usually will yield very similar performance on both accuracy and robustness. So here D2 and D5 are the detection, detection version of efficient net. And you can see uh, these three different colors indicate the models are either vanilla trained or pre-trained on the ADU prop or pre-trained with noisy students. You can see that uh, when even though like for pre-trained models, they have different powers. I think in the original pre-trained model, in terms of the image and results, they at least get one or two percent percentage performance difference. But when fine-tuning on the detection sets, you can see basically like there are pretty little years, very close performance on the original, on the COCO uh, detection result, both for both B2 and D5. And also we do our generalization test on the COCO C data set, which is a cropped version of a COCO data set for benchmarking the robustness. And we can see again, like the robustness here is pretty same. So that means the advantage brought by your upstream classification task usually cannot transfer well to the downstream task for accuracy and robustness. So given this observation, what we want to do is that we want to directly augment the downstream object detection task. And by making some non-trivial modifications, we can successfully apply the adversary propagation to the object detection case, and the results basically look like this. So firstly, we can achieve considerable improvements on both clean accuracy and the robustness. The detection ADU prop consistently improve models of various scales, and the performance gain is especially notable for large scale detectors with high capacity. And also our models uh, methods generalize pretty well to the single class detection task, such as the face and the pedestrian detection. And though we further evaluate the robustness of the detector trained by our detect DET ADU prop and the virus corruption on COCO C, which spans 15 uh, corruptions and, a and the five severity level. Detection ADU prop can achieve even more significant improvements on these distorted images than on the clean uh, images over the baseline. And the performance gain also tend to become, like say, larger when the corruption strength is stronger. So that's a pretty good news, right? Another manifest of the model robustness is whether it can return strong performance against domain shift. 
So what we do next is that we use these trained detectors to run inference directly on the VOC data set, which has different data distribution from the COCO. And as shown in this table, uh, you can see DET ADU prop always outperforms the vanilla baseline and the auto arc training baseline. And they're for all the model spheres and uh, every evaluation metric. So if you want to know more about this work, you're welcome to our CPR poster on June 25th uh, from 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Uh, uh, I think it's the Eastern time. And another follow-up is the shape texture device training. So uh, at native to use adversary examples to improve your image recognition, uh, uh, the, what we can do is that we can use Q conflict uh, images. So the texture shape Q conflict images is first introduced in the well-known image training science uh, bias towards texture paper. What they do there is you take a texture pattern images and take our uh, original image, uh, original natural images. You just apply the GAN to make sure their texture pattern and the shape pattern and create this new one. And for this new images, you can see you get the, cat, the shape of cat and but for the texture of elephants. So the original purpose of this te shape texture Q conflict images is to validate uh, whether like your networks are biased towards the shape or the texture. But what we do here is a little bit different. Uh, the first, let's go over like the training pipeline. The first is that you can first uh, randomly sample two images from your training data set. For example, you can get a chimpanzee images and the lemma images. And then you can apply the GAN to make sure, to make sure there's their texture pattern and the shape pattern. So given these images, you get three things, you get a three possibility to train your models, right? The first is that you think this are chimpanzee uh, image. So, but, and the label assignment is say, okay, this image is a chimpanzee and you need to learn this correlation shapes. And by doing so, this will result a shape bias model because the, for this image, the chimpanzee only represents the shape information. But also you can also say like, this is a lemon. But again, this will result a texture bias model because the demo here only provides the, the, the texture pattern. And what we do here is a little bit, it's very simple. Uh, what, what we do here is just say, okay, this image is, is a chimpanzee and also a demo. So it's a soft uh, assignment of labels. And this can result in our shape texture D bias models. And here's the empirical results. You can see compared to the original baseline here, uh, you get a huge improvement, of, for example, on the original image the classification and also on the order of generalization, say image A data set, C data set, uh, stylized data set, and also be more robust against FGSM attack. And also we what we didn't show here is that what we can we conduct some additional experiments to verify that our models indeed learn some more, much better shape and texture cues compared to other baseline models. Okay, takeaways. So the first takeaway message is that adversarial learned features are indeed valuable. Previous work have provided some qualitative evidence to show Adversary images bring some new features and this new features seems pretty good. And what we do here is we provide the first quantitative results to show that by getting this robust features, you indeed can get better image recognition models on both the classification, detection, and also the segmentation tasks. The second takeaway message is that adversary examples can actually serve as a pretty general data augmentation method to improve your model. For example, like the image flipping is a very popular way to augment your image training data, right? But flipping does not make too much sense for the NLP task or for the reinforcement learning task. 
But the adversary examples are very different. You can find the adversary example for image recognition and also for NLP and also for reinforcement learning. So it's very possible that you can just use adversary examples to build a universal data augmentation method to improve your deep learning algorithm, regardless of like what is the task for this deep learning model. The third point is that disentangled learning is pretty important when inputs came from different distributions. And what we do here is that we apply separate batch normalization to, to make sure like each models, like each module, the adversarial and clean, their features can be correctly learned by the models. So that's a pretty important point. And just to summarize, what we do here is that we use adversarial prop uh, and this is a CPR 2020 paper. We show that adversarial perturbations can help the classification task. And also in this year, CPR, we show that it can help the detection algorithm. And also in our IKDR 2021 paper, we show that other than use adversarial perturbation, we can use those shape texture Q conflict images to improve your model on classification and segmentation. And also we have some undergoing projects trying to see, okay, whether you can use the synthetic data or the uncreated internet data to improve your models further. And also maybe some possibility like for different tasks, like the future learning, unsupervised semi-supervised learning, and the multimodality learning to just use this like adversarial data to improve them in general. So lastly, I want to thank my amazing collaborators for their great help for this project. And also I want to thank Facebook for providing me the Facebook fellowship and also the open fair for the funding, uh, fund, funding my, lab, my lab. Uh, lastly, I want to do a small higher advertisement here. Uh, in our lab at UCSC, we still have multiple positions for remote uh, some interns and within students. So if you're interested, you can just send me an email. And that's all. I'm happy to take questions here. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, for the great talk. So we have some questions from the audience. The first question is from uh, Zheng Yu Zhao. The question is that it makes sense that fine tuning on clean images improves the accuracy of adversarial chain model on clean images, but will it harm the robust accuracy, which is the accuracy of adversarial images? Yeah, that's. That's a good question, and that's that's the correct point. So, uh, in terms of say you fine tune our adversarial trained models on the clean images, it indeed like say you get less adversarial robustness. But we as students in this paper, we find the benefits uh, is really uh, like desired for many applications. For example, uh, you want you not only say want your higher image genetic accuracy, but also you want your higher accuracy on a lot of other distribution samples, right? Like the image C data set, image A data set, which are more, maybe they are more uh, re real data in the, in the real world. And I, so even by say sacrificing your adversarial robustness a little bit and the, but for trading for this, uh, strong generalization and the in domain generalizations, I think that's a good and a promising direction to go further. But of course, ideally, we would definitely want to get a one method to say, okay, you not only say strong robustness, but also say strong uh, in domain or the, or the out of domain generalization. But I think we still need a lot of efforts to make it be real. Uh, yeah, thanks for the answer. And the follow-up question is that uh, will solely using adversarial training without your adversary pop technique improve out of distribution accuracy? Well, uh, I do not have a very rigorous proof for this, but purely I do have test the adversarial training models on the auto distribution data like the MGSC data set. I found that if your model tend to be robust, say adversarial robust, it will hurt a little bit on the out of distribution data set like the MGSC. 
but I do not do this very seriously. And the only what I have done is for ingest seed and SF. So I'm not sure, but it, for from my, the ingest seed result, it indeed seems that it will hurt the out of distribution generalization ability. Yeah. Yeah, uh, cool. Uh, thanks uh, for, for, the, for your answers. So uh, let's uh, move on to our next talk. So uh, uh, while wh 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 you are like uh, setting up the recording of the, from the Professor Rekhaya Otterson, I will also give a brief introduction of our uh, next speaker. So uh, Professor Rekhaya Otterson is a full professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. She was the Uber ATG chief scientist and the head of Uber ATG Toronto. She is a award-leading expert in AI for self-driving cars. Her research interests include machine learning, computer vision, robotics, AI, and remote sensing. She is the recipient of an NVIDIA Pioneers of AI Award, three Google Faculty Research Awards, an Amazon Faculty Research Award, and two Best Paper Runner-Up Prize at CVPR. So uh, her talk title is Adversal Robustness for Self-Driving. Then uh, let's watch the recording. Hi everyone, my name is Raquel Urtesen. I'm the founder and CEO of Wabi. Oh, just want to check, you guys can hear the audio, right? Yeah, we can hear it. Today, I'm going to be talking about adversarial robustness for self-driving. But before I do this, uh, let me tell you the exciting things that we are doing at Wabi. Self-driving is one of the most exciting and important technologies of our generation. Once solved at the scale, it will change the world as we know it. Since the DARPA challenge um, in 2004, the cell driving industry has made meaningful progress, but commercial deployment is still limited to very simple and small operation domains. The traditional approach to engineering cell driving vehicles results in a software stack that does not take full advantage of the power of AI and that requires complex and time consuming manual tuning. This makes the scaling costly and technically challenging especially when it comes to solving the less frequent and more unpredictable driving scenarios. Building up the lessons of the last two decades, Wabi is tackling so driving in a new way that fully unleashes the power of AI. In particular, our AI-first approach leverages deep learning, probabilistic inference, and complex optimization to create software that is end-to-end -end trainable, interpretable, and capable of very complex reasoning. This, together with a revolutionary closed loop simulator that has an unprecedented level of fidelity, enables testing at scale of both common driving scenarios and safety critical edge cases. This approach significantly reduces the need to drive testing miles in the real world and results in a safer, more affordable solution. Our first use case is long-haul tracking, where there is a chronic shortage of drivers and a need to enhance safety. We are back up by the best in class investors in terms of deep technology, logistics, and the thriving Canadian ecosystem. We launched the company last week, announcing one of the largest Series A in Canadian history. We have offices both in Toronto as well as San Francisco. Come join us, we are hiring. Now, let's get back to the topic of the talk, adversarial robustness for survival. As autonomous systems continue to improve, um, and if you look at the simulation and tests that the self-driving cars or vehicles actually receive, most of them are gonna pass. However, is this a measure of how well we are doing? Does the fact that we can solve all the test cases reflect the fact that we are safe to drive in the real world? Not really, right? So we're actually gonna need tools to automatically generate worst case or adversarial scenarios that are gonna allow us to understand what are the things that we still need to work on and where are the uh, places where our model is actually not robust. And we can potentially use this in order to create much more robust solutions. So let's see how we can, how we can do this. Let's start by thinking about how the software stack actually works. First, we perceive the world to identify our surrenders. Next, we perform motion forecasting to understand the action the actor might take in the future, in the next few seconds. 
And finally, we use the output of perception and prediction in order to be able um, to decide what is the safest maneuver to do for the vehicle to actually drive safely and comfortable towards the goal. Now, given the modular nature of the stack, we can test each component separately. For example, we can create challenging examples for the perception model. Similarly, it is also important to create safety critical scenarios to test the capabilities of the motion plan. And finally, the most holistic way is to test the entire stack end to end, starting from the sensor simulation and all the way to the motion planning trajectories. To generate these challenging scenarios, we will leverage adversarial attacks. Now, let's dig deeper into adversarial attacks and their applications in cell driving. First, we will provide some background on adversarial examples. Then we will talk about how they can be applied to different components of the cell driving stack. So let's start with some background. Computer vision has improved dramatically in the past decade thanks to neural networks. Today, image classifiers can even outperform humans in some recognition tasks. However, these neural networks are uh, famous for being vulnerable to adversarial examples. Adding a small and imperce imperceivable amount of noise onto an output uh, onto an input um, can cause the neural network to fail, even though the perturbation doesn't affect the human judgment. While adversarial examples were first introduced for image classification, they have been extended to many other applications, including semantic segmentation, object detection, and natural language processing. How are the scenario examples generated? The main idea is to perturb the clean input minimally while changing the model output. In a white box setting where the model is known and differentiable, we can generate perturbations with gradient based optimization. Similar to optimiz uh, optimizing the weights of a neural network, it is said that now we are going to fix the weights and optimize the input. In more challenging by practical settings, the model will be unknown or not differentiable. In this case, the attacker can still use black box optimization methods that rely on querying the model. When queries are not available, weaker transfer attacks can be achieved by training a surrogate model to estimate the gradients of the victim model. When it comes to how we want to modify the output, there are two broad categories. Targeted and untargeted attacks. Targeted attacks try to induce a specific target output. For example, changing the label from banana to snake. Untargeted attacks do not specify a target output. Anything is fine as long as it's not the correct output. For example, changing the label uh, to anything from the banana label is the correct one. We have seen perturbations against a specific input. However, if the input changes slightly, for example, it's due to an object moving, for example, the perturbation might not be effective. This makes it difficult to launch attacks in the real world where objects are in motion. So what's more robust attacks for the real world, we can train universal adversaries by training a single perturbation against the entire training set and minimizing the expected accuracy. The result is a, is a perturbation that is input agnostic and can be used to input uh, to attack any input. Furthermore, this will mean that during uh, the attack, we can just use the training adversary without incurring any computational cost. Finally, because we can attack any input, we do not need prior knowledge of the scene to execute an attack. To be threatening in the real world, the adversarial examples should also be physically realizable. This work shows an adversary sticker, which anyone can print out and stick onto an existing image to full classifiers. The sticker is universal in that it's adversarial when placed by, you know, with any particular pose and any particular image. Here's another example of a physically realizable attack. The authors here 3D printed a mesh of a turtle, um, uh, but pictures of the turtle are basically classi uh, classified as a rifle or other classes. 
This object is universal in that it can pull classifiers uh, when seen from any viewpoint. We've seen that practical real world adversarial attacks against neural networks are possible. On the one hand, self driving vehicles rely heavily on neural networks, and real um, and self driving is a highly safety critical application. Therefore, it's important that we study adversarial robustness in self driving. All right, so let's move into adversarial attacks in self-driving, starting with attacks on the perception model. 3 of detection is the first part of the autonomy stack. Successfully disrupting perception can be detrimental as perception features will, uh, failures will propagate to downstream tasks. What are we looking for when uh, we design this type of attack? Well, first, the adversary has to be physically realizable to be a real world threat. Second, the adversary should be robust to motion as everything is moving relative to the ego vehicle. Third, the adversary should hide objects as colliding to unseen objects is the most dangerous outcome. Finally, the attack should not require too much computation during execution. So let's look at existing adversarial attacks against modern 3D object detections, detectors. We will focus on point cloud inputs as LiDAR sensors are the most popular sensor hardware in cell driving vehicles. Adversarial attacks on point clouds are slightly different from images as one can move points, add points, and remove points. Whereas in images, the only thing that we can do is modify the pixels. However, arbitrary modification of these points are often not physically realizable as point clouds are often generated by sensors uh, with fixed angular frequencies like a LiDAR. Thus, some works try to modify points as if they were uh, an, an, uh, as if they were coming from an underlying surface. But how do we actually modify the, plonka, the point cloud readings from sensors? Some works have used a spoofing uh, device to send the later sensor false signals and create adversarial points. This can cause perception to hallucinate false positives. It's possible to launch efficient black box attacks by collecting false positive examples from existing data sets or, or simulations. Then, instead of performing optimization, the attacker directly places these examples into the scene. Spoofing devices may be difficult to execute in practice as the data sensor moves. A more reliable way to generate adversarial point clouds is to place an adversarial object into the sea. In this work, a physically realizable adversarial mesh generates a point cloud which creates false positives. Previous works mostly focus on false positives. However, false negatives and colliding into unseen objects may be much more dangerous. So let's see what we can do. In the work that we're going to show now, we present a method to hide uh, other vehicles on the road. To make the attack physically realizable, we parameterize the adversary as a 3D printable mesh. The mesh is placed on vehicle rooftops for several reasons. It's easier to place due to gravity, it's less prone to occlusion, and it resembles realistic growth of cargoes like furniture and sport equipment that we might see in the real world. Finally, we aim to make the adversary universal hiding vehicles across time and space with high confidence and making the adversary robust to other variations of the environment. No matter what kind of car it is, what uh, the pose is of this, uh, of this vehicle and what the environment is. Note that our mesh is the same for all vehicles. As shown in the illustration here, the same adversarial mesh successfully hides for different vehicles at different positions in different scenes. Furthermore, with a single universal adversary for all inputs, no optimization is required during the attack. And therefore, it's a very efficient attack. We thus train to discover a single mesh that is an adversary against all vehicles in the training set. This makes the adversary input agnostic under the training distribution. 
Towards this goal, we use a differential renderer to bridge the gap between the mesh representing the physical object and what the sensor see, which is a point cloud, and optimize an adversarial objective targeted at minimizing detection scores to hide the vehicles. In particular, to minimize detection scores, our adversarial loss minimizes the confidence of all bounding box proposals. In addition, we weigh proposals by the intersection of our union with the ground truth to pr prioritize attacking high quality proposals. We mainly rely on black box optimization at this, uh, in order to be applicable to all models. Even when gradients are available, we find that white box attack are the, have similar strength since black box optimization works well in this low dimensional mesh representation. Let's see an illustration of how our algorithm works. We first start with a later strip, which is the input to our detection. To our detector. Then we aim to hide a vehicle from the detector. To do this, we add a physically realizable object into the scene. Here we choose a mesh as our representation, as it can be 3D printed. Then we use a differential renderer to render the mesh into a point cloud and attack it from the top of the vehicle. To determine the location of the roof, we fit a mesh um, to the point cloud. We then add the mesh from point cloud into the vehicle rooftop to create the modified scene. This modified scene is then processed by a detector to produce output bounding boxes. To optimize the adversary, we train the, advers uh, the adversarial loss uh, to be targeted at hiding the vehicle. Let's look at some quantitative uh, demonstration of the attacks. The same adversarial mesh is used throughout the whole video. Notice in the top right, in the original snippet, the target vehicle is consistently detected. However, in the bottom right, after adding the adversary, the vehicle is hidden in most frames. Therefore, the attack is successful. We evaluate our um, attacks uh, against models with different input representations. We use pixel, which takes occupancy boxes as a variation, uh, and a variation of pixel taking density boxes. We also use point RCNN, which processes row point sets, and point pillars, which divides points into pillars and extracts features using a point net. Um, we're going to evaluate the attack here on Kitty. Our metric is attack success rate, which is the percentage of originally detected vehicles that are not detected after perturbation. We also include transfer attacks, where we train the mesh to attack one detector and evaluate it against another detector. In this table, rows describe the model using training and columns are models during evaluation. Thus, the diagonal represents a standard attacks. Our results show that different input representations have different levels of vulnerability. Of diagonals are transfer attacks. We observe a high degree of transferability between uh, models with the same architecture as in the case of the two pixel variants. We observe low transferability elsewhere, indicating input representations might have a large effect on the features a model learns and the vulnerabilities of uh, these particular features. To verify that the input representations indeed impact robustness, we conduct an experiment where we replace pixels occupancy box representation with the pillar feature encodings. We are able to use the same backbone and training scheme since both pixel and point pillars perform two deconvolutions in Perseid. Here, pixel star is significantly more robust, purely due to the different input representation. This suggests that additional point level features before aggregating in the high dimension increases robustness to rooftop objects. We compare um, white box um, against black box optimization and find that black box optimization is, much, uh, is not much weaker. Furthermore, we made benchmark against the mesh that is used for initialization of our adversarial attack. Although the initial mesh is similar in size, it has little impact on detection recall. On the other hand, the adversarial mesh drops recall significantly, showing that the geometry is indeed adversarial. Even if we have malicious since then, these scenarios can coincidentally occur in practice in the form of rooftop cargo. We conduct experiments where we initialize the mesh from common rooftop objects and additionally place an epsilon constraint on mesh vertices 
to maintain resemblance to the original mesh. We measure attack success right, against, um, again, as before, right, and find adversaries that are very similar to real world furniture and sport equipment. Particularly, we find larger objects like couches and canoes to be especially effective. Smaller and thinner objects like chairs and bikes are weaker as they, general, they generate less later points. We also conduct a pilot study on the fence with two approaches. First, we perform data augmentation by adding random meshes to vehicle rooftops during training. By training against random rooftop objects, we can generate and greatly improve the robustness, as you can see here. Next, we use adversarial training, which adds adversarial meshes into the scene during training. Here, we simultaneously um, update the adversarial mesh and the model. Furthermore, we also show detection performance on the amplitude data set in the rightmost column and show that a defending model achieves similar or better performance. Thus, by training against our adversaries, models become more robust in auto distribution, but they are not going to um, uh, leave out the performance that they have originally. Our work is a step towards safer self driving under unseen conditions from limited training data. Now, in addition to radar sensors, which are commonly used for in, because they have you know, great ability to capture rich 3D representations, other sensor inputs are typically used in self driving, for example, cameras. Therefore, we want to extend this work to consider adversarial attacks on multimodal perception systems. And images are interesting, and in particular, they have found to be very, very vulnerable to adversarial attacks uh, when processing in, in isolation. So we are interested in looking into what happens when we, we have multiple input modalities. There, um, there exist uh, some works which paint vehicles to create adversarial textures. As a result, the vehicles are camouflaged and hidden from image detectors. However, this attack does not target multimodal detectors. In the work shown in the, in the slide, the authors perturb both image and data to study how image features affect robustness and find that image perturbations are much more effective than later. However, the attack perturbs images and later independently, which results in perturbations which are inconsistent across the two modalities, which means that they cannot really exist in practice. To hide vehicles in a realistic manner, we extend the previous roof of cargo attack that we were talking about um, to include a texture mesh. And we're going to render the same object into the two modalities, later as well as cameras, to ensure that perturbations are physically realizable. All right, so we're going to start by extending the later simulation pipeline to accommodate images as well. So here we have a later sweep and an input image. The host vehicle is highlighted in green in the later and clearly visible in the image. So again, we're going to perturb the mesh um, and we're going to fit this mesh to approximate the, the pose of the host vehicle, which represents the pose of the adversary. To handle the occlusion in images, we also need to know the depth of each individual pixel, which is not available in the raw data. So we're going to use a depth completion network, uh, which takes the image of interest and spark ground truth uh, later uh, measurements uh, to obtain um, a dense estimate of every pixel's depth. depth. Then we're going to render the adversary and place it into the scene and discard occluded pixels or later point clouds by simply removing points or pixels with greater depth along the same way. Finally, we apply a single uh, very simple directional lighting model to approximate sunlight and enhance the realism of our simulation. We then extend the previous work uh, to incorporate the image simulation module, and we are going to replace the radar only model with one that actually takes as input both images as well as later. In addition to what we were doing before, we're going to introduce a false positive component into the loss function which is going to encourage high confidence in all proposals which do not overlap with any ground truth boxes. 
We perform the attack on two data sets, Kitty and an internal data set which we call Zenith. We evaluate the success rate of false positives and false, um, false negatives and false positives separately in our metrics. To attack a single modality, we disable the gradient flow to the other modality during the bubble pass. And our experiments are all conducted on the MMF model, which is a state-of-the-art model that fuses image and data information to create very accurate 3 d detections. Now, our, our model to generate these adversarial perturbations is general and can work with any differentiable model. Um, we perform attacks um, uh, on a later-only detector and a detector which uses both later and images. Overall, we find that multimodal models are slightly more vulnerable to the later-only counterpart, which might seem counterintuitive. For the multimodal model, we experiment with three settings, attacking later, attacking images, or attacking both of them. In addition, we consider a baseline of a mesh with randomly generated geometry and texture. We find that successful attacks on image later models are mostly caused by brittle image features. Note that perturbing later alone is not very effective. And on the other hand, perturbing image alone is almost as effective as perturbing both. We also conduct black box transfer attacks between the two different uh, data sets, which are captured with different sensor hardware configurations like image resolution and later calibration. Furthermore, these data sets are captured at different geographic locations, Europe versus North America. We observe a small degree of transferability between the two data sets as the attack success rate after transfer is much higher than um, using a random mesh. Here's a demonstration of our attack on Kitty. While both later and image are perturbed, we only show the image here as it's easier to see uh, the host vehicle. Notice the flickering of the detections after per perturbation. In contrast, the unperturbed vehicle on the top is consistently detecting every frame. Now let's look at some qualitative examples of false positives. We mostly observe them in distant locations far away from the host vehicle. We show that these false positives in the face I view radar sweeps since they are too small to see in the image. Upon visualization, the image features after perturbation, we can see the adversary induces a strong adversarial features in the image space. These strong features are then projected into 3D, and after projection, they dominate the, um, the 3D later features after fusion and create false positives. Finally, we explore several dense uh, methods against our attack. First, we employ JPEG compression and the compression on the image, uh, on the image inputs and find that this has very little effect. Next, we find that the science training to be very effective. Furthermore, by combining feature denoising with adversarial training, we can achieve a very strong defense against false negatives, but the effect of false positives is much weaker. We suspect that this is because uh, false positives are also caused by inaccurate associations between 2D pixels and 3D later points in infusion. And such inaccuracies cannot be corrected to adversarial defenses. Now, after we see how adversarial attacks can be actually very detrimental for perception systems, both single modality and multiple modality, now let's go into how we can attack uh, methods that exploit vehicle to vehicle communication. When we study adversarial robustness at the sensor input level, um, how about during, uh, during this vehicle to vehicle communication? Well, if you look at how is satellite is going to look in the future, we're going to have many vehicles in the scene and they can communicate, and potentially this has the power to actually do much better perception. First, let's see, uh, look at a refresher of a state of, uh, a state of the art network uh, that performs vehicle to vehicle communication that we're going to attack. Um, so, the way that B2B networks is the following. Here we have three different vehicles in the scene. And every vehicle is going to collect uh, input representation depicted here with the later. Then the sensory inputs are going to be processed to create intermediate representations. Then we're going to generate messages which are actually compressed and sent to the medium. The receiving vehicle is going to decompress these messages and it's going to process them 
with a specially aware GNN that takes into account also the difference of receiving time uh, in order to create uh, very accurate predictions, uh, perception and prediction outputs. Where prediction here is the motion forecasting of where the actors will be into the future. Okay, so this is a network that actually works extremely well. It can improve performance uh, in perception and prediction uh, by a very, very large margin. Now, as we've seen the B2B, um, uh, with this B2B, um, B2B communication can really boost the performance drastically. However, it also uh, can open the door to vulnerabilities. An attacker can potentially start tempering the messages. And the question is, is this actually dangerous? Um, communication channels can be compromised to, ingest, to inject adversarial messages. While existing security protocols can provide adequate security for communication, additional levels of redundancy are always welcome, especially in safety critical applications such as self driving. Thus, we study adversarial attacks to improve robustness of communication systems at the neural, ne um, at the neural network level. Adversarial messages can severely degrade performance. By setting a small epsilon constraints on the perturbations, the adversarial messages are almost indistinguishable from the original, making it very difficult to detect that we've been attacked. So we next are going to study how to create these perturbations that are added on top of messages, which are uh, intermediate network representations that mimic basically what P2P uh, net uh, was actually transmitting. So again, we're going to attack object detection, where detectors, um, detectors are going to output proposals. Um, each with a bounding box, a class, and a confidence score. In this work, we're going to, uh, uh, an adversarial message is crafted to attack all detectors in the scene instead of just the host vehicle. We can attack the output by changing the class label of these proposals. Um, we can generate false negatives by changing classes of detected objects to the background class to make objects disappear. On the other hand, uh, false positives can be generated by changing background classes to an object class to make the detection model hallucinate uh, that they exist indeed an object when it's not the case. In a web setting, attacks, um, attackers can easily create adversarial messages using gradient-based updates to generate false class labels. However, full access uh, to the model running in the SDV is not practical. This is not going to happen. In a scenario where communication channels are compromised, attackers can still execute adversarial human in the loop attacks without access to the gradient. Here, the attacker can only um, eavesdrop on the communication channel and does not have access to sensory measurements of the vehicles. To do so, the attacker needs to train a surrogate model to approximate the gradients of the target model. By doing so, Perturbations generated by the surrogate model will transfer to intermediate features of the target model. However, this requires that the surrogate produces similar intermediate representations. While the attacker cannot access the target model, the intermediate features of the target model are available by spying on the communication chain. Thus, when training the surrogate model, we use a discriminator to match the distribution of the surrogate's intermediate features uh, to those of the target model. When we use a discriminator instead of distillation, since the communication channel does not contain the sensory inputs, which are associated with each message. And thus, we don't have per data to do distillation. In addition, the surrogate model is also trained to perform the same perception task to uh, imitate the behavior of the target model. Once the surrogate model is trained, we can execute attacks by using gradient based updates to generate a, trans, um, a transferable perturbation using the surrogate model and, added, um, and adding it um, onto the benign message. In contrast to universal attack shown previously, where computation is not, um, computation is not really required during the attack because we have a physical object, uh, performing optimization in every time step of an online attack, as we need to do here, is extremely expensive. So we need to find a solution uh, to do the attack in a more realistic manner, in a way that it can be done in a very efficient manner as well. So in a normal setting, we can exploit the redundancy between consecutive frames to create more efficient attacks. 
Specifically, you can use the perturbation from a previous frame as initialization from the current frame. From the current frame. In addition, we apply a real transformation at every time step to take into account the fact that the, uh, the vehicle has uh, the ego vehicle has moved. By doing so, we can synchronize the perturbations uh, with the movement of sensory measurements relatively to the ego car. So here we plot the average precision at different numbers of agents. We show a no attack baseline and a noise baseline with random uniform noise with the same bound is added. Our white box, white box attack is able to drop AP significantly at uh, very few agents, but the model becomes more robust with more agents. Our transfer attack is able to um, achieve a small degree of success, but as expected, is much weaker than the white box attack. Here we show the benign feature, benign feature map in the top left and the perturbation on its right. The perturbation is very small and as can be seen from the color scale. On the bottom left, the unperturbed messages produce mostly correct detections. After adding the perturbation, see all the false positives and false negatives that we observe on the bottom right. So we definitely are able to create uh, safety critical issues for a fleet of self-driving vehicles by using this technique. Here we propose, um, here we demonstrate uh, the necessity of using domain adaptation to align intermediate representations of the self-driving model. We compare generating perturbations with three models. The original model, a self-driving model with domain adaptation, and a self-driving without. We evaluate in a setting with only two SDVs in the network. First, Using the original uh, model to generate perturbation is equivalent to a white box attack and is very strong. Then notice that the attack is um, completely ineffective without domain adaptation. Next, we evaluate the cross inference, which is using the surrogate model to process the intermediate features of the target model, which evaluates how well the surrogate imitates the target. We can see that domain adaptation makes a drastic difference here and is therefore necessary. Here is a qualitative demonstration of the domain adaptation. We show four channels of the intermediate feature maps. Notice the similarity between the target model and the surrogate with domain adaptation. But without domain adaptation, the features look very, very different. We conduct an ablation uh, on our method um, to perform efficient online attacks. In the not working baseline, we do not perform rigid transformations to account for the motion, which res uh, results in a slightly weaker attack. In the independent setting, we ignore temporal redundancy and treat each frame as independent, thus not reducing previous perturbations. The attack becomes significantly weaker. All right, so we have shown how to build robust autonomy systems on perception and communication and how to attack the systems as well. We're going to turn our attention now to study how to generate the scenarios that might cause failures for the entire server system. Robust perception um, are not the end, since um, there is a need uh, for looking at whether there is particular behaviors that are actually adversarial that might cause failures of the entire server system. As self driving vehicles perform better in natural and well behaved scenarios, this becomes very, very important uh, because it's very, very difficult to actually understand where our failures are. Right? So, identifying the challenges is, is, you know, can be very challenging, can be actually, you know, typically we're going to require exponentially many combinations of the scenarios in order to find where potentially we have a failure. Right, so let's look at whether we can use adversarial techniques to identify such potential failures. Conventional practice in industry for comprehensive testing is a semi-automatic process that relies on human expertise to create an initial scenario set, where each scenario contains at most one or two actors of interest with the specific um, initial locations and trajectories. Scenario variations are then programmatically created by varying the actors' locations and velocity profiles. While such scenarios are valuable, they only evaluate simple interactions with, with the SDV and do not test uh, complex multi actor interactions, such as lane margins and unprotected left turns in dense traffic scenarios, for instance. 
Furthermore, human involvement makes this process time consuming and difficult to scale. Manual design may also result in missing testing configurations that might, might actually prevent us from identifying uh, failure modes of the system. So to address this problem, recent works aim to automate the, generative, the generation process by searching over the space of all possible scenarios and identifying high-risk ones according to a specific cost factor. Note that we also want the scenarios to be physically plausible. Um, as, um, for example, if an adversary is really trying to chase the SDB and trying to hit it, it's not necessarily something we're going to see very often. Um, the rightmost figure here is going to show a reasonably high cost scenario. For simplicity, most previous works only consider a motion planning model that has access to the ground truth state of the actors in the scene. In this way, they only need to focus on modeling dangerous actor behaviors. Moreover, it is fast to generate and evaluate scenarios since the perception system is basically omitted. This overlooks the fact that many adversarial scenarios often involve actors that are hard to identify due to occlusion or have trajectory plans that can come uh, can be very you know, difficult to localize and forecast. Such issues in the perception and motion forecasting models can generate compounding errors that ultimately are going to cause the entire system to fail. To mitigate these issues, some other works test end-to-end image-based driving systems. However, the adversary scenarios here they generate are either generated at a small scale or with respect to simplify imitation learning models that do not reflect the autonomous systems that are used in models of driving vehicles in the industry. Additionally, they usually modify high-level actor behaviors or create physically unrealizable trajectories which lacks, lacks fine-grained control in modeling the actor behavior. Therefore, there is a need uh, for a scalable approach to identify physically plausible challenging scenarios starting from sensor data for modern autonomous systems. Starting from the later data matters since it allows, it's going to allow us to conduct end-to-end -end testing and training with those um, simulated scenarios. This table provides a summary of recent works. Most prior works generate the scenarios only for a handful of scene configurations and are adversarial only with respect to a planning model that takes ground truth actors um, as input. We propose a scalable approach um, to modify existing traffic scenarios uh, to cause full autonomy failures. Our approach tests the full autonomy system and generates over 4,000 unique adversarial scenarios. We frame the, um, the generation process as a, a worst case scenarios as a black box, black box adversarial attack. Um, we call our system adversarial C, and it works as follows. Given an existing scenario and its original sense of data, we're going to perturb the actor's trajectory in a physically plausible manner. Next, we're going to update the sense of data to take the actor perturbation into account. We then are going to evaluate the autonomous system on the modifier scenario, compute an adversarial objective, and update the proposed perturbation using a black box search algorithm. And as I said, it works uh, for any letter based autonomy style. It doesn't need to be differentiable, differentiable or anything like this. Adversarial CM's goal is to increase the risk of the autonomous system uh, uh, tau star uh, to actually do the wrong thing. Our adversarial objective consists of an imitation loss representing the deviation from the expert trajectory um, a safety cost to encourage collisions with other actors and traffic uh, and traffic loop uh, violations and comfort costs of the current autonomy plan to have lane violations and be dangerous. To ensure the realism of simulated behaviors, we parameterize the active behavior with a bicycle model and set physical constraints such as staying on the road and not colliding with other actors. Given the perturbations on the actor motions, we conduct realistic later simulation to accurately reflect the updated scene. The modified later history in the new input um, is a new input to the autonomy system. The video here shows that the generated scenes are realistic and match the desired perturbations. 
we now show a Vesoya sim uh, generated scenarios from the P3 autonomous system. We focus on an open loop uh, scenario evaluation um, setting, uh, or an open loop scenario evaluation setting um, in which the evaluation, uh, in, in which the evaluated autonomous system takes the past one second of the later data as input, and it's going to output five seconds of the trajectory plan. We're going to then unroll the five seconds um, uh, of our plan and the other actors' trajectories for these five seconds as well, and evaluate the autonomous system performance during the time horizon in an open loop setting. Um, the SDV is in blue, and the perturbed actors are highlighted in blue. Um, I have liked it in great. And a crossing pedestrian. In the five second trajectory output from the P3 system, the STV only moves forward a little. Adversin perturbs the initial states of the bus in red by moving it into the left lane. Now, the P3 autonomy system does not detect the pedestrian, and the STV's five second plan collides with it. To understand why the STV behaves as it does, we now show the forecasted occupancy visualizations of the P3 autonomy system. The occupancy for pedestrians is shown in light green. As we can see, the pedestrian is perceived as part of the bus's occupancy area, and hence the system misses the pedestrian detection. Here's another example. Originally, the blue STV lane changes smoothly to avoid the stationary bus in front. Adversin perturbs the bus to instead be reversing and blocking the road. Now, when the SDV attempts to lane change, it is rear-ended by a high-speed vehicle from behind. From the occupancy visualization, we can see the predicted bus occupancy blocks the whole lane. This causes the SDV to predict a dangerous large turn to avoid the bus, but does not properly account for traffic from behind. So the Brazil scene generates challenging scenarios for a wide, wide range of uh, state-of-the-art autonomous systems. As we can see, they uh, initially achieve a relatively low collision rate on natural real-world scenarios. We have imitation learning, you know, motion planner, PLT, as well as speaker. But with the Brazil scene, we increase the collision rate by over 200% compared to the original set. These challenging and physically plausible scenarios provide insights into how different autonomous systems compare and how they fail. Adversarial sim scenarios can also be used in autonomous systems trained to improve performance. We take here two pre-trained SOTA models, um, uh, PLT and P3, and fine-tune them on a data set augmented with adversarial sim scenarios. Robots training with adversarial sim generated the sense helps improve the performance in both the original and adversarial scenarios making the autonomous system much safer. So this is a great way to be able to generate adversarial scenarios and be able to incorporate extra robustness in any autonomous systems. So to conclude, we touch upon how to generate adversarials to identify vulnerabilities in the context of perception, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and the full autonomous system. We then show how we can use uh, this adversary is to improve the robustness of current cell driving systems. This is all for me today. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, that's all for the Professor Rokal's talk. Uh, let me share the screen here. For introducing our next speaker. Okay. Um, sorry. So, okay. So, our next speaker is Professor Luca Canoni. Professor Luca Canoni is the Charles Stark DARPA Assistant Professor in the MIT Department of Aeronautic and Astronautic 
and a principal investigator in the MIT Library for Information and Decision Systems. Professor Canoni's research interests include nonlinear estimation, numerical and distributed optimization, and probabilistic inference applied to sensing, perception, and decision making in single and multi multi robot systems. Uh, the talk, the title for the talk today is "Certifiably Robust Geometric Perception for Robots and Autonomous Vehicles." Uh, Luca, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Cheng, for the for the nice introduction. Um, I think at this point, you should be able to hear me, you should be able to see my slide, hopefully. Um, so it's a great pleasure uh, to be virtual at this workshop. I've been attending uh, most of the event. I really enjoyed the presentations. And um, for this presentation, I would like to tell you about the work in my lab about certifiably robust geometric perception for robots and autonomous vehicles. So um, this presentation is going to be quite different from the previous ones. and. Uh, the two main differences, I would say, is that uh, here there is a focus on geometric perception. We care about estimating poses and shapes in 3D. Um, and also there is this focus on uh, certification. We want to have some performance guarantees um, out of the result, out of the, of the estimate that, uh, that we produce. And also, rather than just developing um, more robust machine learning approaches, I would say what we do, a lot of what we do, is about um, uh, gaining robustness um, to failures of machine learning approaches. And we'll see in which sense that is. So maybe let me start with a single slide overview of my lab. I'm the director of the Spark Lab at MIT, Sensing, Perception, Autonomy, and Robot Kinetics Lab. And in the three columns of this slide, you see the three research areas we're working on. The first one is robust and certifiable perception, which is very close to the topic of this workshop. And in that area, we have a lot of history of working on uh, vision-based navigation, simultaneous localization and mapping, and this idea of certifiable algorithms that I'm going to discuss later in the presentation. A couple of other research areas I'm very excited about, I'm not going to talk about those in this presentation, are uh, high-level scene understanding, especially AI. Uh, check out like, you know, the work we are doing on Chimera and 3D dynamic scene graphs if you're interested. And we also have uh, work which is more robotic robotics related, including aerial manipulation or co-design of robotic platforms. But for today, we're going to see to this idea of robust and certifiable perception. Start by setting the stage about what is a certifiable algorithm and what is geometric perception. And then I'm going to touch um, and to give you the insights, I'm not too very, very, very deep into three uh, ways to get to design certifiable perception algorithms. First one is graduated and non-convexity. Second one is graph theoretic outlier pruning. And the last one is really optimality certification, which is the core of the idea of certifiable algorithms. Uh, before I even start, let me say like, you know, uh, the mastermind, the masterminds behind this work are really my students and postdoc. Hank, Pasquale, Jingnan, and Basquiz have been doing the hard work behind the slides I'm going to present. So let me start with this idea of uh, certifiable algorithms for geometric perception. And the way I want to introduce this idea is by starting with an example of geometric perception. Geometric perception is about estimating uh, geometric quantities such as rotations or poses. And the example I want to consider in good part of this presentation is uh, an example of geometric perception, which is image-based object localization. So what is image-based object localization? I give you an image, such as this one, and you have to detect the pose, to compute the pose of an object in the image, in this case, the car. And uh, it's a geometric perception problem because what we really care about is the geometry, is the pose of the 3D object of the vehicle, and potentially later on, we're also going to estimate the shape of the vehicle. So uh, a popular approach at the state of the art to do image-based object localization is to do this in two stages. The first one is to use the state of the art neural network to do feature detection and potentially description. And the neural network will typically, typically take the image and produce a number of uh, features which correspond to distinguishable points, semantic points in the image. For example, the wheels of the car, the headlights, the mirrors, and so on. And what is important to remember is that these points 
have a specific semantic meaning. They correspond to a specific portion of the car, either the wheels, uh, the mirrors, and so on. So stage one is about extracting features. Stage two is given a CAD model, for example, a geometric model of the object you want to detect, is to perform some model fitting and estimation to, try to compute the 3D pose of this uh, CAD model in order for this CAD model, CAD model to reproject at the correct location in the image. For example, here you see the silhouette in the uh, projected in 2D on the image. Or in other words, the CAD model, uh, we want to estimate the 3D pose of the CAD model in a way that is fitting as closely as possible the features that we detected in the, in the first step. So this is an example about image-based object localization. I want to open a, a small parenthesis. Um, first of all, let me mention that the first part is typically called perception front end. The last part is called perception back end. I want to open a parenthesis about generality because this idea of uh, doing feature detection and model fitting is common to many, many problems in robotics and computer vision. And a lot of the tools I'm going to discuss today are applicable to a bunch of different problems, which is pretty cool. So we said that uh, object localization in images can be done by feature detection and uh, model fitting. Object localization in point cloud, the same. We can do some feature detection and then we can do some model fitting, which is in this case called 3D registration to compute the pose of the object. And even problems which are very different, like simultaneous localization and mapping can be understood as a sensor front end, which is doing some feature estimation, feature detection, and some estimator, which is figuring out, for example, I don't know, the 3D map of the environment. What you have to remember really about this slide is that uh, uh, the idea of splitting into feature detection and estimation is very common across many perception problems. But let's go back to our running example on image-based object localization. And let me tell you what is the problem in practice? What is the issue? What, what we want to improve in practical applications? But in practical applications, you are given this image. You take the state-of-the-art neural network for feature detection. And the state-of-the-art can be like you know, a very fancy neural network. But at the end of the day, we produce a number of correct detections, which are the ones in green. For example, we'll detect the wheel of the car, the headlight. At the same time, we produce many misdetections, which are the one in red. These ones in red are either points which do not even belong to the car, or maybe they are misclassified. For example, if you say this point is the headlight, we are misclassifying that point. So the first issue that we want to solve or to be robust to is that the front end can take either traditional handcrafted features or deep learning features, can produce many misdetection, and it's not uncommon to have more than 90% uh, outliers, 90% of these misdetections. So indeed, the green ones are uh, what I'm going to call in liars. These are good detections, and the red ones are what I'm going to call outliers. The second issue is that uh, if you have too many outliers and we pass this to the second stage, which is the model fitting or estimation, the state of the art may again fail. For example, if you have too many red points here, we can end up estimating that the car is in this position represented by the yellow silhouette over here. And as humans, you can really see that, you know, that is not correct, it's not precise. So the issue number two is that the back end, the estimation part can fail if there are too many outliers. And in this presentation, um, contrary to most of the presentations so far, what I really want to tell you is how to make the, the estimation backend ultra robust, how to push the performance of the estimation backend. And for those of you working on machine learning, I will mention later on opportunities to, um, to improve deep network once I get this part right. And also there are just, uh, I'm going to discuss very general technical tools that possibly you can use and apply in other problems which are more learning based. So the first question I want to, to answer here is, I mentioned that in the presence of outliers, the state of the art in the backend will fail. And I want to tell you why. So why does the backend, the estimation problem fail in the presence of many outliers? Well, the cool thing is that uh, independently on the application that you deal with, object localization in images, object localization in point clouds, typically the backend at the end of the day is solving some sort of optimization problem. And the optimization problem will have some very general form, which is common across many, many perception problems. So the optimization problem will be similar to this one, uh, in which you want to compute the quantity of interest X, which is, for example, the estimate for the 3D pose of the car. And you're given a bunch of measurements, why? Uh, for example, this can be the feature detection in the image. 
and you want to compute the x in a way that minimizes a residual error. This is a given function which is measuring how well a given estimate is fitting a given measurement y. And of course, in practice, you will have many, many measurements. Typically, rather than just doing a squared norm of the residual, you would have a robust loss function, rho, and the shape of the cost function is designed to reduce the influence of outliers, which is really close to the, to the message of this presentation. So for example, you can take a rho, which is uh, a truncated least squares loss. The basic idea is that you want the cost function to be quadratic for small errors, such that you do some sort of least squares for, so for small errors, but you want the function to be close to flat for large errors, meaning that you don't want to give a lot of influence, a lot of importance to measurements with large errors, which are the outliers. So here we can choose the raw, for example, to be the truncated least squares loss, which is this function here. And the uh, issue, a nice way to summarize and to understand the limitations of the state of the art is to think that uh, if I choose raw to be a, functions like, a function like this, which is non-convex, it's called non-convex, um, the issue is that when I end up summing up a bunch of functions which are uh, uh, like this, I end up with a cost function, which again is non-convex. For those of you who don't know what is non-convex, it means uh, there are multiple minimum, multiple minima. And uh, the issue is that if I end up with an optimization problem which is non-convex, that is difficult to optimize. Uh, it is difficult for this problem to compute a global minimum. So if you have a good approach, which is computing the global minimum, you end up with a good estimate for the pose. But if you get stuck in one of these local minima, you get a completely like, you know, potentially wrong estimate like this one. And just to summarize, if I look at the state of the art, a good way to summarize the limitation is that the state of the art is essentially including either local solvers, which we start from initial guess and will do local optimization, but this can easily get stuck to local minima. So are likely to produce pictures like this or RANSAC, which is a very popular approach for, uh, for in computer vision, which is about sampling measurements. But again, for those of you who are familiar with RANSAC, RANSAC will still fail with many outliers and really like, you know, will work just for low dimensional problems. An issue which is underlying both local solvers and RANSAC is that uh, they will give an estimate, they will give you a post, no matter what. This post can be completely wrong and uh, the approaches will not tell you that it's wrong. And you can understand that this is a big problem. If you're doing uh, vehicle detection, for example, in self-driving car um, applications, we don't want very bad estimates of, uh, of the other objects um, uh, the camera is observing. So our goal is to move away from uh, like, you know, just the state of the art with these local solvers and RANSAC and to design this idea of certifiable algorithms. Certifiable algorithm is simply an algorithm which is solving this kind of robust estimation problems. And in particular, these are fast algorithms that not require any initial guess. So can detect the car without any initial guess about where the car is in the image, can solve this optimization problem to optimality in virtually all problem instances, or detect failure when unable to compute an optimal solution. So essentially, a certifiable algorithm is an algorithm that will either give you the optimal solution to this robust estimation problem, or will tell you if it is not able to get an optimal solution. Um, we have to, to add this kind of condition about detecting failures because it turns out that this problem is can be hard. So there are very worst case instances in which no fast algorithm will be able to get an optimal solution to this problem. But the good news is that uh, uh, they are very uh, uncommon in practice. We don't see instances that our algorithms are not able to solve to optimality. So the picture is this one, when an algorithm that either is getting to the bottom of this function and is certifying that this is the optimal solution, or if uh, we are stuck in a local minima, will tell us that uh, this is not the optimal solution. So this is the goal, getting certifiable algorithms. And I want to tell you about three ideas. I will not go in details like in you know, all, all of them, but I want to tell you about these three ideas which are building our toolbox for certifiable algorithms. Not all of them are actually certifiable, but I will give you the, the big picture about certifiability at the end. So let me start with the, with the idea of graduated non-convexity as a first approach in our toolbox of robust estimation. Well, again, we want to solve to global optimality this cost function. We want to minimize this cost function. And the first thing that, uh, the first insight that we have, and uh, it's something that is very cool you should know about, is that uh, if you look back 
and the 90s, there is a very cool theorem from Black and Ragarajan saying that actually you can reformulate this optimization problem into a second optimization problem in which you include binary variables. So actually, you include variables in 0, 1, and are these variables theta. So the theorem is saying informally we can rewrite common robust loss function by adding auxiliary variables theta, one for each measurement. And this is what is called an outlier process. So why is this a cool thing to do? First of all, the theta is kind of representing the confidence that we have in the measurement. If theta gets closer to one, it means that we consider that measurement an outlier. If theta is close to zero, it means that we want to reject that measurement as an outlier. And the cool thing here, a second cool thing is that uh, despite the weird shape of this loss function rock and the potentially weird loss function, we end up through this black Ragarajan duality, we end up in uh, this form in which the X is also always showing up as a quadratic residual multiplied by our confident, uh, confidence weight theta, plus another function which is uh, just depending on theta. So the structure of this function is a little bit nicer to play with. So let me give an example for the loss function I mentioned before, which is called a truncated least square cost function. The cost function is uh, quadratic and then gets flat. And you can write the corresponding row as a pointwise point -wise minimum between a constant C bar square and a quadratic function. And using black ragarajan duality, you can just rewrite uh, this cost function in something that has a bunch of like, you know, weights theta. And I guess, a good way to interpret like, you know, this optimization problem is that this optimization problem is trying this, at the same time uh, to classify in liars and outliers using the, the weights theta. At the same time, it's trying to figure out the optimal estimate uh, x. So it's trying to do both estimation and classification of in liars and outliers. So this idea of black regression duality is cool, but the, way, the reason why I'm introducing it is that uh, it leads to a very nice way, a very simple way to attempt to optimize this cost function. So now that we have um, the theta, the weight theta, and we have the other variable x, a very natural approach to optimize this cost function is just to do some alternating optimization. We optimize for x, keeping the theta fixed, and then we optimize for theta, keeping the x fixed. Why is this a good idea? Well, uh, alternating this, it turns out that uh, the two sub problems we have to solve when doing the alternating optimization are very easy to solve. So once we do the variable update, which is fixing the weights and optimizing for the variable uh, X, it turns out that uh, if you fix the theta in this cost function, this becomes just a least square problem, which is typically easy to solve. So you, you have out of the off the shelf tools to solve these optimization problems. And uh, um, so the variable update in which you fix the theta and optimize for the x is easy to solve. And at the same time, when you want to uh, fix the variable x and optimize for the theta, this, by the way, should say weight update, it turns out that you can solve for the theta in closed form because it's just split into scalar optimization problems, which are very easy to solve. So this is a very simple idea. You just do alternating minimization. The issue with that is that you didn't get rid of the problem of local minima. You're still, uh, and this in practice, still gets stuck into local, local minima. This brings me to the first idea, which is building on top of this idea of alternating minimization, but is getting rid or mitigating this issue of convergence local minima. And this idea is what is called graduated non-convexity. So let me give you the bottom line of graduated non-convexity. The problem that we faced in the previous slide is that we're trying to optimize functions which are non-convex. And this is leading our alternating minimization scheme to get stuck in bad solutions. And the idea of graduated non-convexity is really to start from a convex approximation of the function, something that has uh, a nicer shape, which is, which is convex, optimize this convex approximation of the function, and then at each iteration, reintroduce a little bit of the non-convexity and optimize at each iteration till eventually you recover the original non-convex cost function. So let me say this uh, one more time. Um, the idea of graduated non-convex is to start from a convex approximation of the cost function and to gradually increase the non-convexity until you recover the original non-convex cost. It's a very old idea. We do an application in new problems of 3D perception but actually, this idea goes back to the 90s and has been used in early vision problems for, uh, for example, surface reconstruction. 
So um, let me give you, I don't want to get into the details of the algorithm, but let me tell you again, like, you know, how this graduated and non-convexity algorithm works. Again, the idea is that you want to optimize a non-convex cost function. And remember that I'm visualizing this as a one-dimensional function just for simplicity, but these are actually very high-dimensional functions. So the idea of graduated non-convexity is to uh, start from a convex approximation of the function. And in particular, what graduated non-convexity does is to rewrite uh, a different cost function, which is function of a parameter mu, such that for mu equal to zero, this cost function becomes convex. And for mu going to infinity, this cost function becomes exactly the non-convex cost function that we want to optimize. So graduated non-convexity will start at mu close to zero, for which the function is convex. We'll optimize uh, for mu close to zero. And then we'll move to the next iteration in which we'll increase the mu a little bit, which is giving a slightly more convex shape, more non-convex shape. And you will optimize again. And you keep doing that until eventually you get to a very large mu in which you recover essentially your original cost. This is the algorithmic presentation. I guess you initialize all weights to zero, uh, to one to start with. And then you alternate this uh, weight update and variable update that, as I was saying before, they can be computed very easily. They're, they're nice, like, you know, simple solution for those. The only difference with respect to our alternating minimization scheme is that we, at each iteration, we also increase the non-convexity using this parameter mu. Uh, if you don't like the 1D visualization, I think uh, our student has also produced this nice like, you know, 2D visualization. You want to optimize this non-convex cost function in which you have a bunch of like, you know, bodies so that it's non-convex. And what you do in graduate and non-convex is to start from a convex approximation, and then at each iteration, you make it more and more non-convex, till eventually you have optimized the given non-convex cost function. So this is the idea I want to tell you, like, you know, how nicely this idea works in practice. And I will go exactly back to this problem of object localization in images. So this is a CVPR paper that we proposed in uh, 2020. Uh, is about using graduate and non-convexity for, uh, for estimating the 3D pose and the shape of objects seen in the image, exactly the motivating example we started from. So the mat that you see here is the truncated least square. That's exactly the same mat that I was showing in previous slides. Of course, you know, for each problem, you have to consider the specific expression of the residual error that in the case of image-based object localization gets a little bit complicated. I don't want to go into the details, but the basic idea is that the residual error is measuring how well you're able to fit the feature detection into D by projecting a 3D model. And this 3D model, you can imagine that is even like, you know, either a single CAD model or a collection of CAD models of different cars. And again, I will not get into too many details there. So let me get into the performance, like, you know, how well this works in practice. Uh, we have been testing these into vehicle detection problem of standard data sets using hundreds of CAD images for which the CAD model was, uh, was given. And we started testing the case in which uh, you have a single CAD model that you want to fit to the image. And I will start with qualitative results in which, uh, in this case, you have 70% outliers. You compare state of the art from uh, CVPR or you compare even Ransack. And you can see that the state of the art for large number of outliers essentially is getting a bad estimate, while shape sharp, which is this algorithm we propose based on graduated and non-convexity, is getting like you know, the right estimate of the location of the car. We've been testing these also in the case in which not only we estimate the pose of the car, but we also estimate the 3D shape of the car. And I would say this single image is summarizing very well the experimental results in the paper. If you have low level of outliers, let's say 40%, everything that uses the state of the art, like you know, these are um, previous CVPR papers, everything that you find in the state of the art and the proposed approach will work. But if you move to large numbers of outliers, like 70%, the state of the art will start failing, while shape sharp, the proposed approach will still be there and will still work. And of course, we have plenty of like, you know, quantitative results telling that shape sharp and graduated and non-convexity can essentially boost um, the robustness to a larger number of outliers. And remember that when we estimate pose and shape for the card, we cannot use approaches like Ransack because there is no uh, solver that we can include in Ransack. 
We've been getting this, uh, this kind of results in which ShapeShark is more robust in vehicle detection problems. We've been testing even in space application for uh, satellite pose and shape estimation. Um, take a look at uh, the CVPR and NeurIPS paper from last year if you're curious about the results. Um, we've been testing also this idea of graduated and non-convexity for a very different problem, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. I will not tell you uh, too much about this, but essentially the idea is that we use uh, this graduated and non-convexity to figure out the trajectory of the robot from relative measurements. And given the trajectory, it will be the 3D map of the environment. And uh, the animation is showing for different graduation of uh, different iterations of graduated and non-convexity how we can recover the right trajectory of the robot and the right, you know, nice 3D map of the environment. Um, these, of course, you know, supported by a bunch of like, you know, ablation studies and statistics across standard benchmarking data sets in which graded and non-convexity at this point is the state of the art in robust simultaneous localization and mapping. And uh, you pay a little bit of a computational price uh, to boost the robustness uh, using graded and non-convexity. But the nice thing is that uh, the computational time is constant independently on the number of mesh, on the number of outliers. So um, you still have to invest a couple of seconds, but you get a boost in robustness compared to the state of the art. So as a summary, we've been showing that this idea of graduated non-convexity can be, there is something that goes back to early vision, can be adapted to a number of uh, 3D geometric perception problems and is uh, giving you huge robustness to outliers across many applications, including object detection and simultaneous localization and mapping. And we can be robust to this percentage, very large percentage of outliers, which is pretty, like, you know, um, pretty cool to see. Um, Gradual non convexity does not need an initial guess for the, est for the variable you want to estimate, uh, does not need a minimal solver as opposed to RANSAC, and we have a bunch of open source implementations available in both MATLAB and GTSM, which is a library for, uh, for geometric estimation. So let me move on. Again, I will not go into the details for the next two um, topics, but I want to tell you a little bit about this idea of graph theoretic pruning and the optimality certification. And uh, the main motivation that led us to investigate graph theoretic outlier pruning is, can we boost further the robustness of GNC? GNC is getting us to, to be robust to 70, 80, 90% of outliers. Can we be robust to more, even more outliers? And uh, the basic insight is that uh, we can, if we're given a bunch of measurements, we can reason in terms of, uh, we can look at measurements which are mutually incompatible and we can discard those as outliers. I want to give you just one slight intuition about this idea of, uh, of uh, graph theoretic outlier pruning. And I will use, again, object detection in RGBD images to, to tell you the intuition here. So let's say that we have an RGBD image. Let's say that our neural network is detecting a bunch of features in the image, for example, the wheels of the car. And there are, of course, a bunch of outliers in green and a bunch of outliers in red. Well, if you look at the distance within these features, I mean, this wheel and this wheel are close enough to be wheels on the same car. But somehow, if you look at the distance between this wheel and this other wheel, they do not, they cannot belong to the same car because you know the size of the car. So physically, it's not possible for this measurement and this measurement to belong to the same car. So you can do this kind of uh, pairwise comparisons and build a graph of compatibility in which uh, each node in the graph is uh, a feature that you detected. And there is an age between two nodes if uh, the two features are, uh, are mutually compatible. They can be good detections together. And what we show is that by doing a maximum click computation on this graph, you can uh, prune a large number of outliers just by looking for the largest set of uh, mutually compatible uh, measurements. This is something that we call Robin, uh, reject outliers based on invariance. It's something that we propose at TICRA this year and as we will show, like, you know, in the, in the next couple of slides, we're able to boost the bus robustness of uh, uh, GNC beyond, like, you know, 90, 95% outliers, which I believe is pretty impressive. And the theory behind this uh, graph uh, outlier rejection is pretty general. So you will see, like, you know, a very nice mathematical formulation in the paper. What I want to do here, rather than giving like you know, the technical details, I want to jump about how well these techniques are working in practice. And I will do this considering a second problem, which is object localization in point clouds, no longer images, but point clouds. 
Tzer++ is uh, the algorithm that we proposed, which is essentially the graph theoretic outlier rejection plus graduated non-convexity. And we are testing this on a standard RGBD data set in which the goal is to detect objects. For example, here we have a large point cloud in which we have to detect the serial box. And these are qualitative results showing that Tzer++ in the presence of large outliers in the feature detections, many outliers in the feature detections, can still detect the correct location of the serial box. And I think the qu quantitative results are even more impressive. Here, what I'm showing is uh, the localization error. So the lower, the better for increasing levels of outliers. And look at, at the right hand side here, I have problems with 99% of outliers. So all the measurements, most of the measurements that I fit to the estimator are wrong, just 1% is correct. And I compare, like, you know, teaser plus plus, we compare teaser plus plus, which is the proposed method against the state of the art. And even if you're at, let Ransack run for an entire minute, and 99% outliers, Ransack will still fail, is this uh, one in magenta, while the teaser plus plus, which is the approach we propose, will get a nice, like, you know, uh, localization, which is accurate up to centimeters. And the nice thing is that teaser plus plus is running in 20 milliseconds. So, can beat Ransack even after, after Ransack is running for one minute, and instead Tizer++ is running in milliseconds. Beside object localization problem, we apply Tizer++ also to point cloud uh, alignment, point cloud registration problems. I will not go into the details of this slide. I will not have too much time. But I think the, the most important part of this slide is that we have released a very efficient C++ open source implementation on GitHub. So if you are curious about these problems of uh, object localization in point clouds, um, just check it out and feel free to, to use it and let us know uh, your experience. Um, we, I will not mention too much, but we have done also recently an extension of a teaser plus plus to category level perception in which rather than searching for a specific car, you have a library of potential cars. And we have been showing that uh, we can extend this idea of uh, graph theoretic outlier rejection and graduated non-convexity to these category level perception problems and still get a robust pose and shape estimate for the object we want to detect. I will not mention these um, will be presented, I think, in a couple of weeks at RSS if you're interested. So in the interest of time, I will jump to the optimality certification, which I believe is the most interesting and mathematically deep part uh, and I will try to give you like you know, a few minute pitch of this idea. Well, I built this presentation around the idea of certifiable algorithms in which uh, the idea is that you get algorithms that are either producing the optimal solution to this uh, optimization problem or are able to detect failures. But I really didn't tell you how to do that. And this, this is really like you know, what this part is focusing on. And um, so starting like over the couple, like, you know, over the last two years, and I think most of the results are summarized in our new RIPS paper in 2020, we have been developing a fairly general theory about how to certify optimality of a given estimate in this kind of robust estimation problem. In other words, you give me an estimate that you can use, you can compute using a graduate and non-convexity, RANSAC, or any other technique, and we will tell you if this estimate is globally optimal for the optimization problem or not which is something difficult to tell because the problem is non-complex. So the bottom line here is, uh, is what we do is to um, again start with this robust estimation framework using uh, a truncated least square cost function. We show that uh, in general, we can convert in many perception problems, we can convert this optimization problem into a polynomial optimization problem in which the cost function is a polynomial and the constraints are polynomial. And then we show that this polynomial optimization problem can be relaxed into a convex semi-definite program. A um, lot of mathematical details there. I think what is important is that uh, we have results such as if the estimate that you give me, the estimate x, is optimal for the convex relaxation, then we can prove that it is also optimal for the original robust estimation problem. And what we really gained here is that uh, checking if an estimate is optimal for the convex relaxation can be done in polynomial time, something that we can do efficiently. And also, like you know, by doing this kind of work, we provided a very systematic way to relax these robust estimation problems into convex problems, 
uh, building on top of a very general theory, which is called moment relaxation from Lasserre. Okay, so um, we do more than that. We also provide kind of what we call estimation contracts, which are about establishing when these optimization algorithms are supposed to return an estimate which is close to the ground truth and when they're not supposed to give a good estimate. But check out the papers for the details. Um, I want to spend one slide just summarizing. What I told you is that a uh, um, lot of perception problems in the back end will have some sort of robust estimation problem that you have to solve. I told you about uh, graph theoretic outlier pruning, which is getting rid of gross outliers in the measurements. And I told you about uh, um, reinventing or you know, re revamping this idea of graduated and non-convexity as a way to get a robust estimate. And this new idea of performing certification. So checking if the estimate, for example, from GNC is optimal or otherwise discarding bad estimate as suboptimal, which is something that we can do using a convex relaxation. Something that I didn't mention is that this theory of convex relaxation actually allows shortcutting the entire thing. So instead of having this very complex pipeline, we can just solve a single convex optimization problem. The issue with that is that I tell you, but you know, I tell you about this, uh, this convex optimization approach, but this in practice is fairly slow. So this may be practical like you know, in uh, 10, 15 years, but right now, like you know, it's much faster to just apply the heuristics uh, rather than non-convex than Robin and then do the certification a posteriori, which is faster than solving the optimization problem. Um, I think I will stop here um, and I will uh, just go to the conclusions, uh, telling you that this talk is about presenting new opportunities to improve robust estimation techniques for perception, uh, building on this idea of certifiable algorithms that can either solve to optimality these robust estimation problems or can tell you if they are giving a poor estimate. I presented these ideas of graduated and non-convexity, graph theoretic applied pruning and certification, and I invite you to look at the papers for all the details. And of course, there are many, many other questions about you know, certifying the machine learning front ends, getting a certification for the entire perception system rather than a single algorithm. There is much more work to be done. This being said, I will uh, thank the sponsors like, you know, for supporting this work. I will thank again the students and postdocs doing the heavy lifting behind these, uh, um, uh, these slides and just thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Luca, for, for your talk. Uh, any questions? Oh, hi. Um, I, have, uh, I have a general question. Um, because we know that uh, the deep uh, deep CNN model can um, capture very um, very good future for uh, image classification, but for the um, ge geometry um, perspective, does the deep CNN model really outperform the handcraft uh, approach in this area, like it did in um, image classification? Typically, like, you know, if you're talking about the perception front end for yes. uh, the estimation, yes. typically, yes, like, you know, the, the deep learning based approaches will be the state of the art there. Uh, just because you do not have to estimate, you do not have to extract um, just features such as surf or, uh, or okay. features, you have to extract these semantic features. So for those, like, you know, the training part of deep networks will be much more effective. Okay. And my, uh, sorry, my second um, uh, question will be the, um, uh, what kind of model structure do you use in the uh, front end? Uh, and also, the, does the um, architecture of the model you used for the front end will influence a lot for the uh, certification um, performance in the back end? It's a good question. I think we try to be as agnostic as we can to the, to the front end. Um, for different problems, of course, we use different networks. For example, for the, um, uh, for the vehicle localization part, we use uh, GSNet, which is a very like, you know, nice uh, feature detec uh, detector for vehicles. But uh, in each application, we use something different. For example, 3D point clouds, we use something that's called SmoothNet. We try to be agnostic to that. Really, um, the results that we propose about uh, um, um, these estimation contracts that we propose are about saying, is the front end producing enough in layers or not? But we don't care what is in the front end. Okay, thank you so much. I think Rama can I have like, you know, a question. 
<laughs> I enjoyed your talk. I'm happy to see GNC is having some views. As you know, GNC came from Blake and Zisserman in the late 80s, oh, yeah, for yeah. thin plate model, and they actually had convergence. So we extended that for Markov random fields and set it up in a pyramidal framework, 1989 SMC paper, December, November, 1989. More importantly, Anand Rangarajan was my student at USC. So he and I, we have a paper at ICPR 1990, generalized to GNC. So you may want to take a look at it. It's a Atlantic City, ICPR. We were supposed to do it in Beijing and they moved it. Anyway, there was a computer vision track. And Anand, of course, brought a lot of ideas from physics. So there is adiabatic approximation and all that stuff. It's a very nice paper for, a, you know, it could have been a journal paper. We didn't do that. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I was very happy. I, I'm happy I tuned into your talk. It brought a lot of <laughs> happiness and old memories. We used to love GNC. Yeah. Um, thanks for uh, yeah yeah. Thanks for the point there. We give full credits. Like you know, we're not claiming to be inventing. No no no. no. That's it's not why. I just um you know happy that something from the old 1989 etc. is coming back again. It's it's good. Yeah. Works extremely, extremely well in particular in Islam. It works extremely well. Something that uh, it's uh, it's uh, merging like you know all the insights from GNC with new insights, which I think I do not have time to discuss in the, this kind of presentation because it's a little bit too detailed. Is that uh, in GNC when you have to do the variable update, when you have to solve for the for the non-linear least square right. problem. Right. That is a tough problem to solve in general. But uh, so what a lot of what we do is also to develop. Um, what we call non-minimal solvers based on convex relaxation to solve this inner loop. And I think that is what is uh, um, uh, amplifying the, the impact of GNC and is allowing to, yeah. to use GNC right. also in applications like, you know, for example, pose and shape estimation. But yes, on the robust right. side, we are just discovered, we just discovered a beautiful tool. Like, you know, we're not doing right. that. Yeah. I, I sent an email to Anand that his work is being discussed by you. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, thanks for the feedback. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, if no, uh, we can move to the next one. But thanks, Luca, for this great presentation. Uh, our last one will be the video by Professor Alan Yu. Uh, professor Allen Yu is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins with appointments at both Cognitive Science and Computer Science. Uh, Dr. Yu completed his PhD degree in theoretical physics at uh, uh, Cambridge University supervised by Stephen Hawking. His computer vision research has been widely recognized and cited, winning several binomial prizes, including Mar Prize. Uh, due to some family reasons, Professor Yu will not be uh, with us in person for today's lecture, but I hope you guys enjoyed this pre-recorded video. Okay. Oh, so I <coughs> uh, just want to check. You guys can see the screen, right? Yes, we can yes. see. Okay, cool. So let me keep going. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to speak at this tutorial. Uh, so my topic is going to be on robust object detection under occlusion with compositional generative networks. Now, there's some underlying motivation here, which is a topic I've been thinking and worrying about for some time. And basically, it's that we need tougher tests for computer vision algorithms. That standard performance measures that we test algorithms on finite size balanced annotated data sets, BAD for short, um, have half the data used for training, half for testing, um, that these are problematic, partly because data sets are biased, they underrepresent rare but important events, and more generally finite size data sets are unable to capture the combinatorial complexity of the real world. And there's an opinion paper I've written with Cheng Shi Li uh, mentioned at the bottom, which goes into this in more detail. So this argument is that we need tougher tests that can quantify AI vision algorithms more accurately, and these include out-of-distribution testing, where the algorithm is tested from data that has different statistical properties in the training data, and two adversarial examiners 
where the examiners select images adaptively to search for the weaknesses of the algorithms. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you uh, examples of both types of testing out of distribution adversarial examiners and a method for dealing with them. So here was a little bit more detail on standard performance measures, the sort of simplest possible formulation. So the underlying theory says that there's an unknown distribution P of X, Y, where X is the input, Y is the output, so this could be classifying an object or something like that, any other task. And our goal is to find a classifier, Y, which is some function of X and some parameter theta, so this could be a deep net, uh, generally will be a deep network, doesn't have to be one, and theta would correspond to the weights. There's a loss function, the cost of making mistakes, and the assumption that is also we have training samples, X train, which are a set of examples, N in this case, and testing samples, X test, and you train the classifier to minimize the loss on the training set, and you evaluate the performance on the test set. And there's a sufficient training data in terms of the amount of complexity of the classifiers and good performance on the training set will imply good performance on the testing set. Uh, of course, you have to check this by, uh, you know, by evaluating on the test set and showing you haven't overfit the data or something. In any case, there's underlying mathematical analysis, VC pack theory, which shows the classifiers will almost certainly generalize to any data that's sampled from P of X, Y. So this is a nice, very nice theory, very useful, but as we argued, um, this type of approach is problematic and tougher tests than necessary. So here is an example of out of distribution testing, um, and a toy example, which is going to give away the main point of what I'm going to say in this talk. So suppose the training data is generated from some distribution P of X, Y, which again you don't know, but potentially you can learn by training. But the test data, on the other hand, is generated from a combination of P of X, Y plus some other unknown distribution Q of X, Y. So uh, here, a very simple form, what we're going to discuss later on is more complex than this, but this gives you the rough idea. So uh, if epsilon is small, then classifiers trained on data from P of X, Y may still have good performance on data from 1 minus epsilon P of X, Y, so they may well generalize to that. But if uh, performance will surely suffer if epsilon becomes big a lot bigger. So how to address this. So the solution is to go back to rather old-fashioned methods which are perhaps Bayesian generative models. So instead of learning the classifiers, you know, which is learning to estimate y from x, instead you learn probability distributions, p of x, p of the data given y, and p of y from the training set. Then this extra thing, q of x, y, can be estimated using other data altogether. Then Bayes generative models give you a way to combine these estimate these methods so that you can estimate why when the data comes from this combined uh, distribution. So this is an example of out of distribution. You're trained mainly on P of X, Y. You've got some other data from another source which is sort of essentially contaminates it, uh, but you want to uh, develop algorithms that can work into these set circumstances. Okay, so here are the compositional generative networks, which are the technical method that we're going to employ to do this. So they're generative models of deep network convolutional features. They have a standard deep network backbone, but they replace the discriminative head by a generative model. Why generative? They have knowledge of the generation process, um, they know, for example, objects can be seen from different viewpoints and have different spatial patterns for each viewpoint. I mean, they know this, they are not given that information about viewpoints, they're not given additional annotations. They can learn that, however. And also, in the particular example, they know that parts of objects are invisible because they're occluded. And so we're going to test deep nets and CGNs for occluded objects out of distribution testing 
and then from robustness to patch attacks, which are type of adversarial examiner. So, so now generalization to occlusion out of distribution. So when you train algorithms to do classify objects or even to detect them, um, you're usually training on data where there isn't very much occlusion. But uh, objects are typically occluded. Here are examples, cars occluded by trees, by frisbees, and so on. And so occlusion happens. And occlusion may is typically not in the data set, training data set. It's not in it, you know, it's in it to some extent, but not seriously. Okay. Now, also, the occluders are highly variable in terms of shape and texture, so there's sort of an exponentially complex way in which you can occlude, uh, occlude the data, to occlude the, the objects. And now, is this a fundamental limitation of deep nets? So generally, deep, deep nets do not generalize well when trained with non-occluded data. I mean, their performance isn't terrible, but um, it's nowhere near performance when there's no occlusion. This is the occlusion area, 0%, 30%, 50%, 70%. 70%, 70% is fairly significantly occluded, but a human will look at these images and performance will be way over 90%, almost 99%. And this amount of occlusion is a little bit like my parameter epsilon that I mentioned earlier in the toy model. Now, of course, with deep nets, you, the next thing you think of is, okay, let's train with a lot of augmentated data, and it's better, but still not good enough. So you train with, say, five times as much data, and the performance, you know, it gets better when the exclusion comes up, but it's still not perfect. Uh, it's nowhere near the performance uh, it is when there's no occlusion. So a generative, here we do comp nets, a generative model of neural feature activation. So we take the convolutional layers, uh, which extract wonderful features, which were invariant to details of objects you don't care about, and you have a fully connected classification head at the top. So you get rid of the classification head, you keep the feature vectors here. Then what you do is you train generative models, probability distributions of objects um, generating these feature vectors that you've got from the top part of that de uh, deep network backbone. For each object, you allow class mixtures, which will typically correspond to several different viewpoints. Uh, and then for each of those, uh, they will generate certain feature vectors that we call VCMF kernels that relate to the feature vectors here. So probability distribution of given the object there's a probability distribution of which class mixture you have, then probability distribution of the feature kernels, which are going to correspond, roughly speaking, to parts of the object, correspond to the features. Okay, so this is a high-level picture, a probability generative model with the arrows going from the objects to the mixtures to the kernels to F. Okay, now here's a bit of the mathematics of it. I don't expect anyone to quite follow this uh, from one slide, but if you're interested, uh, later on, I hope you'll see the PowerPoints and you can check them out. So the distributions are fairly simple. There's a distribution of the feature vectors conditioned on the mixtures. Then uh, those, uh, so that's indexed by M. Then there's a probability of the features indexed by uh, at each position, which is factorizable to make it very easy. And then at each position, this is a mixture of distributions on the feature kernels. This is a bit like a mixture of Gaussian distributions over feature responses. In fact, since the feature responses are normalized to have unit norm, this becomes a, mi a mixture of von Mies-Fischer distributions. Uh, a von Mies-Fischer distribution is essentially a Gaussian on sphere. So the generative models take this form. You have to learn various parameters for them. Um, but the point of the slide is that these are fairly simple and they are going to be sufficient. So once you've got that generative model, which you learn, and I'll say a little bit about that in a minute or so, then if you want to classify the object, you take the image, you take the features, you calculate 
the kernels, etc., and you take the class scores and find the object with mixture, class mixture that has biggest uh, score. Now, because of the nature of the generative models, this computation can be done in a, bot in a modified feed-forward network, which is a bit similar to a deep network. Well, it's exactly the same as a deep network up to here. Above here, the computations are somewhat different, but they're not significantly, you know, different. So to, f to classify the object, you just do this. Feed forward very fast. Okay, here again are the mathematics of it, which again, point is just to show these are fairly simple, and you can check those out uh, later if you are interested. Okay, so now to learn the models, you are learning a generative model of the feature vectors, uh, condition on the objects, class mixtures. These are class mixtures are learnt uh, while you're training, so you do not know anything about them. You don't know about the parts of the objects or the viewpoints. Uh, you just know that there can be several different class mixtures for the objects. Um, it's a bit similar to the formable part models that people may recall as being state-of-the-art before deep networks. And this learning corresponds to minimizing an overall cost function, and it's done by a combination uh, of two types of algorithms. One type is uh, learning by differentiation, which would be like backpropagation. The other one is by clustering, clustering to find the class mixtures and the VMF kernels. Okay, so the learning is uh, rather di a bit different from a deep network, but again, it follows the same principle that you have a loss function you want to minimize it, um, but in this case, you minimize it by backpropagation and clustering. Okay, now a little bit of interpretability here, which is perhaps not the main part of the point, but makes these models perhaps a little bit easier to understand. The VMF kernels, which are learned by clustering from the feature vectors, resemble part detectors. So if you take one of the VMF kernels and see what sorts of image regions excite it, you find that one kernel likes the engines of airplanes, another kernel likes uh, side windows of airplanes, another kernel likes the seat of bicycles, another one likes the front part of bikes. So these are, um, you can quantify this, and the quantifications are actually reasonably good, I would say significantly better than any other method that we compared it to in the papers, um, but it's not quite as good as it would be for a human uh, if you take the highest possible standards. Anyway, this just says VMF kernels re resemble part detectors. Class mixtures um, represent different viewpoint configurations of the object. So this example here uh, for the bicycle, uh, one is bicycle going in one direction, second is a tandem bicycle, third is a bicycle seen from one viewpoint, and fourth is a bicycle seen from another. And again, I have to stress again, no extra supervision on this. These come out from uh, purely clustering, um, in addition to back propagation to learning the models. So this gives you a type of model where for each object, you predict the viewpoint. The viewpoint could be, for the bikes, is one of these, and then for these, it predicts with the class kernels that there will be feature vectors here that are somewhat like the front parts of the bike, uh, and feature vectors over here that are somewhat like back parts of the bike. Okay, now, this model is just a generative model, and this would be, uh, and if we go back to the toy example earlier, what we've done is we've got training samples from the object model unoccluded, and they're drawn from some distribution P of X, Y, and we use them to learn this distribution. In fact, we learn, use them to learn a distribution of P of X, the feature vectors in this case, conditioned on Y, the objects. Now, however, this is not, so far, this is not going to help us deal with occlusion. So now, we're going to say, suppose the test data is not drawn from P of X, Y, it's drawn from 1 minus epsilon P of X, Y, plus epsilon Q of X, Y. Now, Q of X, Y here is analogous to occlusion. I say analogous because the distributions for occlusion, the distribution is more complex than this, 
and I'm going to get into it in a few minutes, uh, but this is to give you the rough idea. There were two distributions involved, one for the objects not under occlusion, the second one is going to be for occlusion itself. Now the key point really is that P of X, Y, the distribution of the objects, can be learnt completely independently, separately from P, from Q of X, Y. Q of X, Y for the occlusions can be learnt, and we do it in a very simple manner, and it doesn't require uh, any, any annotated data, essentially. So we can learn both these distributions separately, and we can use Bayesian methods to combine them together so that we can do inference on data that comes from this, uh, this type of distribution. Now it's a simplification, the full model is now presented. So what we do is we take our model that we had already, which we learned on the original distribution, unoccluded P of X, Y, object class generates class mixtures with certain probabilities. These class mixtures generate a spatial pattern of VMF kernels that correspond to feature vectors of the deep network. So that's the original model. Now we say that there's a probability that some of the feature vectors here are generated not by the objects and their class mixtures, but by an occlusion kernel. So this would be analogous to the Q of X, Y. So this means we, we can deal with out of distribution. We have a generative model here, which says that, you know, most of the data, you know, we expect most of the data to be generated by one of the object models with one of the mixture components, but there's a possibility that some of it's generated by this other um, outlier model corresponding to Q of X. Now, to do it here in the more formal model, we have a variable ZP of M, P is the position, and ZP is a variable that if it takes value 1, uh, the model will be generated from uh, a particular object. If it takes value 0, then it's generated by the occluded kernel. And so this is a variable that allows us to automatically select when we're doing inference, deciding whether a particular feature vector is, is obtained from an occluded kernel, i.e. is occlusion, or from a class mixture. Um, so when we do inference, this is now a little bit more complex than inference on the first model we have, because in this model we have to also estimate uh, this variable ZP. But that's a very simple variable, so it's straightforward to do it. So now we've got a, a way of combining, we were able to deal with a certain amount of, of out of distribution, in this case to deal with occluders, because we got a generative model for the objects, and we've got a generative model for the occluders, which we learn separately, and we can combine them together, and it will work on this combination where the data is gen where the objects are partially occluded. So the occluder model, as I said, is learned separately. It's very easy. We don't even need to have any annotation for it. We just say that the occluder model is a probability that the feature vector is generated by any sort of any patch that we get in the in the image. So it means that we do not need to know anything, uh, anything to train, you know, anything on it. We can just get a set of images. I mean, it has to be a reasonably representative set, and then we just learn the model directly from this. Okay, it's got no spatial structure or anything like it. So two distributions: one distribution of what the of the generative model of the object, if there's no occlusion, um, and then this other distribution of the occlusion. We combine them together, that means that essentially when we're running the algorithm they're going to sort of compete at each point here to explain the data. Is it going to come from one of the object models with one of the class mixtures or will it be generated by one of the occluded kernels? Um, this trick is actually a reasonably old trick method. It's known in statisticians. Uh, and people were doing it in computer vision and machine learning in the 1990s, at least. I had at least two papers doing this type of thing. One was a form of robust PCA, another one was doing edge detection. Um, but anyway, it's a fairly standard idea in probability theory. It does mean it's something you can do if you think in terms of having Bayesian modeling, generative models of the data, and if you think 
uh, you know, which are admittedly somewhat out of fashion, but if you think of having the opposite, uh, deep networks, discriminative models, where you're training to estimate the, um, estimate the uh, output directly, you're not learning a generative model, then it's not so easy to introduce occluders. Okay, so that would be occlusion model. So what happens? This gives us uh, essentially a, a form of competition between the object and the occluder and the outlier models. So uh, for this image here, the object models are searching over all of the possible objects they represent. Uh, and it's probably going to decide cars seen from the side, most likely. At the same time, and that model is going to compete with all the other models of airplane from different angles, etc., or cars from a different viewpoint. Uh, and it's also competing with a, with this outlier model, says the probability of the features are generated by some occlusion process. So if we do that, and if you remember, Z is a variable that decides whether the data at a particular point comes from the object model or from the occluder. This is what Z is on this image. And so you see that it thinks that uh, there is an occluder over here, which is clearly the tree. There is a vertical bar here, which it also thinks is occluder. There's a human here, which it also thinks more or less is occluder, etc. So this means you can also essentially sort of localize where the occluders are as well as uh, estimating, uh, you know, as well as classifying the object and estimating its mixture class. And so you can evaluate this in various ways. You can uh, put occluders in by hand, synthetically of various sorts, uh, you know, just white patches. Models find it quite easy to deal with. Even deep networks find it quite easy to deal with. Uh, random noise here, then patterns over here like this, and then sort of real Im real objects put in here. The ones over here on the right are the, mo are the hardest ones to deal with. They're down, down there, um, and they're the ones that the deep networks would find difficult to deal with. At the same time, they also mean that the localization gets harder for the comp nets, but the comp nets perform well on these in terms of deciding what the objects are, but they're also able to localize uh, the occluders, uh, you know, to a reasonable extent. Um, and so they can classify the things reasonably robustly. If you take the deep networks before, here is you're increasing the amount of occlusion, you're increasing the parameter of Cylon in my toy model over here. And if you use the comp nets, the comp nets, uh, you know, the best type of comp nets are getting up to something like 87.7 percent performance in the most extreme occluded case, which is still lower than what humans can do, but it is a lot better than what the deep networks can do. And this is using exactly the same, uh, you know, the same amount of, you know, training data, etc. Uh, now, this was originally done, I think we did it for about 12 objects, which are vehicles. Um, I don't want to overstress this. This is not something that, you know, this method, the intuitions behind it would work for object classes where, which are fairly rigid. It can be seen from seven different viewpoints. Um, however, you can scale this up to a hunt. You know, I wouldn't try that on humans seen from different views and under different poses, but you can scale it up to 100 object categories on ImageNet and the results are also uh, fairly reasonable, they go down a bit, essentially because the assumptions in the model that a limited number of viewpoints are representative starts breaking down. Nevertheless, the performance is, uh, you know, is significantly better, uh, a huge amount better than just a standard deep network. So, so this is an example of what you can do there and a power of using sort of generative models, Bayesian models for dealing with out of distribution situations. Um, it can also be done for object detection. This is something we, uh, we described here and maybe I'll skim over this a little for reasons of time. Um, the ideas are somewhat similar. They are extended a bit because 
when you detect an object and if it's occluded, you, if you're not careful, you tend to rely too much on the background context. So a deep network for detecting an object is given a set of boxes. If it's an airplane, the boxes are going to contain a lot of sky. So if you get an airplane that is occluded like this, which is occluded by the car and occluded by people, well, it's not the deep network's not going to like it very much. It may prefer this other box here, this brown box, because here there's a lot of sky and the deep network knows that airplanes are in the sky. So that's not a good property necessarily of deep nets and it's a limitation. The same ideas, same Bayesian ideas can be extended into this case uh, as, as we've in fact done here in the second paper. You can learn a model of the background context, similar how we learned a model for the occluder, and you can, as among other properties, you can discount it and you can partially segment the object as well, again, without any training data. So, um, again, the issue here is robustness to occlusion able to deal with out-of-distribution tests using occluders, you're losing the idea of being two sort of separate distributions, one for generating the objects when there's no occlusion, and the other for occluders, and then com combining them together to deal with cases where, there are, where the objects are occluded. So let me skim over this. These are good results, but you can read those in the paper if you're interested. So now, I, that's my results on out of distribution testing, and now I want to talk about adversarial examiners. And so, the idea of adversarial examiners is you're going to uh, select uh, images which you think are going to be hard for your algorithm to do. In this case, we use a particular method that was done by Chen Lin Yang et al. in ECCV, which um, was, can be thought of as essentially a, a targeted black box attack on a network. Targeted means that you can turn the object into something that you want to turn it into. You can turn a car into a fish. And black box means you do not know anything about the weights of the object. I don't want to go into the details of the algorithm because it's against, you know, it's, um, you know, that's sort of irrelevant. The main point on it is that the attack is almost 100% effective on deep networks. And effective means that you can turn the object into a particular object you like by putting patches in here. The patches, where they're placed, where how they're selected is trained by a reinforcement learning algorithm. It's a bit complex, but nevertheless, you can really um, uh, hurt a deep network by adding these patches. These patches are visible, but they would not fool a human observer at all. You would still think this is a car. You'd see a patch here. So if you take the comp nets, the patches could be thought of as sort of types of occluders, uh, you know, particularly targeted occluders. You know, they're trying to find the weak points of the algorithms, but they are essentially like occluders. So the comp net model I described the one which has a generative model of the features, but an outlier process that could detect occlusions could still work here um, in principle. Um, sadly, a, uh, a program officer who funds grants didn't believe me on this, but uh, nevertheless, it's correct, as we can show by this example work here done by uh, graduate student Christian Cosgrove. So the ComNets are robust without needing to do any uh, modifications to them, um, just the standard methods I had before. And so here, again, the, the comp nets, uh, you know, if there's no occlusion, they perform about as well as the deep nets. Uh, that was true before. I didn't actually, I'm not sure I mentioned it, but without uh, occlusion, they perform as well as deep nets within, you know, tiny variances. But here, if there are patch attacks or sparse RS attacks, which are a slightly later version of patch attacks, um, a nicer version, but um, you know somewhat similar, uh, you know intuitions behind it, that the uh, comp nets are an order of magnitude more successful, without having to do any 
training and have also got some ability to localize. So in these types of adversarial examiners, the patch attacks are still, uh, you know, the comp nets, their ability to deal with occluders carries over to this situation. And again, this is because they're generative, they can learn what the object ought to look like uh, if there's no occlusion, but then they can have an occlusion model which competes with that, and if they think things are occluded, they allow that to be switched off and treated as occluders. Okay, so this is just a summary. You get robustness out of the box. Uh, sadly, this uh, meant that our paper for doing this was not accepted by this conference because the reviewers said, okay, these results were impressive, but you're just using comp nets. You know, you're not modifying comp nets at all. And so the paper was, uh, you know, our submission here was rejected. Um, we have managed to get it published somewhere else, of course. Um, okay, so now to conclude on the summary. So, you know, so again, getting back to the motivation. Well, first, basic results. Comp generative networks perform as well as standard deep nets, but also robust recluders and patch attacks. They show the power of Bayesian methods. You can do sort of out of distribution testing here by learning the model P of X in my toy example, also learning the Q of X, the sort of model that s helps contaminate it, which at the moment corresponds to occluders. You can learn them from separate data sets. Uh, the occluder model can be learnt without much, without any annotations at all, and Bayesian methods give you a way to combine them by allowing them to complete to explain the data. Then the motivation before this was that the standard performance measures are problematic for evaluating vision algorithms um, because they are not tough enough and so the deep nets will perform really well on those but if you show these adversarial examiners for example the deep net performance will drop to zero and if you show them the heavily occluded data either the synthetic data we made or if you go to COCO data set and you uh, find the examples in COCO the rare cases where there's a lot of occlusion, the performance of the deep nets is equally bad on those. So deep nets are a wonderful algorithm. They're incredibly good, I think, but still we need to do, you know, they, the fact that they're successful has means to challenge us to, do, to test them even harder. And if we test them even harder, I think they're going to find limitations like these. And in this case, the occlusion, you know, the Bayesian methods are able to deal with out of distribution and adversarial examiner attacks. And having tougher and tougher measures, I mean, I'm sure you can find ways of attacking the comp nets to show that they're bad. Uh, and then that's going to motivate people to find something better. But I think that's a process that we need to do in order to uh, carry on improving vision algorithms. Because I think if we stick to the standard performance measures, we are going to perhaps get stuck in the local minima. Uh, here are some references. I realize I've gone more or less exactly into the time, so now, uh, now I'll stop. These papers can tell you where to find more details about this. The slides uh, will be are available as well, and they will also enable you to, um, you know, to look into some of the more details that I talked over a little bit quickly. Okay, well, thanks very much for your attention. I hope you find this interesting, um, and I hope this is you're enjoying the tutorials and the conference. Okay, so that's all for today's tutorial, and thanks everyone for attending this tutorial, and we hope to see you guys next year. So, bye.